All right, let's rock and roll here. Chapter 20. This is the chapter that comes after 19. This is the chapter that comes before chapter 21. This is PN Junction Diodes, and I get emotional because this is your first, your first real component, solid state component, that is. It's your first real electronic component. Because when you figure everything you've studied up to this point, capacitors, inductors, are they, are they truly electronic, or are they electrical? But it's truly electronic, because it's made of solid-state stuff. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to describe what a junction diode is and how it's made. Define the term depletion region and barrier voltage. Explain the difference between forward bias and reverse bias of a diode. Draw and label the schematic symbol for a diode. Describe three diode construction techniques. Identify the most common diode packages. Test diodes using an ohm meter. Now, PN junctions. PN junctions. Mobile charges. Remember how electrons and holes that drift? From last chapter, those are considered our mobile charges. Positive ions, an atom that has more protons than electrons. Negative ions are an atom that has more electrons than protons. Remembering that again, in the beginning, everything was in a neutral, natural state. When we apply energy to matter, we ionize. Now, there are always an equal number of mobile and ionic charges within n-type and p-type semiconductor materials. Diodes are created by joining n- and p-type materials together. When these materials come in contact with each other, they form a junction called a junction diode. This is what it would kind of sort of look like if you were an artist trying to depict it. You've got N material butted right up against P material, P and N material. We're going to create what's known as a depletion region. The depletion region is near the junction where electrons and holes are depleted and extends only a short distance on either side of the junction. So what's going to happen here is, remember these electrons in the end material? Free electrons? Where are free electrons going to want to go? To the P material to try to fill the hole. But can they fill the hole? Not necessarily. Here we've got P material, holes, where are the holes going to migrate? To the end. Why? They want to be filled by electrons. So this is going to create this depletion region, we call it. Sounds like something out of some sci-fi movie. Do not enter the depletion region. Also associated with the depletion region is what's going to be called the barrier voltage. Again, sounds like something out of a sci-fi thriller. The barrier voltage, we have opposite charges that build up on either side of the junction. This is because of those mobile charges. It can be re represented as an external voltage source. Now, when I say it can be represented as an external voltage source, don't try to get a voltmeter, a voltmeter, and measure the voltage of a diode. You can't measure this voltage. This is a barrier voltage. This is a voltage that must be overcome before you could get current to flow through this device. Do you get it? That's why it's called barrier voltage.
here's a new term for you. It's called bias voltage. Bias means operating point. So operating point voltage. When a voltage is applied to a diode, it is referred to as a bias voltage. Now in this particular case, what we see here is our voltage source with a negative on the right, current flows negative to positive. So current is going to want to flow at an end material through to the P material and then complete the circuit path. This is a series circuit right here, is it not? When we put a negative on the end material and a positive on the P material, we are going to do what is known as forward biasing the diode. Forward biasing the diode. That's why this is a new symbol I'm going to introduce to you. I sub F, current forward. I sub F, current forward. When we do this, when we apply forward bias to a diode, this is where the diode kind of does its magic. For those of you that come from a mechanical background, some of you may be familiar with what's known as a one-way check valve. A one-way check valve would be envision a, a straw, if you will, with a little ball sitting on top of the straw. As long as you're blowing through the straw, that ball is going to become unseated and air will be allowed to pass. But as soon as you suck on the straw, what's going to happen to the ball? It's going to seal it. So that will only allow the air to flow one way, but it won't be able to allow the air to flow the other way. It's a check valve, what's, what's commonly known as a check valve. A diode is the electrical equivalent of a check valve. It's going to allow current to flow in this direction and this direction only. So when we forward bias a diode, current flows through it. Now forward bias, when the current flows from an N-type to a P-type material, the diode's forward bias. Germanium diodes require a minimum bias flow of, this is a typo, this should be 0 0.3 volts, not 0.03 volts. What I'm talking about is 3, you said it, 300 millivolts or 0.3. This is actually an approximation, so it might be a little less than that. This is not gospel. Don't get in a circuit and say, wow, it, Joe, Joe Grenick over at that, their technical college, or actually we just found out yesterday they changed the name. They're going to change the name of this place. Did you, not, did you hear about that? It's going to be Technical Institute. Got that going for us. Maybe I'll get a new, different colored lab coat. So for germanium, it's going to be 0.3 volts. For silicon, it's going to be 0.7 volts, approximation. And to be honest with you, this, that approximation could be anywhere 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volts for germanium, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts for silicon. What's that? Yeah, some of it's the manufacturing, the design, what specific, um, what specifically the diode was designed to do. So there's going to be some variance in that number. So that's why we say this is just an approximation. So if you know the 0.7 and the 0.3 for this class, you'll pass okay. When you get to the world of reality in the lab, all bets are off. You'll be close to these, but it won't be exactly. Don't come banging on my door if you don't get 0.7 volts. Well, Joe, you said in class. No, I didn't say in class. It's going to be exactly 0.7. The forward voltage drop, once a diode starts conducting, a voltage drop known as a forward voltage drop occurs. Again, for germanium, it should be 0.3 volts. For silicon, 0.7 volts. 
that means that voltage drop, it's kind of the voltage that is going to be the price of doing business with a diode. Follow what I'm saying? You're always going to get that voltage drop across the diode when you forward bias it, because that's what I'm talking about right now. You know what I'm talking about, all right? What's up, Mr. Graham? these components are going to get hot. Yeah, and there's going to be a maximum amount of power that can be dissipated. That's why it, you raise a really good question. Basically, he or she who has the largest diode, physically the largest diode, wins, has the highest power. Because all diodes, a little tiny diode is going to, a silicon diode is going to drop 0.7 volts across it. A really big, huge diode is going to drop 0.7 volts across it. What's the difference between the two? The amount of power that you handle. Yeah. And you could always, generally speaking, go bigger, but you can't go smaller. So if you've got a big diode that explodes and you're going to replace it, you need to replace it with a diode that is at least as equal to the original size or larger physically. If you go smaller, the smaller one will probably explode rapidly. Next thing we're going to talk about is reverse bias. Again, the magic of diode. When you reverse bias a diode, the terminals are going to be reversed, meaning we're going to put a positive on the end material and a negative on the material. When we do so, what's going to happen is we end up where the diode will not conduct because we build a larger, what did we call this? Remember from the sci-fi thriller? Do not enter the depletion zone, the depletion region. So when we reverse bias the diode, we physically increase the depletion region. So there's no way an electron trying to complete this circuit path is going to be able to make it through the depletion region. So therefore, the diode will be shut off. In this condition, I sub R, current reverse. It's going to act like an open. It's going to act like an open. There is going to be a small amount of a current that flows, and what we're going to call that is leakage current, but it's going to be really, really, really small. You'll also see a little bit of current flowing because what are we doing here? What's happening to the size of the depletion region? It's getting bigger. So if it's getting bigger, how could it be possibly getting bigger? Something must be flowing. And if something's flowing at any part in this circuit, it's going to be flowing in every other part of the circuit because it is a, what kind of circuit? Series circuit. Very good. And remember, the law with a series circuit, whatever happens in one part, current's constant. It's all that stuff that you learned about last quarter is really dependent if you understand it now. Diode characteristics, they can be damaged by excessive heat. They can be damaged by excessive reverse voltage. Let me go back a slide real quick. Talk about that reverse voltage. Let's say that this is like a little power supply. Uh, she goes 0 to 12 volts. And let's say I go 0 to 12 volts and at zero volts, obviously, I have just the standard barrier voltage to overcome. As soon as I exceed 0.7 volts, or, or excuse me, as soon as I reverse bias it, what's going to happen is I'm just going to get bigger, bigger, bigger. I jack it all the way up to 12 volts, no problemo. I connect it to a, a big 
200 DC power supply. And now I crank it all the way up to 75 volts. Well, this diode, let's say, is only rated to go as high as 35 volts. Reverse voltage. So as soon as I get up to 35 volts, this depletion region gets so freaking big that current is just going to arc through it and it will destroy the diode. So all diodes are not created equal. You're going to have to look at the data sheet to see specifically how much reverse voltage this can handle. Yeah, they put a number on it just as good. They put a 1N number on it. It's going to be 1N and then four other digits typically. And you could look that up on Google and it'll give you the data sheet. And then you know exactly how much reverse voltage that is designed to handle. Now at room temperature, reverse current is going to be very, very small. Room temperature, diode sitting there on the table. And obviously, as we know, as temperature increases, the resistance of the component decreases, therefore allowing more current to flow through it. So engineers really got to take this into consideration when they're, when they're putting something together. This is one of the things now that all of you will be held accountable to with your projects. Right? You build an electronic project and you think you're going to put a bunch of diodes and solid state devices inside a sealed box and expect them to do wonderful things with high power. Well, unless you provide adequate coolant and cooling and airflow, heat's going to build up, build up, build up, and eventually it's going to explode and fail catastrophically. Question, Mr. Graham? Yep. Did that explode? So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Down at the bottom is the schematic symbol for a diode. A diode has two terminals on it. The cathode and the anode. The, the way I always remember this is anode starts with the letter A, so does the word arrow. So arrow, anode. Arrow, anode. Cathode, well, that'd be the other side. Now, who do you think came up with the schematic symbol for a diode? Technicians? Engineers? Scientists that discovered it? Why? Who discovered it? Scientists. So who got to draw the schematic symbol for it? Scientists. Scientists didn't develop it and they called a bunch of technicians and said, hey, what do you think we should use the schematic symbol? Well, no, scientists came up with this and, you know. So I'm going to tell you something. Since scientists did this, scientists and engineers basically embraced whole flow. Scientists and engineers think whole flow from positive to negative, and that's current flow. You're all technical school students. Technical schools, two-year schools, a lot of four-year schools, the military all embrace electron flow. So when you look at the schematic symbol and you see the arrow pointing from left to right, that tells you that holes flow from left to right when this device is turned on. So if holes are flowing left to right, which direction must current be flowing in? Electron flow. Right to left. In order for you to make current flow left to right, excuse me, right to left, what polarity do I need to put on my cathode to turn this device on? What polarity do I need to put on my anode to turn this device on? I need to put a negative on the cathode and a positive on the anode. That way current will flow against the arrow. Electron flow against the arrow. Does that make sense? Electron flow will always be opposite the direction of the arrow. So here as technicians, we study the behavior of electron flow. So when you're troubleshooting this, 
you put your black lead on the cathode, you put your red lead on the anode, and you would expect to see that forward bias voltage. Mr. Graham. Yeah, I, I, I believe that's what it goes back to. And again, we're technicians. We're technicians. And a lot of engineers, too, embrace electron flow. So I don't want you to lose sleep over electron flow. Like, like I said earlier in our last lecture, right? If 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons go that way per second, it's an amp. If 6.24 times 10 to the 18 holes go that way, and actually if 6.24 times 10 to the 18 holes are moving that way, what must be moving the other way? Because everything in the beginning was in a neutral natural state. So if I got holes going one way, electrons must be going the other way. So early on in my career, I lost a lot of sleep over that. Is it the holes that are moving or the electrons? And I just, you know, for, for, for weeks, you know, with headaches and migraines, trying to think it, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. But I want you to understand that whenever you see a semiconductor schematic symbol from this point forward and you see an arrow, current, the current we're talking about, electron flow, always flows against or opposite the arrow. Knowing that, let's talk about some circuits now. Let's talk about some circuits. So I'm going to ask you some questions. This right here is a 10 volt DC power supply. It's connected to the circuit right here. This is a silicon diode. What voltage will be present across this resistor? 9.3? How in the heck did you come up with that? Across where? Absolutely. Very good. Very good. It's a simple series circuit. Another term for a series circuit is a voltage divider. So we know... The, the big thing you got to look at is we got the negative connected to the cathode, we got the positive connected to the anode, so that we know we're doing what to this? Forward biasing this. And I kind of gave you a hint by showing the ice of F right here, forward bias. So current's going to flow through, create a 0.7 volt voltage drop here. So 10 volts minus 0.7 gives us 9.3 across that resistor. Make sense? If I pull this diode out and replace it with a germanium diode, what voltage will be present across the diode? 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, very good. The remainder voltage will be dropped where? Across the resistor. Okay, let's take a look at this bottom circuit. This right here is a silicon diode. What voltage drop will I get across this resistor in this condition? This is 12 volts applied. So what voltage am I going to have across this? What's that? Zero. Very good. What voltage will I get across my diode? that? 12 volts. Why? You will always read source voltage across an open. When this is reverse bias, this diode is going to act like an open. So I got 12 volts minus 12 volts gives me a remainder of 0 volts. When this is reverse, let me, let's look at it another way. When I'm reverse biased, this diode, is there any current flowing in the circuit? How much current? When this is reverse bias, is there current flowing in this circuit? How much current? Just a little bit of current. What kind of current? Reverse current, leakage current. So realistically, is there any... It, is there really any current flowing in the circuit when it's reverse biased? No, that's why it's reverse biased. 
we're using the diode to prevent current from flowing in the circuit. That's why we put a diode in it. Make sense? So if I've got no current flow through the resistor, is it going to create a voltage drop? No. You need current flow through resistance to create a voltage drop. So other than a small amount of leakage current, if we have a small amount of leakage current, are we really going to get a maybe a little small voltage across this? Yeah. But it's going to be insignificant. If you got in there with your with your meter, your multimeter, and you measure across here, you're going to get 12 volts. You measure across here, you're going to get 12 volts. You measure across here, you're going to get zero volts or some minuscule amount. Make sense? Diode construction techniques. We make these things three different ways, one of three different ways. We use a growth or a grown junction, an alloyed junction, or a diffused junction. Grown jun junctions are made with intrinsic semiconductor material, that's pure semiconductor material, and p-type impurities are melted into a quartz, quartz container. A semiconductor crystal called a seed, which is a perfect p-type crystal, is lowered into the mixture and rotated and slowly withdrawn, allowing the molten mixture to cling to it. The molten mixture cools and rehardens, assuming the same characteristics as the seed. As the seed is withdrawn, it's alternately doped with N and P type materials. Back and forth. Almost like, again, if you've seen like the way the uh, old timers used to make candles. You get a, a wick, you dip it in the wax, then you dip it again, you dip it again. Except what they're doing here is like dip it in one colored wax, dip it in another colored wax. One colored wax, another colored wax. But here we're using semiconductor material. The resulting crystal is then going to be sliced into many PN sections. That PN section where it's thrown together is going to be a diode. It's that simple. Alloy junctions, a small pellet or trivalent material is placed on an N-type semiconductor crystal. The two are heated until the pellet melts and partially fuses with the crystal. The area where the two materials combine forms the N type material. The material is going to recrystallize, forming a solid PN junction. They might want to use this process here for maybe some higher power ones, because you want more physical material, so you could have a diode that's physically bigger to handle more power. The diffused junction is the most popular method used today in the manufacturing of these. And if I could explain to you very briefly what diffusion is, if I had a glass of water and I put a drop of red food coloring in it, what would happen to that drop of red food coloring? It would be diffused into the water. So that concentrated form would be diffused into the water. The same process is used with these semiconductor materials. They place a mat with openings on a thin section of N or P-type semiconductor material called a wafer. We place the wafer in an oven and expose, expose it to an impurity in a gaseous state. The impure atoms penetrate through the exposed surface of the wafer at extremely high temperatures. The length of diffusion is going to be controlled by the length of the exposure and temperature. So time and temperature is going to control how much diffuses into the material. And again, if you want to make a more stout, diode, if you will, you'll leave it in there longer and diffuse, diffuse it into the, the substrate longer. These are examples of diode packages. The diode must be packaged to protect it from both environmental and mechanical stresses. The two on the left are, are basically small through-hole components. The one on the right is considered a stud mount actually considered a, what, what's it known as a DO4, but this is big, this is a stud, right? This, this could take up to like, uh, you know, this could be a quarter inch thread on it, half inch thread, I mean these things get big, some of these get really, really big for high power applications. 
one of the things I want to point out with these on the left, you see this little black line, or this side being dark, that's going to signify the cathode. For these stud mount packages, the physical package itself, <coughs> excuse me, the physical package itself is going to be the cathode. So be careful if this is energized, if you're working on energized equipment, that you don't necessarily touch this outer case. It could be at a different electrical potential. The physical case is the cathode. Testing PN junction diodes, real easy. Check the forward to reverse resistance ratio with an ohm meter. One of the things I want to point out to you is when I say ohm meter, I am talking about an old school analog ohm meter. That's what I'm talking about. In doing your lab experiments associated with ELEC 120, we've got a couple analog meters in the lab. If you need one that works, check one out for me. I have one that a student restored in my office. So when they say take the resistance measurements in your lab assignment, you have to use the analog meter. If you try to take this measurement with a digital multimeter, you're going to get inaccurate results. What's that? Yeah, but the, big, the biggest thing is with a digital multimeter, it just doesn't give you an accurate reading. Digital multimeters have a feature built into them that's called diode test. And when you use the diode test feature on a digital multimeter, instead of, basically, let, let, let me sit, take, we're getting the cart before the horse, let's take a step back. When you check it with an analog meter, what you're doing is you're checking the diode for the forward resistance and then the reverse resistance when you reverse the leads. In one direction, you're going to have a relatively low resistance. In the opposite direction, you're going to have a relatively high resistance. Does that make sense? So by checking that with an ohm meter and just looking for a low resistance one way and a high resistance one way, you just prove that that diode is functioning. When you use the diode test feature of a digital multimeter, what's going to happen is you're putting a higher bias voltage across it, and that diode test feature is going to give you a voltage not a resistance. A voltage, not a resistance. Ironically, when you when you forward bias the diode, does anybody want any anybody want to take a guess what voltage it gives you? It's a voltage drop across, it's a forward bias voltage. Yep, so when you use diode test feature and you put the black lead on the cathode, the red lead on the anode you look at your digital multimeter, it should say something as close to 0.6 or 0.7 volts. When you reverse the leads on a digital multimeter, then it should say OL, or out of limits. How would you, some of the best questions you ask me are questions that I'm going to turn around and ask you. How would you determine with a, a multimeter a multimeter, a DMM, whether it's silicon or germanium. What's that? Yeah, by the voltage. So simply by pulling out a digital multimeter and putting it in the diode test feature, you can not only test the diode, you can also identify whether it's silicon or germanium. So that's how you test it. Real simple process. Is there any way of testing what the impurities are? No. I'd, I'd, no, I have no way. The impurities, what, what dopants were used, no idea. I don't even know if the data sheet would show what. Uh, you're looking at the wrong data sheet. Yeah, it, it should identify whether it's silicon or germanium. Because if you're trying to find a replacement diode for a circuit, you know, an adequate suitable replacement, you need to know that need to make sure that you don't put a germanium where a silicon was and a silicon where a germanium was, you know, without without doing some engineering. Okay.
Okay, in summary, junction diodes are created by joining N-type and P-type materials together. Depletion region is the area near the junction. The charge at the junction creates a voltage called a barrier voltage. Current flows through a diode only when the external voltage is greater than the barrier voltage. A diode that's forward bias conducts current. A diode that reverse bias conducts only a small leakage current. That's why it's called a diode. That's why it was invented to do this. Allow current to only flow one way. That makes a diode a one directional device. The manufacturer specifies a diode's maximum forward current and reverse voltage. This is done on the data sheet. Schematic symbol for a diode. A for a, 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 anode, an arrow, cathode, well, that's the other side. You want to put a negative on the cathode, a positive on the anode, that's going to forward bias it. You do the opposite, it's going to reverse bias it. The cathode is the end material, the anode is the P material. There's three ways of constructing diodes, growth, alloyed, and diffused. The diffused method is the most commonly used today because it really gives us the best over the process of manufacturing the diode. Uh, uh, not necessarily. Some of that diffusion equipment is pretty expensive, but for the size of components now, it gives them a lot more control. A diode is testing by comparing the forward to reverse resistance with an ohm meter. When I say ohm meter, I'm talking about kicking it old school in analog instruments. So when you're doing your labs, make sure if they say measure the resistance, you're going to have to use an ohm meter. I recommend you do both. Okay? It's easy to set up a digital multimeter and measure the forward reverse test using a DMM. But when you're using measuring resistance, you're going to have to kick it old school and use an analog. Forward bias diodes going to have low resistance. Reverse bias is going to have high resistance. Anybody have any questions for me on anything associated with these diodes? PN junction diodes. All right, very good. Let's go ahead and take a uh, about a 20-minute break. And when we come back, chapter 21. But again, it's, it is still arsenic, so in a manufacturing facility, it's bad, right? This stuff is, is, is hazardous material.
sneeze or something, I could just shut this transmitter off, right? Or does it go to white noise if I do that? Do you know? Well, no, but I could shut the transmitter off. That's what I'm saying. Does it go to white noise? Are you monitoring me? Yeah. All right. One, two. So, all right. So if I sneeze or something, I could just do that. Sneeze, cough, anything of that nature. Got a nasty cold. I was fine Friday and Saturday, but then yesterday it's like, jeez. Got to keep me healthy. All right, let's get started, folks. This is uh, week number 47. Week number two. ELEC 120, Chapter 22, Bipolar Transistors. It's to kind of get ramped up on, on how we got here today. In the beginning, in the beginning, early 1900s, um, to control current, our only option was to use a vacuum tube. A vacuum tube. Vacuum tubes consumed a high amount of power and they were very, very fragile. So uh, in World War II, when the world was at war with each other, what's that? The war to end all wars. These, these vacuum tubes didn't react well to explosions and gunfire. So what we did is we came up with a, uh, science came up with a method of controlling current in a solid state, solid state. And uh, in doing so, they really began their research in the study of materials. And we know that materials that have three or fewer electrons, the valence shell, make a good conductor. Five or more make a good insulator. The number between three and five is the number... Four. So we, we uh, science looked at those materials that have four electrons in the valence shell, silicon, germanium, and carbon. Carbon were the were the were the big ones. Silicon was at the top of the list. Most popular solid state material used today. The first real component that was invented in a solid state form is really the diode. The diode, the PN junction diode. And the neat thing about the PN junction diode is it acts, for those of you with a mechanical background, like a one-way check valve. One-way check valve. It's like the uh, turnstiles at the ballpark, right? It allows you to only go one way, enter. When, when you leave, there's just the doors are all open, but the turnstiles only allow you to go one way into the ballpark. It's like a diode. allows current to only flow in one direction. Now, like a check valve or like the turnstile down at the ballpark, if you had, uh, I don't know, Hulk Hogan or uh, who's the other dude? The Rock inside the ballpark and he wanted to get out, he could probably push hard enough against the turnstile and break it and get out. Wouldn't you agree? Just like a diode. If current is trying to flow backwards and it's strong enough, every diode is going to have its limit. But generally speaking, the turnstiles allow traffic to only flow in one direction. Diodes allow current to only flow in one direction. The diode wasn't good enough, at least not for a guy by the name of Zener. Still haven't figured out if that's his first name or his last name. He just went by the name Zener. Like Cher, The Rock, or some other people that go by first names only, or one name only. 
Madonna, Madonna, Cher, Zener. <laughs> he was a rock star of his day. Actually, Zener was his last name. He came up with a diode that uh, intentionally can be operated in this reverse condition. And when it's operated effectively in this reverse condition, what it will do is it will regulate voltage. So Zener diode is the first real voltage regulator that you study here in this program. And voltage regulation is very, very important because electronics, the proper operation of electronic circuits is critical on having a constant voltage. So by using a Zener diode, in power supplies, this gives us this constant voltage output, which makes circuits very, very stable for us. So one of the things as you gain experience in electronics and you start to read schematics and you look at a lot of equipment, you'll see that the very first stage of a lot of pieces of equipment is a voltage regulator to hold that voltage constant. It must be constant. In my car, I've got a radar detector. Radar detector, laser detector, basically lets me know that I'm going to get a ticket. Okay. Um, old school radar detectors used to work pretty good. Now laser at the speed of light, you're kind of nailed by the time it detects you. But anyway, I still got one in my car. Keeps me honest. The operation of that device is very, very critical. When you're intercepting a radar signal, that radar signal to process it, it's looking for a very unique frequency and the variance of that frequency. As I accelerate my car, deaccelerate my car, the engine RPMs increase, decrease, my car has a voltage regulator, but generally speaking, the voltage coming out of that is still pretty crude. In order for that radar detector to operate properly, it has to have an internal voltage regulator that takes that 12 volts coming from the car, 12.6 or 14.3 when the car started, and it's going to lower it to some other value, perhaps 5 volts, and keep it at 5.0 volts so that all those circuits in there respond well and act, behave properly. So voltage regulator is very, very critical. The next evolutionary process in the development of semiconductors in solid state was the development of a transistor. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the bipolar transistor. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase. From this point forward, when you hear the word transistor, I want you to think of really two different scenarios. One, the transistor could be used as a switch, as a plain old-fashioned switch, just like the switch over in that wall. The switch could either be open, where the lights are off, or the switch could be closed, where the lights are on. That's one way that I could use a transistor, as a switch. The other way that I could use a transistor is like, uh, you know, if you wash your car and you hook up your garden hose to the faucet outside, and you know how you, how you turn the knob of the faucet and you kind of control how much water is flowing out of the hose? It's exactly how a transistor works. Current flowing through the transistor is like water flowing through the hose. By adjusting the valve, the spigot, you could either increase the velocity of the flow or decrease the flow. By adjusting the voltage on a transistor, you could either increase the flow or decrease the flow. So you could use it to actually control current that's flowing through it. Does that make sense? So whenever you see a transistor in a circuit, you've got to think of that. Two different ways. Am I using the transistor as a switch, or am I using it as really a controlling device? So that being said, let's jump into it here. Objectives after completing this chapter, you the student are going to be able to describe how a transistor is constructed and its two different configurations. Draw and label a schematic symbol for an NPN and a PNP transistor. Identify the ways of classifying transistors. Identify the function of a transistor using a reference manual and an identification number 2N 
XXXX. Identify commonly used transistor packages. Describe how to bias a transistor for operation. Explain how to test a transistor with both a transistor tester and an ohm meter. And then finally, describe the process used for substituting transistors. Transistor construction, very, very similar to that of a diode, except we're adding another layer to it. Another layer to it. Now, again, going back as a review, we only have two types of solid state material. N-type material and P-type material. So by adding another layer, it's got to be either N material or P material. You only got two materials to choose from. A transistor can be used to amplify power, current, or voltage. Amplify power, which is power is what? Combination of voltage and current. Current, which is the flow of electrons, or voltage, which is the pressure, if you will. Transistor could also be called a junction transistor, a transistor, or a BJT. BJT stands for Bipolar Junction Transistor, BJT. Transistor can be constructed out of germanium or silicon. Silicon is the most popular. It consists of three alternately doped layers. The regions are arranged in two different ways. Could be a, a P-type sandwich, surrounded by two pieces of end material. Or it could be an N-type sandwich, where N is in the middle, surrounded by two pieces of P-type material. The first one we talk about would be called an NPN, because you have N material, P material, N material. The second, or the latter, would be a PNP, P material, N material, P material. This is kind of, sort of, really what it would look like. This is an NPN transistor. You have an N material on either side of the P material in the middle. Now, I've got to introduce to you some new terms. If you remember, the diode had a cathode and an anode. Transistor has three leads, but they have unique names to them. Those unique names are the emitter, the base, and the collector. The emitter, the base, and the collector. Now this illustration down here, this is the schematic symbol for an NPN transistor. This is what you really got to get used to uh, uh, looking at and understand how it's laid out. The easy one to remember, the easy lead to remember is the emitter because the emitter is the lead that has the arrow on it. It'll always be the lead that has the arrow on it. The collector will always be opposite of the emitter. So if the emitter is down here, the collector is always going to be opposite to it. And then the base is the lead that is in the middle, if you will. And we see, in looking at the illustration up above, here we've got the base is connected directly to the P material, emitter to an N material, collector to an N material. What's one of the things that I shared with you last week about the arrow and the significance of the arrow when it comes to solid state devices? It's pointing in the direction of the hole trap or opposite of the Excellent. The arrow points in the direction of hole flow. Here at Lake Washington Technical College, we embrace electron flow. So electrons must be flowing against the arrow. And in order for electrons to flow against the arrow, I'm kind of getting a cart before the horse here, but let's take a look at it. Current flows in which direction? Negative, negative to positive. So I've got to make my negative, my emitter negative, and I've got to make my collector positive, right? And then current will want to flow against the arrow. Does that make sense? Okay, and you'll see when we talk about biasing in a minute, that's exactly how we turn this thing on. We've got to make the collector more positive than the emitter, or current's not going to want to flow through it. The other thing I want to point out to you 
and this is just a generalization. It's kind of beyond the scope of what's in the textbook, but I, but I want you to realize this. Generally speaking, not generally speaking, 100% of the time, 100% of the current flowing through the transistor will flow through the emitter. 100% of the current flows through the emitter. 98, roughly 98, 99% is going to flow through the collector. And the remaining 1%, 2%, what's ever left over, is going to flow through the base. So a transistor is actually going to act like a current divider to a certain extent. All the current flowing up through the emitter is going to get to this point and say, I'm either going to continue on to the collector or I'm going to go to the base. But when a transistor is operating normally, usually 98, 99% of the current's going up through the collector. If you find a transistor that's got 50% of the current going through the base and 50% going through the collector, you got a problem. Okay? Something's, something's broken, if that's the case. So this is an NPN transistor. Easy way of remembering to the schematic symbol for an NPN is the arrow is not pointing in. NPN, not pointing in. This is the NPN transistor. Next, let's discuss the PNP transistor. The good news is it's got the same three names for the leads. It's got an emitter, it's got a base, it's got a collector. This is PNP, so we see that the end material is the sandwich material, sandwiched between two pieces of P material. The schematic symbol looks very similar to the NPN, except that the arrow is pointing in. PNP, pointing in from the perimeter. PNP, pointing in from the perimeter. The arrow points in the direction of hole flow, therefore current must flow Electron current must flow against it, so therefore, if we want this transistor to work, the PNP, current flows negative to positive, we need to make the collector more negative than the emitter, and current's going to flow against the arrow. Same deal. How much current flows through the emitter typically? 100%. How much flows through the co collector? Collector? 98, 99, somewhere in there. It's a real high percentage. And then the remaining current is going to flow through the base. So the only difference here is that current's flowing in the opposite direction. So you've got to remember these. Look at the schematic. See PNP, the arrow is pointing in from the perimeter. I'm going to go back a slide now. NPN, not pointing in, it's pointing out. So you've got to, got to be able to recognize these on schematics. Because if you don't, how can you fix electronics? Transistors are classified according to their type, whether they're NPN or PNP. Uh, what type of material they're constructed out of, germanium or silicon. And what their major use is. Are they high power transistors? Are they low power transistors? Are they used for switching? Switching, remember what I said, on and off? On and off? Very rapidly. And also, whether they're used for high frequency, high frequency switching. How quickly can they turn on and off, on and off, on and off, and be reliable? That's always been the threshold that we've been pushing in the development of transistors. How fast can we get it to do its thing? And basically, whoever has the fastest transistor wins the most contracts and makes the most money. What's up? Have you ever seen a transistor made of carbon? No. No idea. No idea. I guess the materials just don't lend themselves, um, you know, they're, they're just not as efficient as these materials. Okay, transistor part numbers. Transistors are identified by a number, begins with a 2 and then an N, and then up to four more digits. For those of you reading up on diodes last week, all the diodes were 1N. 
one end because it has one junction. Very good. Transistors have two junctions. That's actually, surprisingly, why they call it bipolar, right? Because it has two junctions, junction transistors. So this 2N means it's got two junctions. It identifies the device as a transistor and indicates that it has two junctions. The package of a transistor, this is a typo, it should be transistor, not a transmitter. If this was transmitter, you'd be in a communications class. How many of you want that exam at the end of the week? The package of a transistor serves as protection. These are very, very small, very delicate devices, so we're going to mount them into a big package, if you will, big compared to their size. It provides a means of making electrical connections to the emitter, the base, and the collector. Typically, for most transistors, the active area of the component is extremely small, like the size of the head of a pin. In order for us to make electrical connections that we could solder to, they connect the head of the pin with, with wire about the size of, well, I'd say hair on my head, but I don't have hair on my head, okay? <laughs> hair on my beard. And then what it does is it comes out to the leads, and then the leads penetrate through the component so you could solder it into a circuit. So inside that package are some really, really small wires that actually connect it to the active portion of the component. One of the big, big reasons for having a uh, package is it's going to serve as a heat sink to draw heat away from that active area, removing excess heat from the transistor. Because as we know, if this is made out of a solid state material, semiconductor material, what's our biggest foe? Heat. So if we don't get the heat away from this thing, it's going to fry. So most packages for transistors are designed to rapidly pull that heat away from the active component. Packages are also designed by size and configuration. And this is actually called TO, transistor outline, as to the type of package that's, that they're going to put it in. Now, generally speaking, it's pretty easy. The bigger the transistor, the more power it can handle. It's that simple. Size does matter with transistors. If you find a big, huge Herkin transistor, chances are it's a high power transistor. If it's a small, tiny one, well, probably doesn't handle much power. One of the things in replacing transistors, sometimes you could go to a bigger transistor physically in a circuit if you can't find the original replacement part, but you could never go smaller because if you go smaller, the component just can't take the heat and it's going to fry. Basic functions of a transistor are to provide current amplification of a signal and to switch a signal. So remember at the start of lecture what I told you these things were used for? As a switch, on and off, and to provide current amplification of a signal. Because think about it. Think about it. When you're adjusting the garden hose, Typically, you don't adjust the garden hose when you wash your car. When you're going to wash your car, you open it up all the way. But, you know, in the summertime, I don't know if you've, you ever water your lawn, and sometimes when you got it on full pressure, it's like watering the street and the sidewalk, and it's a little bit too much. You can actually throttle it back and then get just the right stream of water, right? So, in essence, when you're adjusting that, that small change you're making with a wrist, with your wrist, is bringing about a large change of the flow of water. Does that make sense? So that's what a transistor is going to do. A small change of voltage is going to bring about a large change of current flowing through the device, so therefore we could use it as an amplifier. An example of an amplifier would be me speaking into a microphone. When I speak into a microphone, that piezoelectric effect of the microphone is going to cause that vibration as a small, very, very small voltage. Let's say I get that voltage and I put it to a transistor where that small voltage 
is controlling a large amount of current. Now all of a sudden I'm amplifying my speech pattern into a microphone through a transistor. So does that make sense? Question. Where would that small voltage be going? Would that be going to the base? Typically the base, yep. Very good. The differences between NPN and PNP transistors are the batteries or the supply voltages are going to have to have opposite polarities, right? Because we know that current flows the opposite in a PNP as compared to an NPN. And the direction of electron flow is going to be reversed, a PNP as compared to an NPN. In a transistor, the barrier voltage is going to be produced across the emitter junction. Remember the barrier voltage? What is that for silicon? For silicon. Between 0.6 and 0.7 volts, approximation. And of course, that's going to be determined by the type of semiconductor material used. If we were using germanium, it would be between 0.2 and 0.3 volts. So that's going to be developed between our base emitter junction. And there it is, germanium 0.3, silicon 0.7. The reverse bias voltage applied to the collector base junction is usually much higher than the forward bias voltage across the emitter base junction. If a transistor fails, it's generally caused by high temperature, high current, or high voltage. Theoretically, because this isn't a solid state material, a transistor should last forever. It's got no moving parts. It's not like the bearings are going to wear out or the seals are going to give out. If it gets hot, it's going to fail. If you put too much current through it, it could fail. If you put too much voltage across it, it could fail. But if you keep everything else dialed in, theoretically a transistor in a radio that was built in 1960 works as well today as it did in 1960. Make sense? Failure can also be caused by extreme mechanical stress. Basically silicon is glass, isn't it? So unless it's packaged really well and um, we don't expect too much of it, it's going to be okay but it still is a small piece of glass, silicon, that's controlling the current. So for most stuff, I mean, if you drop, drop a transistor radio, you're probably not going to break the transistors. But if you've got transistors in the warhead of a Tomahawk cruise missile that you push out of a submarine with 3,000 pound hydraulics, push it out into salt water, it blasts up to the surface, a rocket engine kicks on and, and blasts it onto its target. All of a sudden, a little piece of glass in there better be packaged well because if it breaks, you've got a problem. So it is something that in packaging they have to pay particular attention to. Generally speaking, when a transistor fails, it's either going to open or short. Open or short, which is pretty easy to find with nothing more than a digital multimeter. If you have a DMM, you can rapidly get in and service transistor equipment. A transistor's characteristics may also alter enough to affect its operation. This is not pleasant. Because what this is going to do is manifest itself as some unusual symptoms. Sometimes it doesn't work right. Well, what do you mean it doesn't work right? Well, sometimes you know, the signal kind of fades in and fades out. It just isn't behaving the way it used to behave. That's a problem. That's a problem. One of the other unusual things that you'll see these happen sometimes is that heat will cause it to change its characteristics. I have fixed several pieces of uh, transistorized equipment with nothing more than a can of freeze spray. The classic symptom is when I first turn it on, everything is okay, and then after a while, the symptom develops. Well, how long after you turn it on? I don't know, maybe 20, 25 minutes? Really? 
then you've got to narrow down and find out exactly what the symptom is and then start looking at circuitry associated with that symptom. I had a television set years ago that the signal would go, it would go from color and then everything would go black and white. When you first turn the TV on, it'd be color. Once it heated up, everything would go black and white. If you shut the TV off, cool it down, turn it back on, it would be color and then it would go black and white. So I looked at the circuitry associated with the color. I got in there and I had it narrowed down to like three or four different transistors. Locana free spray, hit it with the free spray, color went back to, uh, picture went back to color. I actually had it, I should have saved it. It was an old set, old school set, but it was very, very dramatic, at least if we could have videotaped it. Because then I had a heat gun in one hand and a can of free spray in the other. Heat it up, black and white, free spray color. Black and white color, black and white color, and that's exactly how it's going to behave. So in any of your toolkits, you should have a can of free, free spray so that when you have a problem like this, actually the most recently I thought I had a problem with my car computer that was thermal related because when I first turned my car and it was fine, once it heated up, a problem would manifest itself. So I highly suspect that it was thermal. It was not, but usually I jump on thermal because it's a common failure mode for the components. Make sense? Two methods to determine functionality. One is the ohm meter. When I say ohm meter, I'm talking about kicking it old school, meaning an analog ohm meter. If you are going to use a digital multimeter, can you, you think you could use a digital multimeter? But what are you going to have to set the digital multimeter to? Not transistor testing necessarily, because the fluke models don't have transistor tests, but set it for diode test, that diode test. And then basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking for high resistance one way, low resistance the other. Resistance tests are made between two junctions the following way, emitter and base. Should be high one way, low the other. Collector and base, high one way low the other. Collector to emitter, high both ways. Connect any two terminals one way, then reverse the leads. In one connection, the resistance should be high, 10,000 ohms or more. In the other connection, the resistance should be lower, less than 10,000 ohms. So the only way you're going to get these, do not try to get these numbers on a DMM. If you set your DMM for ohms and try to use it, you're going to get all kinds of screwy numbers. You're going to be banging on my door in my office saying, it isn't working right. It's not working right because you're not kicking it old school. You've got to kick it old school to get the resistance measurements. If you're using a DMM, you've got to set it for diode test. This is great here. I love this. If a transistor fails this test, it's defective. If a transistor passes this test, it could still be defective. Especially, especially if it's thermal related. Especially if it's thermal related. I remember years ago, this is, this is not only for transistors, this also could be diodes. I used to own a motorhome, 32 foot Winnebago. I lived in it when I was in engineering school down in, uh, in the Navy in California. It's kind of cool. Weekend would roll around, I'd pull the plug and head up the coast, Pacific Coast Highway. Had a lot of good times. I was driving that motor home. We were moving from San Diego. I mean, that's one thing about the Navy. The Navy always likes you to be stationed like near water. So I was actually moving from San Diego to Connecticut. And I was driving um, a rental truck, towing a car behind it, and my wife was driving the motor home towing a car behind it. So we had like, we were both the size of two semis going down the road. And we were in Indiana, and it was, uh, I think it was in May. Unbelievable heat wave. And what happened was the alternator would start to fail. But then when it cooled down, it would come back. And it was the exact same problem, a thermal-related problem in the diodes in the alternator. So typically, before you replace an alternator, you should have them bench test it. So we pulled over in Indiana, I pulled the thing out, brought it to a Napa store, and they stuck it on the bench. 
Well, guess what? When you stuck it on the bench, it ran cool. It was on the bench in an air-conditioned facility. You know, what do they do? They turn it on, run it for a couple minutes. Oh, yeah, this is good, sir. No, I don't believe that. Can you run it a little bit longer? Can you run it a little bit longer? And then sure enough, you see, you see it, the, is the problem start to manifest itself. So, ah, that is the problem. Because again, you don't want to have to replace the alternator if it's not the alternator. As a matter of fact, one of the common failures of car alternators are the diodes because of heat. What generates all the heat? If any of you are familiar with how an alternator works, and all of you should have a rough guesstimate of how an alternator generator works from ELEC 110, right? It's a rotating magnetic field. What do you have to have on a rotating shaft to minimize friction? Oil, but, but, but what, type of, what, what type of component do you use to create a smooth surface? A bearing. You've heard of bearings before, right? Well, typically what happens with an alternator is the bearings begin to fail. When the bearings begin to feel, fail, what do you do? You have a high amount of friction. Friction generates heat. Heat gets in and causes the diodes to fail. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is all of you are going to be, uh, upon completion of this program, electronics, electrical experts, if you will. So I don't want you getting in and saying, helping your neighbor or your neighbor's wife or husband fix their alternator and say, hey, that's a bad diode. We could just replace the diode and we're going to be good to go. What's going to happen when you get a new diode and put it in the alternator with the same old bearings? You're going to fire that thing up, the, heat's going to, the bearings are going to generate heat, and eventually you're going to take out your new diodes. So the best thing is if you've taken out your, your uh, diodes, you've got to rebuild it. You're going to have to put new bearings in it, new diodes. Now, this is all done for you when you go to Shucks. Okay? It's called buying a rebuilt alternator. You know, some factory in Mexico, they take all the old ones, they steam clean all the old ones, and they put all new components on it, and they sell, sell them as rebuilt. And that's good. It's the ultimate form of recycling when you think about it. Back in the day, though, a lot of guys and gals working in the garage used to be able to replace the components themselves. I know a little bit about this. My father retired. He worked uh, 46 years for a company in Connecticut that manufactured bearings manufactured bearings. So actually whenever ours failed, my dad would just bring it into the test lab where they were testing for the auto companies, bearings in alternators, bearings in lawnmowers. Very impressive facility. It was kind of neat. So anyway, keep that in mind about even though it passed the test, it could still have a problem that's thermally related. A transistor tester is more reliable than an ohmmeter. It's designed specifically for testing transistors. There's two types. There's an in-circuit tester. That means it comes with three wires that you hook directly up to the circuit under test with the circuit de-energized. And then you have an out-of-circuit tester. The problem with an out-of-circuit tester is what are you going to have to do to the transistor to be able to test it out of the circuit? You're going to have to unsolder it. You're going to have to unsolder it. Um, me, I'm kind of lazy. I've always been lazy as an electronics professional. If I unsolder something, what am I going to have to do when I'm done? Solder it back in. So I want to do everything I can to prevent that. The other thing is, I'm sure you've all heard before, if it ain't broke, don't mess with it. Every time you solder, well, first of all, the soldering process itself involves a large amount of heat. And although you're touching the solder pencil to the lead in the land, that heat could be transferred up the leg of the component into that wire that's the size of the, 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 the hair on your head, that goes to this little tiny piece of glass. You apply too much heat to that, that glass is going to crack. You're going to damage that wire, it's gonna, you're going to have problems. So one of the things that actually could be done is if this is the lead of a component, then you're going to solder, plated through hole, and you're soldering from the bottom. On the other side of the board, you could get these, they're called heat sinks. They're little clips, look like roach clips. Not that I would know what one of them looks like, right? 
and you could put that on there, typically made out of aluminum, and you clip it on the lead so when you start soldering, that heat gets transferred into the heat sink in the, in the uh, soldering process. Suffice to say, do you really want to pull a transistor out of a circuit to test it? No. In some cases, will you have to do it? Yes. The good news is, you're never going to have to worry about this here at Lake Washington Technical College because we do not own a transistor tester. You know why? No, we could probably, we have a million dollar lab across the hall, we could probably get a $140 transistor tester. Anybody know why? How do we want you to test transistors? Old school. old school. Not necessarily even old school, but we want you to at least use a DMM to test it. These tra transistor testers, for the most part, no offense, but you, you could get a monkey to operate it. Get the transistor in, put it in, hit the button, it turns green, hook, transistor, good. It promotes lazy, laziness with all of you here. So we don't even, Peter and I don't even want one. You could get the same information with your digital multimeter, except the digital multimeter is going to give it to you in a form that's more meaningful to a technician. Does that make sense? So when you get to industry, maybe your company will have one. Typically you'll have one like in a shop that you could all share. You won't have one at your own bench per se, but you'll typically have a good one that if you suspect something, you can pull it out and Literally, get it, plug it in the three leads, hit go, it identifies whether it's silicon or germanium, it identifies whether it's NPN or PNP, and it tells you whether it's good or not. But all of that promotes laziness. We don't want any laziness here, like Washington Technical College. Transistor substitution. This is uh, also very important if any of you uh, work on old, any old legacy equipment. And to be honest with you, that's kind of the fun part of getting an education in electronics is to, is to bring stuff back from the dead. You know, you go to a swap meet or a garage sale and you find some cool lamp or something. Oh, it doesn't work. Well, I'll give you three bucks for it. You know, I actually bought a TiVo. My neighbor was having a garage sale. I need to have a garage sale. I mean, I can't even get in my garage. And I buy a neighbor's junk. But I went over there and it was an old Series 2 TiVo. You know, and I've got a, I've got a Series 2 TiVo, Direct TV TiVo. And it was the end of the day, and they were ready to haul the stuff to the, to the dump, you know. And I went over, and, uh, you know, how much for the TiVo? Oh, what do you give me? Three bucks, you know. And I, all I wanted it was for parts, so I could cannibalize and, and use some of the parts. Because it's very difficult now for me to buy parts for something that's over 10 years old. The electronics industry just changes so rapidly. So a lot of you are going to find yourself working on old equipment, trying to revive it from the dead. So chances are you're not going to be able to find the original components. So you're going to have to do some substituting. The first question, this is basically a checklist. You need to ask yourself, is it MPN or PNP? You've got to get this one right. Is it germanium or silicon? You kind of need to get this one right. What's the operating frequency range? Is this a high frequency transistor? If it's high frequency and you use something that's old, a lower frequency, older, it may not even be able to switch at a high enough rate to do the, do the job effectively. What's its operating voltage? What are the collector current requirements or how much current can flow through the collector before the component fails? What's its maximum power dissipation? You need to either meet or exceed that original requirement. What's its current gain? What's its case style? And sometimes, again, I've, I've done this before, that I needed a transistor, but I couldn't find it in the exact case. I actually soldered other leads to it and made one that didn't fit, fit into the footprint of the original component, as long as everything else met the criteria. And then finally, case style and lead configuration, the same thing. Never come up to me and ask, hey, Joe, is this the emitter? Is this the base? Is this the collector? I don't know. I'm not going to answer that for you. I don't know. I honestly don't know. If I was doing the lab, you know what I would do? Data sheet. Data sheet. Two N, the four numbers, and then the word data sheet on Google. And you're going to end up with free data from the companies that exceeds Joe Grenick's knowledge of electronics. And would I even care to know about that individual transistor? 
So that's why we have computers all over the place in here, so you can call up those data sheets when you're doing your lab. Never assume. First time you assume with a transistor, oh yeah, I think that's, that's the emitter, that's the base, that's the collector you put it in. I mean, you're wasting your time with your labs, you really are. Always call up documentation to sh support what you're doing. If you've used that transistor 50 times on different experiments and you know which leads the emitter, base, and collector, then you're okay. But to get ramped up to that point, always call up a data sheet. In summary, a transistor is a three-layer device used to amplify and switch power and voltage. It's also called a junction transistor or bipolar transistor, or simply a BJT. You get home tonight from school and you tell your loved ones, what were you learning out there at the technical college? We were talking about BJTs. Really. Transistors can be configured as either NPN or PNP. The middle region is going to be called the base. The outer regions are called the emitter and the collector. Schematic symbols, make sure you know, know these. NPN, not pointing in. PNP is pointing in from the perimeter. Also make sure you know the three leads, emitter, base, and collector. Transistors are classified as to whether they're NPN or PNP, silicon or germanium, high power, low power, whether they're used for switching or high frequency use. Transistors are identified with a prefix 2N and up to four other digits. Transistor package provides us with protection from the elements and vibration, a heat sink to pull heat that's generated from its operation away from it, and support for leads. Transistor packages are identified with the letters TO, which stands for transistor outline. In a properly biased transistor, we forward bias the emitter base junction, and we reverse bias the collector base junction. PNP bias source is the reverse or the opposite of NPN bias source. And you remember that term bias? Bias means to establish an operating point, operating voltage of a component. The internal barrier voltage for germanium transistors is 0.3 volts. That's the price of doing business. You've got to overcome that voltage in order to turn the transistor on. For silicon, it's 0.7. When testing with an ohm meter, each junction exhibits a low resistance when it's forward biased. Right? Forward bias, you turn it on, low resistance. Each junction exhibits a high resistance when it's reverse biased. You reverse bias it, you create a big depletion region. That big depletion region, high amount of resistance. Current's not going to be able to get through it. There's two types of transistor testers, in circuit and out of circuit, but the good news is you really need to not worry about either because at Lake Washington Technical College we don't have transistor texters because they promote laziness. laziness. It's going to be answer C on your, kid, on your quiz. Laziness. Any questions on anything we covered in this chapter? BJT's, BJT's transistors. All right. Let's go ahead and take a, about a 15 minute break. We're going to start up at about 11 after 5. Okay, chapter 23, field effect transistors. Again, the historic significance of this is uh, once they developed transistors, they wanted to do two things. One is increase the efficiency of the transistor. Okay, because the standard transistor, although it's pretty cool, does consume a fair amount of power. So they wanted to come up with a methodology that would increase the efficiency of the transistor. The other was to simply simplify the transistor. And Thus, field effect transistors were, were born out of that criteria. So upon successful completion of this chapter, we're going to be able to describe the difference between transistors, JFETs, and MOSFETs. Draw the schematic symbols for both P-channel and N-channel JFETs, depletion MOSFETs, 
and enhancement MOSFETs. Describe how a JFET, a depletion MOSFET, and an enhancement MOSFET operate. Identify the parts of a JFETs and MOSFETs. Describe the safety precautions that must be observed when handling MOSFETs. Describe the procedure for testing JFETs and MOSFETs with an ohm meter. So junction field effect transistors, JFETs, is a unipolar, let me say that again real slow, unipolar, meaning it has only one junction. A unipolar transistor that functions using only majority carriers. Remember majority of carriers and minority carriers? electrons and holes. It's going to be a voltage operated device constructed from either N-type or P-type semiconductor materials because again we only have two materials to choose from. And this device is capable of amplifying electronic signals. Construction of a JFET begins with a substrate or base of lightly doped semiconductor material could either be an N-type material, N-type substrate, or P-type substrate. The PN junction is made using both the diffusion and growth methods. And as you remember, diffusion was the most popular method that we use in manufacturing. Um, it's pretty critical that we get the shape just right. Shape is very important to get these things to behave the way we want them to behave. The channel is a U-shaped region, like, a, like if you're going to dig a channel. It's flush with the upper surface of the substrate. When made with N-type material, an N-channel JFET is formed. When made with P-type material, a P-channel JFET will be formed. I hate to do this to you, but it is what it is. No longer do we have an anode and a cathode. No longer do we have an emitter, a base, and a collector. With JFETs, we have what is called, and actually, they, they did this to try to simplify it. They have a source and a drain. Source and drain, that kind of makes sense, right? And to control the flow, you have a gate. So they really kind of went out of their way to try to simplify this. Yes, question. Um, uh, can the source and drain be swapped? Yep. Okay. Absolutely, yep. Can the source and drain be switched? Are they polarized? No, so you could, you could switch them. And this is what one would look like kind of sort of if you were an artist, an artist depiction. So this is an N channel. This is an N-channel. This is made on a P-type substrate. There's our P-material, and then there's our N-channel. So this would be like a channel that, like, uh, you know, a channel that uh, the English channel, ships could pass through. Instead of ships, electrons are passing through. So this N-channel is carved right out of the P-type substrate. Not carved out, typically probably diffused out or diffused in using the, using the photolithography process. A JFET requires two external bias voltages to operate. One is going to be connected between the source and the drain, forcing the current to flow through the channel. This is going to be our called our voltage drain source. VDS. Let me go back a slide so you can see this, right? Voltage drain source. That's going to be this path right here. And if you will, for lack of a better term, this is going to be like our working current. This is going to be the current that we're controlling to, to get her done with, to get some job done with. The other voltage is connected between the gate and the source, controlling the amount of current flowing through the channel, and this is going to be known as voltage gate 
source, VGS, voltage gate source. Let me go back a slide. That's going to be this voltage right here, VGS, VGS. Specifically what that VGS is going to do is control the size of this depletion region. See, this is my p-type substrate, this is my end channel, and this right in here is a depletion region. So I can control the size of that depletion region by changing my VGS. What's up? With the naked eye? No, you can't see this. It's an artist's depiction. You can't see none of this stuff, man. I mean, I've known people that perhaps could see it. <laughs> Met some people in Amsterdam that I guarantee you could probably see this. At least they'd swear to it that they could see it. But. Voltage drain source is connected so that the source is made negative with respect to the drain. The current then flows because the majority carriers are electrons in n-type material. The source to drain current is going to be called the drain current. The channel serves as resistance to the supply voltage. The gate to source voltage is connected so that the gate is negative with respect to the source. The PN junction formed by the gate and channel is going to be reverse biased. This creates a depletion region around the PN junction which spreads inward along the length of the channel. Let me go back a couple slides so we can see that again, right? That's what we're talking about here. That depletion region. The depletion region is wider at the drain end because the voltage drain source adds to the voltage gate source creating a higher reverse bias voltage. Remember how it has a kind of that teardrop? Let me go back a couple slides. That's what we're talking about, how it's wider right here. It's wider right here because this is where that voltage is sitting. So it's going to have more of an effect on this side. It's not going to be just like a, uh, a half oval, if you will. It's going to be stronger, stronger influence closer to the drain. So that's why it's going to look like this, if you could see it, which you can't. So you've got to believe me. You know what I'm saying? The size of the depletion region. This is really what we're talking about here. The size of the depletion region is controlled by the voltage gate source. As the voltage increases, so does the depletion region. As the voltage decreases, so does the depletion region. This is critical in the operation of these because the bigger the depletion region gets, the less current is going to flow through the channel. As the depletion region increases, the size of the channel is reduced. This reduces the amount of current flow and can be used to control drain flow. An increase in voltage gate source causes a decrease in drain current. So therefore we could say that it's uh, inversely proportional. In normal operation, the input voltage is applied between the gate and the source. The resulting output current is the drain current. The input voltage is used to control the output current. JFETs have an extremely high input resistance or impedance because the gate to source voltage is reverse biased. A lot of engineers like this property. High impedance could be a good thing. Is high impedance a good thing? High impedance is a good thing, right? The highest impedance device I ever saw was in Star Trek. They had that 
Spock had that tricorder thing. He was able to troubleshoot electronic, sophisticated electronic equipment without even connecting it up to the circuit. That's pretty high impedance. That's no effect on the circuit. So high, high impedance is, is good because it has less of an effect on it. If you had low impedance or resistance, a lot of current would want to flow through your device. So high impedance typically is a, is a good property. The amount of gate to source voltage required to reduce the drain current to zero is the gate to source cutoff voltage. The amount of gate to source voltage required to reduce the drain current to zero is the gate to source cutoff voltage. So as you increase that voltage, increase that voltage, that depletion region gets bigger, 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 till it does what to current? <laughs> Cuts it off. Gate to source cutoff voltage. Specified by the manufacturer, you can find that on a data sheet. The drain to source voltage has control over the depletion region within the JFET. As the voltage increases, so does the current. A point is reached where current levels off even though voltage still increases. So these first two bullet statements, you know what I'm talking about? This is like Ohm's law, right? What voltage increases, what does current do? Follows it, right? Ohm's law. Increase voltage, increase current. Well, with a JFET, what's going to happen here is the value of drain source voltage required to pinch off or limit the drain current is called the pinch off voltage. So what happens here with these, no longer, I mean, for the first, for the low part of the range, voltage current increases. But then what's going to happen is this. Voltage will increase, but current's going to remain because this point right here is the pinch off voltage. Pinch off voltage, that we increase voltage, but yet current does not increase. Again, you want to find that value, the data sheet. The main difference between P channel and N channel JFETs is the polarity of the bias voltages in a P channel JFET are going to be opposite to that of an N channel JFET. This is what the schematic diagram looks like. N channel, the arrow's pointing in. P channel, well, it's not pointing in. <laughs> Three leads, drain source, and you can hook those up at either way. You have no polarity associated with them, interchangeable and then the gate. This wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough just to have a FET. They wanted one that would even be more efficient, more better. So what they started doing is working on developing what's known as a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. That's a mouthful. Metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor or most commonly known as MOSFETs. MOSFETs. MOSFETs do not use a PN junction. They use a metal gate. And it's electronically isolated from the semiconductor channel by a thin layer of oxide. I want to warn you, anytime you hear this, electronically isolated, electronic or electrical isolation allows you to build up different charges on different things. That's what isolation does. And by doing so, these components are much more prone to damage. We're going to talk about that more in a bit damage from electrostatic discharge, ESD. There's two important types of MOSFETs. There's what's called an N-type unit that have N channels, and there's a P-type unit that have P channels. N-type units with N channels are called 
depletion mode devices. Depletion mode devices. That means they conduct when zero bias is applied. So basically it's like a device that is like normally on, right? It's just going to be on. And what we have to do is deplete that region to be able to start to control current. Normally it's like on full throttle. P-type units with P-channels are called enhancement mode devices. Electron flow is cut off until it's aided or enhanced by a bias voltage on the gate. So this, de this device will normally be off, if you will, until we enhance it with a voltage and begin to turn it on. This is what one of these MOSFETs would look like. Here is our substrate, P material. Here is our N channel. What we've done is put an insulating layer of material in here, and then we have a metal gate. So what will happen is the voltage that we put on the metal gate, in essence, electrostatically, will affect that end material. But the current will never flow through this insulating layer because it's an insulating layer. <laughs> now those of you in, uh, that have started ELEC 115 have done some studying on electrostatic discharge, right, ESD. This is the first component that really could be damaged by ESD. And it could do so because it's electronically isolated. So what happens is you shuffle your feet across the carpet or scratch yourself or do whatever it is that you do without proper protection. You've got one electrical potential here on your substrate and then you say touch this gate right here. And voltages as high as 30,000 volts are not uncommon for static discharge. What it's going to do is literally be like a micro miniature lightning bolt that is going to arc through the insulating layer. And I've actually seen some photographs that industry has taken in failure analysis of components and it looks just like this except you see like a little tiny crack in that insulating layer. What caused that crack? High voltage arc, static, static discharge through the insulating layer. And that's bad news, because once that occurs, components fried. Question? These are all micro miniature. These are the size of a head of a pin. This isn't big. This is This is... Components destroyed at that point. A MOSFET is formed by implanting an N channel in a P substrate or a P channel in an N substrate and then depositing a thin layer of silicon dioxide on the channel. Attaching a thin metal layer to the insulating layer. I'm sorry? What is the metal made of? Um, slips my mind. Just a conductor. So, so we're going to dioxide. That's the insulator. One difference between MOSFETs and JFETs is that the gate of an end channel depletion MOSFET can also be made positive with respect to the source. This is what the schematic symbols look like. And, ooh, look, we've added another lead. 
Sometimes this lead is available, so you can have a component with four leads coming out of it. Sometimes this lead is connected directly internal to the source. The reason that we have this additional lead, this substrate lead, is that because these devices are so efficient and they operate at such low voltages, in some cases you want to link all those substrates together to make sure they, they maintain that they're at a same electrical potential. So engineers will determine how those are all going to be tied together because any difference in potential that you build up will be a voltage that can start to develop an electrostatic field and all of a sudden you're going to have this thing doing something you don't want it to do. What's up? Absolutely. All of these can be damaged by heat. Everything for the rest of this book can be damaged by heat. Everything. Yeah, but they're doing it so again they, they electrostatically are influencing it, which means now you're not consuming as much power. MOSFETs are much more efficient. Much more efficient. If any of you are old computer old timers playing around with PCs, um, inside your computer is a little battery, and if that battery dies, forgets what time it is and stuff. Typically what that helps keep alive is the CMOS chips, complementary metal oxide semiconductors. They're CMOS, so they can put a little battery in that thing and basically it will last years and years and years and years and years. Even if it's unplugged, it'll remember the date and the time. Usually not the most accurate date and time, but it will remember it. They use this technology because again it's highly efficient. The big thing I want you to realize on the schematic symbol is generally these look like uh, N-channel JFETs, P-channel JFETs, except the gate here is not touching. That means it's electrically isolated. So therefore you know that this is going to be a MOS, metal oxide semiconductor, field effect transistor MOSFET. Enhancement MOSFETs, a device that conducts only only when a suitable voltage gate source is applied. An enhancement MOSFET does not have a conducting channel. The source and drain regions are diffused separately into the substrate. The lead arrangements are the same as with a depletion MOSFET. See? Here there's no channel. And that's on a schematic diagram how they're going to make it look. So now we've got to influence this with a voltage in order to get current to flow, source to drain, and to be able to gate that. And these are even more efficient. Safe handling of MOSFETs, leads should be kept shorted together until you install them. You don't want to short them together and then turn the power on. Well, Joe said they need to be shorted together. No. Shorted together when in transit. Hand should, uh, hands used to handle the device should be grounded. You should have a wrist strap on. Soldering iron should be grounded. You should be wearing a lab coat when you're handling these. Some of these devices, if you just look at them cross-eyed, they're going to blow up. Okay? They're very, very sensitive. So you've got to go out of your way to handle them efficiently. Effectively. Question? Huge. It's putting you at ground potential. Oh, okay. Wrist strap puts you at ground potential. Heel straps put your body at ground potential. And then typically you're isolated from ground by a couple million ohms. Okay, by several million ohms. But still, for that voltage, it won't build up on you. If you've ever been, uh, there's certain stores. Where the heck was it? Oh, I was up in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska in February for the weekend. And it was really, really, really dry up there. And any time you moved around on the carpet, you touched the door handle, you're getting zapped, you're getting zapped. It's because the humidity was so low, it was so extremely cold and dry up there that we were very prone to generating excess of static electricity because humidity does play a factor in it. 
Never insert, I love this one, never insert or remove a MOSFET from its circuit when the power is on. Well, typically you really shouldn't be removing any components from a circuit when the power is on. Testing FETs, the first thing you have to determine is what type of a device is it. If a FET, is it an N-channel or P-channel device? If it's a MOSFET, is it an enhancement or a depletion type of device? Test with an ohmmeter or a commercial transistor tester, if you dare. We don't have one here because it promotes laziness. So about the only thing you're going to be able to test here is basically opens and shorts with your, with your DMM or kicking it old school with an analog ohmmeter. In summary, a JFET uses a channel for controlling a signal. Three leads are attached to the gate, the source, and the drain. The input signal is applied between the gate and the source for controlling the JFET, having a direct impact on the size of its depletion region forming inside the channel. JFETs have an extremely high input resistance or impedance. This is a good thing. JFET schematic symbols. Up at the top is the end channel because the arrow's pointing in. The one below that, well, that's a P channel, it's pointing out. The next step of the evolutionary process of FETs is the development of the MOSFET. It's your first electrostatically sensitive component. The MOSFET is isolated. Isolate the metal gate with a thin layer of oxide. Depletion mode MOSFETs are usually N channel and are classified as normally on. Enhancement mode MOSFETs are usually P channel and they're normally off. In a MOSFET, the gate can be made positive or negative. S schematic symbols for depletion MOSFET. This is not the depletion MOSFET. This is this is a uh, the wrong illustrations. What type is this? Enhancement. Very good. You passed your first quiz. You're just not getting credit for it. The source of drain leads can be interchanged on most JFETs and MOSFETs because they're symmetrical. So your source and your drain can be interchanged. Schematic symbol for enhancement MOSFETs. These are enhancement, are they not? Yep. So we see the separately diffused regions. Electrostatic charges from fingers can damage a MOSFET. Make sure you use all ESD protocols. Technicians and equipment should be grounded when working with MOSFETs. Test JFETs and MOSFETs with a commercial transistor tester or an ohmmeter. Of course, you will not have the opportunity to use the commercial tester here at Lake Washington Technical College because Peter Welty and I believe it promotes laziness. Question. Three, three leads. Make sure you use a three-leaded soldering pencil. Uh, these stations here are all grounded. But if you're going out just to buy one for your own personal use and it's just got and it's just got two leads on it, then it's not grounded. So you want to make sure it's grounded. No, it's just the type, the style plug that has three, three, three prongs on it. And typically a manufacturer will not use that third prong if it's not attached to anything. So if you're buying one that's only got two plugs on it, because a, a lot of home appliances have only, you know, my electric razor has two plugs on it. It's not grounded because it's insulated, because it's plastic. That was the whole thing with, uh, was a Black & Decker? Double insulated. Wow, that's really insulated. That means that it was grounded and it was made out of a case that was made of plastic. But then again, I remember my dad, he's got, uh, back in Connecticut, he's got an old Craftsman electric drill, okay? And it's just a hand drill, okay? But you plug it in the wall. It's only got two plugs. And the case is metal, okay? 
So if one of the wires comes loose in there, you're basically going to be holding on to 110 and then you're completing the circuit path. So we've come a long way with electrical safety over the years. So back when they used to make hand tools out of metal, metal, I mean, that's like priceless. Dad's got a big radial arm saw, you know, radial arm saw, and cast iron arm. Takes three men and a small boy to move it. I mean, it just weighs a ton. Cast iron. Make sense? Any other questions, comments, concerns, trials, tribulations, grief, anguish, sorrow with this chapter? All right, let's go ahead and take a, uh, about a 12-minute break. We're going to kick it off again at about 6 p.m. When all of the development of BJTs and FETs was taking place, there was also some research and development taking place as it pertained to those individuals that were infatuated with higher power applications for solid state semiconductor devices. And thus was the birth of thyristors. I think you're all familiar with the spokesperson for the Thigh Master, Suzanne Summers. Well, I'm the spokesperson, Chuck Norris, for the Thigh Master. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know what to say. That's great. Chuck will kick your butt for telling him that, yeah. Chuck Norris, yeah. Now, Suzanne Summers was the spokesperson for the Thigh Master. I'm the spokesperson for the Thigh Rister. Upon successful completion of this chapter, you're going to be able to identify common types of thyristors, describe how an SCR, triac, or diac operate in a circuit, draw and label the schematic symbols for an SCR, triac, and a diac, identify circuit applications for the different types of thyristors, identify the packaging used with the different types of thyristors, test thyristors using an ohm meter. That's something that all of you could do. SCRs, silicon controlled rectifiers, are the best known of the thyristors. And again, they're referred to as SCRs. Hate to do this to you folks, but this is just how it is in the world of solid state semiconductors. We have three terminal device and different names for the leads. Now we're back to anode and cathode. That all of you understand, right? and gate, which you understand. Now these SCRs are primarily used as switches. Controls current in only one direction. Why only one direction? Because it's got an anode, a cathode, and a gate. So it's going to be like a diode that could be turned on, if you will. But it's still going to allow current to only flow in that one direction. Now you can do the same thing with a power transistor, but that power transistor would require 10 times the trigger signal of an SCR to control the same amount of current. An SCR is constructed of four alternately doped semiconductor layers made from silicon by the diffusion or the diffusion alloy method. Three junctions, not, not two, not one, but three junctions are going to be formed. And this is kind of sort of what it would look like if you were an artist. Depiction. Here we have a P layer where we attach our anode to. We have an N layer, another P layer that we connect our gate to, and then another N layer that we connect our cathode to. Cathode, anode, and gate. This is kind of sort of the electrical equivalency of it using transistors. And we know that current flows negative to positive, so our primary current path is going to be cathode to anode. And the gate is going to control whether or not that current flows or not. But I think you can clearly see how the anode must be made positive with respect to the cathode in order for this to function. This is what the schematic diagram looks like. It looks like a diode except off the cathode it's got this little leg 
with a G attached to it. G for gate. A for anode. K for cathode. K for cathode. SCRs are used primarily to control the application of DC and AC power to various types of loads. Could be used as switches to open or close circuits. SCRs made Saturday Night Fever possible. All of the lights flashing in a discotheque typically are brought to you by SCRs. A lot of SCRs use in special effect lighting because the voltage that we apply to that gate can control the sequence, the pulsing of the lights for different effects. So a small gate current can control a large load current. That's why we have these. But again, keep in mind, with an SCR, it's really DC, right? Because once, I mean, we could put AC into this thing, but how much is going to get out of it? Only half of it, and that half is going to be negative to positive, so it's going to be DC, pulsating DC. So AC cannot make it through an SCR. But for a lot of effects, it doesn't matter. If you're in a discotheque and you simply want to make lights pulse and blink, it doesn't matter. It's an incandescent light flashing to the beat of the music. It's no big deal. It doesn't matter. Even for some dimmer switches, it right, doesn't matter. DC, your, your whole effect is trying to dim the incandescent light bulb. So it doesn't matter. To deal with the problem of not being able to use this on AC loads, they developed what's known as a TRIAC. This is an acronym for triode AC semiconductor, TRIAC. A TRIAC conducts both directions of AC current flow. The positive alternation as well as the negative alternation. Has the same switching characteristics as SCRs. It's just bi-directional, right? It's equivalent to two SCRs connected in parallel with each other back to back. And it's a new component, so guess what? We've got some new, new lead names. But again, they did this really to make it easier for us. If we have an anode and cathode, as soon as I say anode and cathode, you assume polarity, right? Yep. Does one of these triacs have polarity associated with it? No, it'll, po it'll conduct positive or negative. So what they've done now is they've called it MT1, main terminal 1, main terminal 2, and a gate. And literally inside it's the equivalent of there's one SCR with the cathode on the top. Here's another SCR with the cathode on the bottom. So this one will conduct current flowing negative to positive. This will conduct flowing positive to negative on this side. Try a construction, four layered NP and P device in parallel with a PN, PN device, designed to respond to a gating current through a single gate. It's not equally sensitive to the gate current flowing in opposite directions. This is a problem for some applications because it's not equal. Advantages and disadvantages of SCRs and TRIACs. I want you folks to strap yourselves in and hang on for this. These are some big numbers. Current ratings for TRIACs go all the way up to 25 amps. That means just about anything in your home you can control with a TRIAC. I mean the biggest outlet in your home other than like a, an appliance that's hardwired to your box, it's going to be 20 amps. So anything that you could buy a consumer and plug it in a wall can be controlled with a TRIAC. SCRs, 1,400 amps. So you understand that size matters. So if you have an SCR that can control up to 1,400 amps, one would assume that it's quite heavy and it's quite big.
Does anybody know the maximum current that goes to a typical residential connection, your home? Maximum current that goes to your home? How many amps? Do you know how many? Some might. An older home might. Most of the newer homes, the standard is 200, 200 amp box. So with a SCR that's rated at 1400 amps, you could control seven homes with no moving parts. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, with no moving parts. You wouldn't even hear a chunk. You would just <laughs> silence. Voltage ratings. Triax can um, maximum of 500 volts. That again is pretty much anything residential. The highest you go residential is 240. What's that? Well, Triax typically is, is going to be, it could be commercial residential. So any, any controlling you're doing in a home appliance typically is going to use a Triax for AC. High-end applications. SCR's maximum rating is 2,600 volts. 2,600 volts. So for some of these applications, um, I mean, think about it. Even like at a, uh, at a train, a rail yard where they build trains, and you switch the tracks. I mean, if you've ever played around with model trains, uh, model trains are based on the real thing. So at a freight yard, they've got literally train tracks that will automatically switch. Well, you've got big motors that are moving those. How do you control those motors? You can use SCRs, DC motor, to move the track, to switch tracks. One of my favorite things to do, not like in the world, but kind of fun if I'm bringing somebody that's not acclimated to aviation, is take them on an airplane right at night in my airplane. And Bremerton Airport, it's a big airport. I don't know if you've ever driven by over there. It's a big airport. You can land a 737 out of Bremerton Airport. It's a long runway. Has what's known as pilot control lighting. So what I could do is when I'm flying, and normally the lights shut themselves out, down after a certain amount of time. So what I'll do is I'll fly over there, and then on instruments, I'll start the approach to the runway. So I'm coming down, coming down, coming down, and it's just black in front of you. You don't see anything. And then there's a frequency that I could dial in and then typically click. If I click three times, it brings them up low intensity. If I click five times on my microphone, it brings them up in high intensity. So all of a sudden, you're coming down, coming down. And I'm like, you know, whoever's with me, I'm like, check this out. Click, 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 click. And all of a sudden, poof, here's this huge runway, you know, with the chaser lights and everything. And I just controlled that <laughs> wirelessly through my transmitter. The receiver picked it up. Once the receiver processed it, it's probably telling a whole bunch of triacs and SCRs to go ahead and turn on the entire airport lighting in one fell swoop. It's kind of cool. Like, how'd you do that? Secret. No. Triacs and SCRs, that's how you do it. Frequency of triacs. 50 to 400 hertz. Again, this covers everything for typical commercial residential use for power, right? 500, or excuse me, 50 hertz is used in Europe. 60 hertz is used here. Who uses 400 hertz? Should be review. I talked about this last quarter. There's three flavors of power out there, electric power. 50 hertz, Europe. 60 hertz, North America. Who uses 400 hertz? Give you a hint. It was something I was just talking about. Airlines. If you get on board an air airliner down at SeaTac Airport, that power on board the airplane is 400 hertz. They started using that because of the quality of the AC power in the past. And when avionics were developed, they just continued to develop them with 400 hertz. So it's actually next time you're on an airplane, think about that. When a captain gets on and he, you know, clicks his mic. You know, this is the captain speaking, you know, from the flight, from the flight deck. Where, where else would the captain be? It's the captain from the, uh, from the forward lavatory communicating with all of you. 
But when he keys the mic, he or she keys the mic, you'll hear a a tone about like that. That's the 400 hertz no noise. If any of you play around with audio equipment, music, you'll hear that, and that hum, that 60 hertz hum. On aircraft, it's a higher frequency. So anyway, triax can be used basically for any power applications that we use. 50 hertz, 60 hertz, 400 hertz. By the way, when you're measuring AC with your fluke meter, these are the only three frequencies that your AC setting is really designed to measure. Up above about 1,000 hertz, the accuracy of measuring AC with a handheld DMM if you're at 2,000 hertz and you try measuring frequency or uh, voltage, chances are it's going to be erroneous. That's why we have to use the oscilloscope. SCRs can handle all the way up to 30,000 hertz. Triacs, although they're very good for AC, they have difficulty switching power to inductive loads. Remember induction? We talked about in the past an inductive kick. What would be an example of an inductive load? What's that? Motor. motor. A big motor. Motor in your washing machine. Motor in your dryer. Motor in, I've got a spa at home. It's got two big motors in it to, to turn the pump, make, make the water come out of the jets. Okay. Those are controlled, I know, because as soon as I got it, I tore the thing apart to look in there. How's this thing put together? It uses relays. It's not using solid state components. It's using little relays that click on, click off. Because for a big inductive load, I mean, some of those motors, you know, are huge. I'm a spa, move a lot of water. So triacs have difficulty with that. But for smaller applications, you can use a triac on an inductive load. Bidirectional or two directional trigger diodes are used in triac circuits because they have non symmetrical triggering characteristics. The most frequently used triggering device is going to be the diac, or what's known as the diode AC. Diac, diode AC. A diac construction is three alternately dope layers. The doping concentration around both junctions is going to be equal. Leads are only attached to the outer layers. It's going to be packaged like a standard PN junction diode. So you're going to have to look up the part number to make sure that it's not a standard diode, that indeed it is a diac, diode AC. This is the artist's depiction of the layers. Down at the bottom here is a schematic symbol for a DIAC. DIAC has all the same effect on current regardless of the direction of flow. One junction's forward biased, the other's reverse biased. Performs as if it contained two PN junction diodes connected in series back to back. So again, we're going to use this DIAC with a TRIAC so we get symmetrical triggering characteristics. Diax most commonly used in conjunction with triax to provide that full wave control of the AC signal. Useful for controlling lamps, incandescent lamps, heaters, and the speeds of small motors. Not big motors, because big motors have large inductive properties that we're just not going to be effective in controlling it. Thyristors can be tested with a commercial test equipment or an ohm meter. Refer to the operator manual for proper settings and readings when using commercial test equipment. The ohm meter can detect the majority of defective thyristors. Basically, you're looking at for opens and shorts. It cannot detect marginal or voltage sensitive devices. In order for you to do that, for you to test that, you're going to have to build your labs. And in your labs, they show you test circuits. Basically, if you look up the data sheet for a thyristor from the manufacturer, they're typically going to show you how to build a little test circuit so that you can evaluate that SCR or that thyristor. And that's how most of these lab books, the authors of these lab books, get the test procedure. They just simply rip off a data sheet and say, hey, build this. It's one of the reasons you really want to do these labs this quarter, because you're never going to have time to go back. You're not, trust me, 
you're not going to be able to enter any type of a cultural renaissance when you're out in industry making money saying, oh, I've got, it's a Friday afternoon, I've got some free time. I think I'm going to do that Firester lab. It just doesn't happen. You get your first job paid as a technician, you're going to get paid to fix stuff. You're not going to have time to go back and do your ELEC 120 labs over again. So uh, basically what I'm saying is just make sure you're, you're, you really go through them legitimately and have some fun with them because this is your chance to really see these individual components working in an isolated condition. So when you get out into industry, as soon as you see a problem, you're going to say, ah, I've seen that before. I saw that in a lab when I was doing the Thyristor lab. In summary, thyristors include SCRs, which is really the most popular thyristor, triax, diax. SCRs control current in one direction by a positive signal gate. They're turned off by reducing the anode to cathode voltage to zero. Used to control current in both AC and DC voltages. Schematic symbol, anode, cathode, and a gate coming off the cathode. Can handle up to 1400 amps, 2600 volts, 30,000 hertz. Is this all SCRs or just some of them? Just some of them. You got to look at the data sheet. You might have some SCRs that can only handle a half an amp, 10 volts at 60 hertz. So make sure you look at the data sheet. If you actually had, again, if you had a, I wouldn't even want one. We'd need like a little crane, one of those engine hoists probably, 1,400 amps. It's huge. Be a heavy component. Triax, bidirectional triode thyristors. Control current in either direction by either a positive or negative gate signal. The leads are known as MT1, MT2, and the gate. Can handle up to 2,500, excuse me, 25 amps, not 2,500, 25 amps, 500 volts, 400 hertz. Pretty much can control anything in your house. Requires the use of a DIAC because they have non-symmetrical triggering characteristics. DIACs are bidirectional triggering diodes. It's like two diodes back to back. Opposite polarities. Most used as triggering devices for tri um, triacs. Basically, you've got to test and evaluate the performance of all of these devices using nothing more than a commercial transistor tester, if you have access to one, or an ohm meter, which will show you the majority of opens and shorts. Any questions on anything we covered in thyristors? All right, that's all I have for lecture this evening. We can get started with chapter 28, Amplifier Basics. And um, this is really our second, second chapter in analog circuits. Um, up to this point in ELEC 120, we studied a variety of solid state semiconductor devices. And for the first time last week, we put these devices into a circuit that actually did something for us. And what we studied was the power supply. And um, the power supply, of course, is a combination of a transformer, rectifier circuit, filter circuits, and then finally we talked about regulators that keep that output at a constant level. And the interesting thing about a power supply is a power supply is indeed a real circuit. Um, a lot of what we've been talking about this, thus far, including ELEC 110, um, you probably recognize that problem on the board, um, that was a fictitious circuit. I mean, you don't, a company doesn't go out and build circuits like that. There's no money in building circuits like that. They may build a circuit like that for the purposes of a building an electronics training unit, but uh, that's not reality. A power supply, on the other hand, is reality. Those are real circuits that exist out there to give us the DC values that are needed to properly bias solid state semiconductor devices. The circuit that we're going to talk about today, amplifier basics, again, are real circuits. Amplifiers are real circuits. They exist out there. So all of this is, is very uh, contemporary um, information that you're going to be able to build on. Keep in mind, though, that this is a survey class. 
ELEC 120 is a survey class. So all this is, is a light sugar coating um, of this topic. Um, in future classes, courses, you're going to be able to drill down in further and, and explore these, these amplifier basics much more detail. So this is just to give you general overview oversight. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to describe the purpose of an amplifier, identify the three basic configurations of transistor amplifier circuits, identify the classes of amplifiers, describe the operation of direct coupled amps, audio amps, video amps, RF amps, IF amps, and operational amplifiers and draw and label schematic diagrams for the different types of amplifier circuits. Amplifier configurations, the transistor can be connected in three different circuit configurations. Common base, common emitter, and common collector. By using that term common, what we're talking about is one lead serves as a common reference point and the other two leads serve as an input and output connection. So obviously with only three leads to choose from, emitter, base, and collector, that's what gives us the three different possible combinations. Common base, common emitter, common collector. Each configuration of amplifier can be constructed using either NPN or PNP transistors. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters with what bias voltages we ultimately apply. But you could get the same results with either NPN or PNP transistors. The transistor, not transmitter, this is a typo. Transistor's emitter base junction is going to be forward biased. which is nothing new, right? We always forward bias the emitter base junction. That's how we turn a transistor on. The collector base junction is always reverse biased. This shouldn't be anything new to you because this is normally how we turn a transistor on. We forward bias the base emitter junction, we reverse bias the collector base junction. Each configuration, meaning common base, common emitter, common collector is going to have advantages and disadvantages. The common emitter circuit is going to be the most widely used. It's going to be the most widely used. And we'll explore why in a bit. A picture is worth a thousand words. This picture here really explains a lot. Let's take a look first at these, the columns here. We have the circuit type, common base, common emitter, common collector, and then input resistance or impedance, if you will. And as you know, impedance in AC is the combination of resistance and reactance. So we have with a common base a low input impedance common emitter medium, and common collector high. Now, which is better, low impedance, high impedance, or me medium impedance? Or is it irrelevant? Well, frequency is going to have a determining factor on it, but the most important thing for us to take into consideration is that we get the proper impedance matching. Okay. In order for maximum power transfer to take place, the internal impedance of the source must equal the internal impedance of the load. Remember we talked about that a little bit in ELEC 110? So in order for me to get the maximum amount of power from the source to the load, I need to match the impedance. So, if I had a high impedance microphone and I was going to attach my microphone to a cable and have that cable connected to an amplifier configuration out of a transistor, which 
configuration would be most desirable for me to use? High impedance microphone. This is not a trick question. If I have a high impedance microphone and maximum power transfer takes place when the in internal impedance of the source closely matches the internal impedance of the load, which configuration would I want to use? High to high. Common collector. So an engineer designing that circuit, the first stage of that circuit, he or she would probably choose a common collector configuration to closely match the impedance of the microphone. Now the output resistance or slash impedance from a transistor configuration, common base, common emitter, common collector, will be in this column. So although the common collector has a high input in impedance, it has a low output impedance. The voltage gain, common base is high, common emitter is medium. Common collector, check this out, voltage gain less than one. You put in a volt, one volt peak to peak, you're going to get something out less than a volt peak to peak. That doesn't sound like it's amplifying voltage, does it? If what, you put, what, you, what you're getting out is less than what you put in. However, for the common collector, the current gain is going to be medium. Common emitter, medium. Common base, less than one. So common base is going to give us lower current gain, but high voltage gain. The combination, of course, of voltage and current in a circuit is what we define as power. Literally, voltage times current. So therefore, we could say that the common base has a medium power gain, medium because it's high voltage and low current. Common collector gives us medium power gain, medium current gain, and less than one for voltage gain. But common collector has high power gain because it's medium voltage and medium current. So remember that slide where I said common emitter is the most popular configuration? This is why. This is why. Plus it's got medium input impedance, medium output impedance. It just lends itself to most applications. If you're in a lab using an oscilloscope and you were signal tracing, that's evaluating the signal from an input of an amplifier, comparing it to the output. Calling up the displays on an oscilloscope would look like this. Now for common base, we note that when we put a small signal in, we get a large signal out. Now, what is it that you actually look at on an oscilloscope? What are you looking at? It could be a sine wave, could be, so you're looking at the waveform, but what is it? You're looking at what versus what? Versus v voltage versus time, very good. So you're looking at amplitude. So if you put in a small amplitude signal, you're going to get out a big amplitude signal. Common base, okay, common base. Voltage gain is high. So does that make sense? Does this output make sense? That you put in a small voltage, you get out a big voltage. Common base, voltage gain is high. Okay. Common emitter. We put in a small voltage, we get out a big voltage. Common emitter. We put in a small voltage and voltage gain is medium. So yeah, we're going to get out something bigger than what we put in. But what's unusual about this output? Yeah, this is inverted. This is phase shift. It's 180 degrees phase shift. So with a common emitter configuration, we're always going to get an inverted output. But it is going to be medium voltage gain. And then finally, common collector. We put in a small signal and we get out a small signal. But if we look at this common collector, the voltage gain is less than one. So is this illustration here really accurate? Okay. 
We really can't tell. I mean, it looks like it's exactly the same diagram. We'd have to get up and actually measure it. But it should be what? It should be smaller. Smaller. And then we note that there's no phase shift with a common collector output. The output's going to be in phase with the input. So the only amplifier that has phase shift is going to be the common emitter output. Amplifier biasing, all configurations of transistor amplifier circuits require two voltages. The emitter base junction is going to be forward biased, the base collector junction is going to be reverse biased. Both voltages can be provided by the same source, the same power supply. Thermal instability, of course, is a big problem with the utilization of semiconductors in general. Temperature changes cause the transistor's internal resistance to change. The bias currents then change. The operating point of the transistor shifts. Operating point means how much it's amplifying. Generally speaking, without getting too complex, what they're defining as the operating point is you all know that a transistor could be used as a switch, right? It could be turned on and it could be turned off. When we turn a transistor on, basically what we are is we're saturating it. We're turning it on. We're using it as an absolute on condition. The other condition is where we cut it off. Between that point of saturation and cutoff is what we define as the operating point. So we get, the, we get the transistor to kind of be turned on, not turned off, not turned all the way on, but kind of turned on at, the, at what we call the operating point. Therefore, when we put a signal into the transistor, that as that signal goes more positive, it turns the transistor on more. As it goes negative, it turns the transistor on less. So it's smack dab in the middle. If we were at saturation and we put a signal into it, any change in that input signal wouldn't be felt because the transistor is running at full throttle. Correct, and that depletion zone is changing based on the input signal of like you speaking into a microphone. When I speak into a microphone, it's creating electromagnetic energy, right, that's being transferred down the wire that's going to be put into the input of the transistor. That, that small fluctuation is going to make that operating point change and amplify more, amplify less based on my speech pattern. And the key word there is amplify. So that's how speech pattern has an effect on the biasing of the transistor and thus the amplification of a signal. Make sense? So achieving that operating point is really critical. So obviously if temperature instability is going to cause that operating point to move, that's going to create problems for us. To compensate for temperature changes, we feed a portion of the unwanted signal back to the circuit input. And this is called feedback. This is intentional feedback. And this is good. It's not the kind of feedback you hear at a concert where, you know, check, check, me that loud noise, obnoxious noise. That's not what we're talking about. This is intentional feedback fed back in to keep that operating point stable with the transistor. There are several classes of amplifiers. The first amplifier we're going to discuss is the class A amplifier. The class A amplifier is biased so that the current flows throughout the entire cycle. So that means if I put in a 360 degree waveform, we're going to get out a 360 degree waveform. Because of this behavior, this is going to have the most linear response. So it's going to be the most linear amplifier out of all of them. It produces the least amount of distortion. Why? You put 360 in, you get 360 out. Sounds like no distortion to me. Unfortunately, it's going to have lower output ratings. These are not going to be high-end power amps. These are going to be relatively low power amplifiers. They're the least efficient. 
applications include use in radios, televisions, any type of analog circuitry. Class AB amplifiers bias so that the output current flows for less than a full cycle, but more than a half cycle. So you put in a 360 degree waveform, you get out something more than half, but less than full. Because you're getting out something less than full, more than half, this is going to produce a substantial amount of distortion. You put in a nice, clean, crisp circuit signal, you're going to get out something less than that. So it's going to produce some distortion. Class B amplifier bias so that the output current flows for only half of the input cycle. You put 360 degree sine wave in, you're only going to get half of it out. So since you put in a full wave and you're only getting out half, this is going to produce a substantial amount of distortion. Finally, um, actually that type will be used as output stages of stereo systems and public address amplifiers and many industrial controls. Finally, class C amplifier, C as in Charlie, bias so that the output current flows for less than half of the AC input cycle. You put a 360 degree sine wave in, you're going to get something less than 180 out. Obviously this is going to produce a substantial amount of distortion. This is used to amplify RF signals, radio frequency signals, used for radio and television transmission. So we're not talking about the audio or the video that make up a television signal or a radio signal. What we're talking about is the radio frequency that's being broadcast out. So like if you listen to the conservative broadcast of KISW 99.9 FM, the rock of Seattle, that's what we're talking about. The amplifier that amplifies that 99.9 .9 million hertz, that is typically a class C amplifier. So if you looked at the schematic diagram up at the transmitter, you'd say, oh, wow, okay, yeah, this looks like a class C amplifier because it's used to amplify the radio frequency, 99.9 .9 FM, not the audio that you listen to. Obviously, if they're broadcasting out the audio using a class C amp, it would sound like crap. Nobody would listen to that station. Now, since it's pretty obvious to us after looking at that chart, no one amplifier does everything for us. So typically what we're going to have to do is use multiple stages of amplifiers, different stages to do different things. So we're going to have to couple the amplifiers, one stage to another stage to another. Even back in the day in the 1960s with an eight transistor radio, eight transistors were used to build a little AM radio. So that was eight transistors that had to be coupled in some manner. So we have to use amplifier coupling used to obtain greater amplification. The coupling method used must not disrupt the operation of either circuit. There are four methods that could be used. RC coupling or resistive capacitive coupling, very popular, used primarily in audio amplifiers. And typically the capacitor is going to be electrolytic. And you need to be careful with electrolytic capacitors because of if, if you put it in a circuit backwards, it will explode, right? The low frequency limit of the audio circuit is going to be determined by the size, physical size of the capacitor. The high frequency limit is going to be de determined by the type of transistor used. Because remember transistor data sheets, they're going to show what the maximum usable frequency is. All transistors are not created equal. Another method of coupling that we could use is called impedance coupling. Impedance coupling. An inductor is going to be used instead of a resistor. We use the inductor because it consumes less power than the resistor. Therefore, having an overall increase in the efficiency of the circuit. 
Typically, we'll use impedance coupling over only a very narrow band of frequencies that must be amplified. So if you have a narrow band amplifier, using impedance coupling sometimes is desirable for an engineer to choose. Transformer coupled circuit. Sometimes we're going to use transformers to couple one circuit to another. Can effectively match a high impedance source to a low impedance load. Remember before in lecture I was talking about a high impedance microphone? If you wanted to couple a high impedance microphone to a low impedance amplifier, you could use transformer matching. You could have an impedance matching transformer that you could utilize. Why is that so desirable? So that you get maximum power transfer. And you always want to get maximum power transfer. How many of you here have any speakers in your car or at the house or anything like that? How many of you want to get the maximum power to your speakers? If you want to get the maximum power to your speakers, you've got to effectively do impedance matching. If you don't, now will it work if you don't? Yeah, it will work. And I've heard that from a lot of students. Well, you know, I just wired it up directly and you know, it works, it works good. No, it doesn't. Because unless you're matching the impedance, you're not coupling the maximum power from the source to the load. Now sometimes, especially like with an audio system, you know, how often do you ever push it to the limit where you really want to do that? But still, if you don't, you're losing energy. You're losing energy and, and efficiency is what it's all about. Another method is the direct coupled method used to amplify very low frequencies or a DC signal. Provide a uniform current or voltage gain over a wide range of frequencies. This type of coupling typically is not very stable. In summary, Amplifiers are electronic circuits used to increase the amplitude of an electronic circuit. The transistor is the primary amplifying device. Three common configurations, common base, common collector, common emitter. And by common base, common collector, common emitter, it means what are we using as a reference point for the input and the output. Common collector amps are used for impedance matching. Common emitter amps provide phase reversal of the input-output signal. It's the only one that inverts the phase. A single voltage source can provide the forward and reverse bias voltages used using a voltage divider arrangement. A transistor amplifier could be biased so that all or part of the input signal is present at the output. Class A amplifiers are biased so that current flows throughout the entire circuit. AB, you put in 360, you get out 180. More than 180, less than 360. Class B, you put in 360, you get out 180. Class C, you put in 360, you get out less than 180. And primarily those Class C amplifiers are used for RF amplification, TV and radio signals. Coupling methods, RC, resistive capacitive, impedance, which utilizes inductor in place of the resistor, transformer coupling, and direct coupling. Direct coupled amplifiers are used for high gain at low frequencies or amplification of a DC signal. Anybody have any questions? Okay, chapter 29 amplifier applications. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to describe the operation of direct coupled amplifiers, audio amplifiers, video amplifiers, RF amplifiers, IF amplifiers, operational amplifiers, and identify schematic diagrams for the different types of amplifier circuits. First of all, the direct coupled or DC amplifiers used for high gain at low frequencies or for the amplification of a DC signal. Also used to eliminate frequency loss through a coupling network. 
applications of DC amps include computers, test and measurement equipment, and also a lot of the circuits associated with industrial controls. So those of you that continue on in the program when you get to ELEC 226, industrial automation, you'll see a lot of these DC amps are used in those industrial controls. You could have multi-stage amplifiers. This is where two or more stages are connected together. This is going to be typical based on what we discussed last chapter. No one transistor configuration meets all of our needs. So therefore, from time to time, we're going to have to use multiple stages. Complementary amplifiers would be a two-stage direct coupled amplifier that contains both NPN and PNP transistors. These are considered complementary amplifiers. Another type would be considered the Darlington arrangement or Darlington pair. This is where two transistors are connected together to function as a single unit. Some of these transistors will only have three leads on them. And it's not until you look at the data sheet that you realize it's considered to be a Darlington pair transistor. I remember years ago working on a television set and I had one of these fail. And when I was surprised when I called up the schematic and looked at it. It's like, okay, that's a Darlington arrangement. It's Darlington pair. It was a single transistor can that I had to get, unsolder three leads, and then put the component in. But inside one can were two transistors in this Darlington pair arrangement. Differential amplifier configuration is very common. It's an amplifier that has two separate inputs. It may provide one or two outputs. The nice thing about a differential amplifier is it has a high degree of temperature stability. It's one of the reasons we use them extensively. These are used extensively in integrated circuits and other electronic equipment. It's the most important DC amplifier due to versatility and temperature stability. The differential amplifier. Now some of these different types of amplifiers we're going to talk about. The first here um, in this classification will be the audio amplifier. Audio. And audio range at birth provided your mother didn't listen to rock and roll when you were in the womb. At birth, if you have normal hearing, you hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. That's normal human hearing. So obviously, if you're going to have an audio amplifier, you want an amplifier that's capable of amplifying 20 to 20,000 hertz. Now there's two types. There's what's called a voltage amplifier and what's known as a power amplifier. Voltage amplifiers are used to produce high voltage gain. And actually a lot of public address systems, because you think about it, I mean it's something that we take for granted, but a public address system, so they could at one location of the school pick up a microphone and simultaneously broadcast to every room in this entire campus. It's a pretty complex amplification system when you think about it. Okay? Typically that's going to be done through voltage amplification because they have such long runs for that signal to make it to every corner of this campus. Power amplification, well, that would be like going to see a performance of the Pink Floyd Orchestra. Okay, because what they're trying to do is fill an auditorium with sound. And what they're going to do, the way they're going to do that is with pure power. Usually a little bit too much power. If there is such a thing. I must be getting old. Seems like uh, every musician has to be breaking your eardrums thinking that's what they've got to do in order for them to be heard. And um, I don't know why that is. I don't know why that is in music. I've heard some light, live performances over the past year that would just, if they just throttled back on the power, would have been really nice. You know, I guess maybe I'm getting old. Maybe that's it. Power amplifiers are used to deliver a large amount of power to a load. Safe Cofield, right? 
go to a game at Safeco Field and they're making the general announcements. It takes power to do that, to fill an auditorium with sound. Interstage transformers are used to connect two or more voltage amplifiers to provide for higher amplification. I would assume that throughout this PA system here at Lake Washington Technical College, there are multiple interstage transformers that are used to get that voltage from the source to the individual loads in all the classrooms and buildings. Now video amplifiers, these are a whole different animal. Video amplifier is considered to be a wideband amplifier because video takes a lot of space to amplify a true video signal, an analog video signal. We're talking about analog here. We're not talking about digital video. It's a, it's a different, different uh, animal entirely. We're talking about analog. Frequency range is from a few hertz to five or six megahertz. So you're talking about a huge bandwidth there, five to six million hertz worth of bandwidth. Only direct or RC coupling is used because it has a flat response. Now, are any of you here musicians at all in the classroom, musicians? When you hear about something being flat, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. In electronics, it's a good thing. Okay? When you were born, remember 20 to 20,000 hertz? Hopefully, you had a flat hearing response so that you could hear consistently from, if you go in to the doctor to have your hearing tested, that's what they're looking at. Do you have a flat response? Can you hear the low frequencies as well as you could hear the high frequency? So we want that to be flat. For people that suffer from hearing loss, typically it's certain frequencies that drop out. Other frequencies they hear, other frequencies they lose. My dad has horrible hearing. He's a World War II veteran. He was a machine gunner in World War II. They didn't have any hearing protection. So he's sitting running a machine gun without hearing uh, protection. So he's got really bad hearing. You know, he's, he's 87 years old, um, but really bad hearing loss because of that. Other frequencies he could hear, but unfortunately, normal speech tones and everything, those are the frequencies that are lost. Video, we need that flat response. Because if not, we're going to lose color, we're going to lose contrast, we're going to lose audio, we're going to lose information. We can't do that. To get a good video picture, you need to amplify the entire bandwidth of that video signal. So flat response indicates gain does not vary with frequency. RF and IF amplifiers are similar to other amplifier configurations, except the operating range is a quite extreme. Could be from 10,000 to 30,000 megahertz. And for those of you that forgot how to do the math, 30,000 megahertz is 30 gigahertz. 30 gig. 30,000 megahertz. 30 gigahertz. There's two classes of RF amplifiers. One is the tuned amplifier. This is an amplifier that is tuned to a unique frequency to amplify that frequency, period. And the other is untuned, where we're typically wanting to amplify something more broadband. An example of a tuned RF amplifier, a great example, I'm glad I came up with it, is DirecTV. You're all familiar with DirecTV or Dish Network? or Sirius satellite radio, Sirius XM satellite radio. Those are all tuned amplifiers. There is a satellite in outer space that's broadcasting direct TV signal. Actually, the satellite is real easy, too, it, it to find. It's right out over the equator. If you went south of Texas to the equator and then went out to a point 33,000 miles out in space, you'd find direct TV satellite. And what it's doing is it's picking up a signal from Castle Rock, Colorado, just south of Denver. It's between Denver and Colorado Springs. It's out in the boonies, the middle of nowhere, fenced-in facility. And what they do is they get all of the TV signals, they process them into one signal, and send it up to the satellite 33,000 miles in space. That satellite repeats the signal and beams it back to North America. Okay? 
you buy a DirecTV tuner and satellite dish, you set it up, you're literally listening with something the size of a pizza box to a satellite 33,000 miles in space. You're listening to a satellite that's powered with solar panels. Doesn't have an extension cord, doesn't have a nuclear reactor. Okay? So it's relatively a low power transmitter. So what you need is a tuned amplifier that's tuned into just that exact direct TV frequency and that it amplifies that radio frequency signal. It uses the dish to converge the signal and then amplify that signal as much as it possibly can. And it's really amazing technology. I think some of you remember back in the day, if you wanted satellite TV, you'd need these big, huge dishes. You'd need to point it towards the different, you know, I want to listen to CNN. You know, you got to point it towards a different satellite. You want to listen to, you know, CBS News, you got to point it to a different satellite. Now, you're paying for that service. DirecTV processes it all, puts it into one signal, sends it to the satellite, it comes back, you receive it on that unique frequency, a tuned amplifier, a tuned RF amplifier. Very, very unique, very, very proprietary. Could you get a DirecTV satellite dish and convert it to search for ET? Well, yeah, if ET's broadcasting on the same frequency that DirecTV's broadcasting at. Other than that, the equipment only has one use, one use only. That's listening to DirecTV. Make sense? How much of the signal does DirecTV transmit up to their satellite? Only certain channels that they broadcast everything up to that satellite. They broadcast everything up to that satellite. Because if you have a direct TV receiver, you're listening to that signal. So guess what your receiver's picking up? Everything. Everything. Premium channels, pay per view, <laughs> everything. So, it's all out there in the signal. It's all coming into your house. It's all coming into your living room. Need I say more? If you know what you're doing, and you could pick those pieces apart, theoretically, one would be able to watch whatever they wanted to watch. But of course, watching anything more than what you're legally subscribed to could be a federal offense. I know a guy that was accused of such a thing once. I'll tell you the story sometime offline. It's not fun going to your mailbox and getting big envelopes. It's not fun answering certified mail. It was not spend, fun spending thousands of, do, thousands of dollars to prove your innocence. Untuned amplifier is a response is desired over a large RF band. The main function would be amplification, broadband amplification. Tuned amplifiers, a high amplification is desired over a small range of frequencies or a single frequency. IF amplifiers is a fixed tuned amplifier used to increase a signal to a usable level. Let me tell you the way that it works. The way electronic works, according to Joe Grenick. Everything that you do here as far as your labs at Lake Washington Technical College are very vanilla, very plain, very straightforward. And this is because it saves you a lot of money and you don't even have to call GEICO. When you start playing with extreme frequencies, the equipment gets very, very, very expensive. Generally speaking, audio you could experiment with audio here. 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, no big deal. You could experiment with, with some RF here, no big deal. But when you start experimenting at extreme RF frequencies, it gets extremely expensive. Like a radar signal, for example. You can't even pick up a radar signal and process it through coaxial cable. You need to use something that's called waveguide. And waveguide actually resembles like drain pipe more than it resembles coaxial cable. So getting this perfectly engineered waveguide 
is extremely expensive. I mean extremely expensive. A lot of the equipment that I worked on in the military, because I worked at a lot of extreme frequencies, because my job was exploitation of the electromagnetic spectrum. I was an electronic spy. I needed equipment that could intercept these signals. If you opened up some of my equipment, I used to love doing that on, non on, on non unclassified tours. And if you knew anything about electronics, you kind of had an idea what you were looking at. I'd open up some of my equipment racks and let people look in, and it looked more like plumbing than it looked like electronics. It looked like musical instruments, plumbing. You think that stuff's cheap? Big, big bucks. Big, big bucks. So the same thing is like if you had a satellite receiver in your backyard to pick up a satellite in outer space that was broadband not tuned like direct TV, non-proprietary, you'd need to have waveguide. If you've looked at the big satellite dishes, you see like down in uh, New Mexico, the VLA, like in the movie Contact, all of those satellite dishes are coupled with waveguide. They're coupled with waveguide actually to the buildings. Very, very expensive system, extremely. I mean, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So one of the first things that we want to do in any type of radio frequency receiver is convert the radio frequency, RF, the RF, to what's called IF, intermediate frequency. RF to IF. Because once we convert it to IF, we get it to a frequency that's more user friendly and we could use general generic components that are readily available to process the signal, extract the intelligence off of the signal, demodulate the signal, amplify the signal. Make sense? So you want to convert that RF to IF as soon as you physically can. And that's really what DirecTV does. Back to DirecTV. You know where DirecTV converts that RF to IF? They convert the RF to IF on your rooftop, at your dish. That signal gets con converged in the little dish to a, a focal point. It gets amplified with an RF amplifier to the most useful level, and then immediately gets converted to an intermediate frequency. You know where that intermediate frequency gets sent? down coaxial cable that's cheap and plentiful to your control box. And then from there, the video could be dissected. And then through your access card, you're allowed to watch the individual channels that you're subscribed to. But what's coming through that coaxial cable through the wall? Everything. Everything that's been converted to an intermediate frequency. Why? To cut the cost down. Other than that, other than that, DirecTV would be out of business. You know, you got to go out and invest $20,000 in a satellite receiving earth station. Wouldn't make sense. Back in the day, I don't know what they're getting for those. They're giving those receivers away. Get one at Walmart for 49 bucks. Satellite dish receiver, set it up. Highly proprietary. RF converted to IF. R IF sent down coaxial cable to your tuner box. And then you could sit there and surf. This here shows some IF frequencies that are used. These are all common frequencies. If you listen to your AM radio, you got an AM radio in your car, you listen to your AM radio, your AM, all AM radios go from this frequency here, 535 to 1605 kilohertz. That's American AM radio, licensed by the Federal Communications Commission. When you're listening to a station here, AM, all, any or all of these stations get converted to this frequency, 455 kilohertz. So inside your radio are circuits that are processing that 455 kilohertz. If you're listening to Como, I'm listening to Cairo, you're listening to, to KJR, all, no matter what station, immediately is going to get converted in your radio to this common intermediate frequency. And this intermediate frequency is going to have a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. Have any of you ever noticed with AM radio, you listen like Como or Cairo or whatever, kind of they all kind of sound the same? Part of that's because of the studios and the compression and the microphones and 
you know, you could take different people with different voices. I mean, they all have the golden radio voice. But when you put them on that station, the signal processing is all going to be the same. The other reason is you're listening on AM radio to something that only has a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. So that processing is going to really kind of be in a narrow band. So everybody's going to start to kind of sound the same. It's actually funny with me growing up back in the 60s and 70s, you know, having a little transistor radio and, you know, tuning in. To, I used to, growing up in Connecticut, I used to tune to the New York stations. And the New York stations, top 40 list, this is who, who really, you know, would make and break hits in the U.S. So I'm listening to these top 40 radio stations and such, and I'd listen to these classic songs out of the 60s and 70s, you know. And um, years later, on the Internet now, with MP3s, you know, the wide availability of MP3s, even to be able to preview music, I listen to some of these classic hits. You know, this is when, when this digital technology first came on the scene, and I'm listening to it, and it's like, is this the original? It's got to be a remake. This can't be the original, because the original sounded different. Well, it sounded different because I was listening to it on a freaking AM radio little, with a little tiny speaker. Now you're listening to the stereo version, you know, MP3, which is a crappy version of compression, but it still sounds a heck of a lot better than listening to this little narrow band of AM. Does that make sense? FM radio. If you listen to FM radio, your FM radio dial goes from 88 to 188 megahertz. Everything, no matter what station you're listening to, gets converted to 10.7 megahertz inside your radio. Then that 10.7 megahertz is processed. The bandwidth of FM is 150 kilohertz. So how many times clearer is FM, or how many times better is FM than AM? <laughs> it's a good guess. 15 is a good guess. Tell me a little bit more about FM. If you're listening to an FM station, what's the difference between listening from FM to AM? What's one of the big primary differences other than frequency? What's that? What's that? Stereo. Thank you. Stereo. Uh, believe it or not, back in the day, there were a couple mono FM stations. There were a couple. I, I used to, what was it? WLNG out of Long Island. Mono FM station. Weird, okay? Uh, most of them all FM, though. FM, stereo. So, let me go back to my question. How many times clearer? Well, before I go to that question again, which I'm going to get back to. It's two channels. How much for each channel? If I got 150 kilohertz, how much is going to be dedicated to each channel? 75. How much better is F FM than AM? 7.5. Make sense? Which is pretty significant. Which is pretty significant. But in the FM, you've got that stereo. So you've got left channel data, right channel data. You've got to broadcast both of them. Now this down here is historic information because this doesn't even exist anymore, at least not like this. A couple of years ago, we shut down television broadcast analog. Now everything is DTV, digital TV. Okay, so if I had an old television set and I hooked up an old antenna and toot to channel 7, it'd be nothing but snow right now because they're off the air. They're off the air because the federal government that licensed all of this said, you know what, if we go to digital TV, we could broadcast the same information and use a lot less bandwidth. So we could give the television stations different frequencies to use and then we could get all of these frequencies and auction off these frequencies so people could use these for Wi-Fi, for mobile phones, for all kinds of other stuff. And that's exactly what they did. Because this was huge bandwidth. Six megahertz. You don't need that in a digital signal. You don't need that. A very narrow band in a digital signal. So they recouped all of this. But back in the day, this is how, how television broadcasts used to go. 
Um, channels two through six, this table's not aligned perfectly. Channels two through six were between 58 or 54 and 88 megahertz. Seven through 13 were 174 through 216, and then channels 18 through, or excuse me, 14 through 83, 470 to 890. So some of you back in the day may remember um, to have a television set, you needed a VHF antenna and a UHF antenna. This was the dividing point right there. Everything down here is considered VHF, this is UHF. The common intermediate frequency, no matter what station frequency you were listening to, everything got converted between 41 and 47 megahertz, which was a bandwidth of 6 megahertz. Television is actually even a more interesting story. This is what originally was come up with for the use of television, black and white television, moving pictures beamed to your homes. People were horrified. Ugh, there's no way. It's going to cause brain cancer. This is horrible. Moving images broadcast into the homes. Obviously the work of Satan. Okay? So they had black and white TV for years. And black and white TV, it was good. And people enjoyed it. Even if you watch some of these classic TV networks, you still see shows that were done in black and white. They were done in black and white, not for artistic impression. They were done in black and white because back in the olden days, everything was black and white. At least what I asked my parents, you know. Was everything back then like black and white? Isn't that weird? Did you like freak out when you like woke up one day and everything was color? Now, of course everything was color. It was just broadcast in black and white. When technology evolved and television came up with color, the FCC stepped in and said, hey, you know what? Out freaking standing. Sounds like great technology. People will love having color images in the house. The only problem is you can't come up with new technology to do it. You've got to make this color image fit in this same profile so that if you've got a black and white television and I send you a color signal, you will see it as a black and white image, but it's still going to work. So engineers, I would imagine, said, this sucks. And then they went back scratching their heads. And you know what? They got it to work. So they didn't want people to have to go out and buy new technology because of this new technology. If you had a black and white set, it would process black and white and color. If you had a color set, it would, it would both color and black and white. Forward and reverse compatible. And it was good. And it went on for a number of years. Then one of the next major advancements that took place Heck, I remember it was back in the 80s, I think, like Miami Vice broadcast in stereo. In stereo. They came up with televisions that had stereo, a left channel and a right channel. This was unheard of. This is phenomenal. Okay? So what, and again, the FCC was like, cool, but you know what? It's got to be able to work with existing sets. Existing sets need to be able to process it, as well as the newer sets that could process and extract out the stereo information. So the engineer said, oh, this sucked. They went back, scratched your heads, and made it work. And they made it frontwards, reverse compatible. The next step, I remember, was in surround sound. They broadcast TV shows in surround sound. So you get your forward, and you get your reverse, and that was kind of the advent of Dolby. In addition to this, there were also some other advancements. Closed captioning. Closed captioning, right? So that if you're hearing impaired, you could tune to that and call up, and as long as the show with closed captioning. Some of you remember, may remember some of those classic broadcasts about with closed captioning. Ooh, okay. Then the next evolutionary process, what else did they fit into the video signal? Have any, any of you heard of SAP? Different languages? So you could be watching CSI and change your settings, and it's CSI broadcast over the airwaves, but they're sending another audio signal that's in Spanish, or French, or Portuguese, or whatever. So they had to make all of this stuff fit into the 6 megahertz. And engineers made it work, and it worked well. Just when they got it all working well and they got everything into that, the government said, you know what? We're going to pull these frequencies back, and we want you to do everything that you do and put it into a digital packet now and broadcast that on a digital transmitter. Um, 
and they got that working, and that's good. I don't know. Does anybody receive digital signals off an antenna in here? Off an antenna? Yeah, that's good. And digital is good. Either get it or you don't. I was actually a big skeptic of switching over to digital because I know enough about digital. So even like my cell phone, my first cell phone was an analog cell phone, and it was good, and it worked very, very well. And I had no interest in going to a digital cell phone because digital sounded like you're like in a, in a fishbowl or underwater or whatever. I mean, the quality was like really poor. And I'm like, the only reason I have a cell phone is not to raise my level of self-importance. It's to get those emergency calls to my family, whatever. You know, if I'm here and they can't get in touch with me. And with, if I'm taking such a call, I want it to be as clear as possible. So I had no interest in going to digital. Who won that battle? They won that battle. And how they did it was economics. Basically, what they made analog service um, very, very expensive. And if you get a digital phone, we offer you, you know, instead of paying this for your cell phone bill, you're going to pay this because it's digital. So it's kind of like a no-brainer. Now, I, there's very few analog networks that even exist anymore. Why? You can handle fewer calls. Digital network can handle a lot more calls simultaneously. Same amount of equipment, narrower bandwidth, handle more calls. They could sell more subscriptions to the cell phone service. Makes sense all the way around. So. And digital technology has come a long way. It's really come a long way with some of the, the compression algorithms that they're using now. And, uh, you know, and then the, even the phone. I mean, my latest phone that I got, I couldn't believe when I made a call on a headset. It's like, wow, this is really freaking clear. This is really rock solid. You know, so these are all advancements that keep taking place. So what happens with those advancements is we keep wanting getting the same with a narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower bandwidth. This even took place, I mean I could, I could sit here and bore you all day with, with different things that have evolved. Aviation frequencies. Aviation frequencies. They used to cram a whole bunch of, of, of channels in this much bandwidth. That, that's the aviation air band, if you will. It's a VHF. It's right up, actually, aviation is right up above the FM dial. The only difference is it's not FM, it's actually AM, amplitude modulation. But the frequencies, like this is 108 megahertz. SeaTac, SeaTac Airport, the control tower, is 119.9 megahertz. So it's not that much further than this. The only difference is it's amplitude modulation. Okay, Amplitude modulation, narrower bandwidth, they could fit more channels on that. And that's why they did, did air bands like that. Yeah, they're always pining for that and trying to take from amateur radio, but unfortunately amateur radio has contributed to a lot of the research and a lot of these advancements to, to begin with. I mean, they really have. I mean, back when I first started teaching here as amateur radio, they were playing around with video compression, sending video over a signal. Now there's something called Skype. Where do you think Skype came from? It's all those video compression algorithms, you know, that you're shipping digitally now. They used to ship it analog in an analog matter, so a lot of this stuff really you know, if you look at amateur radio, and yeah, they're a bunch of geeks and everything, but if you really immerse yourself in it, a lot of what they're playing around with now is the technology of the future. So it would be unfortunate to see that happen. So it was the same thing in the aviation band. They wanted more and more and more frequencies, because I don't know if you even realize, if you, if you fly out of SeaTac Airport, how many frequency changes the pilot's got to make on the ground He's talking to the company dispatcher on a frequency. Then he calls to get his clearance on a clearance delivery frequency. Then he changes frequency to a ground control frequency. That allows the airplane to push back from the gate and then taxi. When he gets to the end of the runway, he calls up another frequency. That's the tower to get the clearance to take off. About the same time that the airplane's climbing out, leaving the, the, the perimeter of SeaTac Airport, he's changing to another frequency that's departure control. By the time he leaves the Seattle area, he calls Seattle Center, and that's another frequency. So you leave SeaTac Airport, and you get 50 miles away, you've changed your frequency about seven different times, and that's just Seattle, SeaTac. In addition to SeaTac Airport, there's Boeing Field, there's Renton, there's Tacoma, there's Auburn, there's all, there's Painfield. Painfield's not that far from Vancouver, BC. 
So it's, it's, there's only so many frequencies to go around. So they keep changing the technology, which, which really stinks if you own an airplane and radios, because all of a sudden your old radio is not compatible anymore. You've got to go out and spend money on a new radio with tighter bandwidths and tighter channels. But the good news is I haven't heard of any moves afoot to change that in aviation right now, because it's worldwide communication, too. Because if you take off from SeaTac Airport and you fly to Amsterdam, you got to be able to use the same radio over there for landing. Or if you fly into Russia, you got to use the same radio. So there's kind of worldwide Congress in agreement to say this will be the standard for VHF aviation radios. So you could see as, as technology increases, we're kind of fit, stuck by some constraints. So anyway, if you find any of this interesting, stay tuned. Okay, if you're going for the degree, you're going to have a course for Peter Welty, Electronic Communications. You're going to spend a lot more time with this. Um, if you think this conversation sucks, then the bad news is you're going to have a course in the future with Peter Welty called Communications, and you're going to have to deal with this again in the future. Operational amplifiers, also called op amps, are high gain DC amplifiers. I want all of you to sit down for this one and strap yourselves in. The output gain is going to be a range from 20,000 to 1 million times the input. 20,000 to 1 million times the input. That means you put in a small signal with an op amp, you could make it a million times greater. Needless to say, these are very popular amplifiers because they amplify so well. This is what the schematic symbol looks like for an op amp. A lot of people see the schematic symbol and they think digital. Well, this is some kind of a digital device. Now, this is an analog amplifier. Typically, though, this is an integrated circuit, right? Inside this are going to be a whole bunch of transistors. This is an integrated circuit. Op amps have two inputs, a negative inverting input and a positive non-inverting input. And we could look here, and this is actually a block diagram of an op amp. You're going to have two input leads, one output lead, a positive supply voltage and a negative supply voltage. So in order for you to do business with this, you're going to have to have five pins connected. Five pins connected. There are going to be two modes of operation for op amps. One is called a closed loop. And the other is open loop. These terms closed loop and open loop are also used throughout electronics industry and different technical industries. Closed loop means it uses feedback. And all of us have already discussed that feedback is desirable, is it not? It increases stability. Open loop does not use feedback. And there are some configurations that we're not going to use feedback with an op amp. Another time that you'll hear closed loop and um, open loop is uh, in the auto industry. When your car is cold, those of you that have been here all day long, when you go out to your car and you turn the key and you start the car, your car is going to boot up off the computer. Your car is typically going to boot up in an open loop configuration. It's going to start your car based on the program that Ford, Hyundai, Toyota, GM programmed into it that said, you turn the car, you turn the key, you boot up, and this will get the engine running. And it will run. And what it's doing is typically most cars look for your engine coolant temperature, like right at your thermostat. Once that temperature gets to a normal operating room range, it tries to, the car tries to go into what's called a closed loop configuration. In the closed loop configuration, now the computer starts looking at your oxygen sensors. Okay? It starts looking at your timing. It starts looking at all of this data and making subtle adjustments and tweaks to get your fuel burn just right. That's how cars, if any of you own any older cars, used to have to tune them up like every 10,000 miles, 20,000 miles. Now the tune-up interval is 100,000 miles. That's because if your car's functioning properly, every time you drive it, it's retuning itself. The computer's sitting there tweaking itself 
saying, ah, you know, this isn't quite right, and it's adjusting your fuel injectors, and it's keeping everything just right. So every 100,000 miles, you usually got to put in new spark plugs and a new cap on a rotor and, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, is going to deteriorate. So you will hear these terms again, open loop, closed loop, and they have a variety of different meanings. Summing amplifiers are used when mixing audio signals together. It's called a summing amplifier. Op amps can be used as active filters. Active filter means a filter that's turned on with a voltage. This is actually old school, how the cable company used to prevent people from watching channels they weren't authorized to watch. Inside your box, they basically would have a filter. And that filter would filter out HBO. And if you were paying for HBO, what they would do is they would turn that filter off. Actually, it's not even old school. This, was, this is uh, semi-old school. Old school was they used to put the filters out on the power pole. Or if you have an underground connection, they'd put these little filters and prevent that HBO signal from getting in your house. Showtime from getting in your house. So by the time all was said and done, a lot of people would have like a stack of filters like this out on their pole or, or in, their, in their underground box. And if you subscribe to a premium channel, the technician would come out, remove that filter, and you'd get the signal. Then they got smart, and they said, you know what, we could put these active filters right in the box. And then we could talk to it. We could serialize that box. Kalina comes and picks up a new box for cable service. It's going to have a serial number identified to it. It's going to have a little microcontroller in it. And then what you do is you call me up and say, you know, she said, I'd like to subscribe to HBO. Can I get your credit card information, please? Okay? I get that information. And then what I do on a computer, I talk to the system, and then I send a, a signal to your box and says, turn off this active filter. Allow that signal to come in. So I don't even have to touch anything. That saved them a lot of money in doing that. The interesting thing about that technology is if you knew what frequency they talked to your box at, and you got a new box, and then you prevented them from ever talking to your box, theoretically, you'd always get everything. That happened to me. Actually, it was a three-day weekend in Rhode Island, 20-plus years ago when I lived in Rhode Island. It was funny because I was teaching for the Navy at the time, and you know I was in a I worked in a lab environment. It was really cool. A lot of smart people, smarter than me. So I got a cable box. I got my my old cable failed. They gave me a new box, and it was a Friday before a three day weekend. For that weekend, I got everything. As soon as Monday came around, and the billing department got caught up, and they saw, okay, we got a process here, Mr. Grenick out on Green Court. Okay, they sent the signal, and then. That shut off all those. So then it became a technical problem that is, like, okay, how can we figure out what frequency they're using to talk? And then I could build my own filter and prevent them from talking to ever talking to my box. Once they turned it off, they turned it off. But I could subscribe to those. Yeah, Mr. Grant, I'd like to subscribe. Oh, thank you. for. Oh, and I changed my mind. Shut them off. Put the filter in place. Prevent them from talking to the box. So there's always a way of getting around stuff. And I don't advocate. I never would do that stuff, okay, because, it's again, it's federal law federal law, you do that kind of stuff, you're going to jail, you're paying fines, it just isn't worth it. Really is not worth it. In summary, direct coupled amplifiers are used as voltage amplifiers. A differential amplifier has two inputs and may provide up to two outputs. Audio amplifiers amplify AC signals in the audio range of 20 to 20,000 hertz. That's typical audio range. I know some people with, uh, with like car audio are going below that. You can't hear that below that, but you could feel it. And that's what they're going for, the, the, the effect. Two types of uh, voltage amplifiers, uh, two types of amplifiers. We have voltage, we have power amplifiers. Video amplifiers are used to amplify video information. That's why they're called video amplifiers. Video frequencies extend from a few hertz to five or six megahertz. These are considered broadband amplifiers. Playing around with video in the past was very expensive. Price really came down. A lot of that's due to integrated circuits. RF amplifiers operate from 10,000 to 30,000 megahertz. Op amps provide output gains 20,000 to a million times their input. And you know what? We don't have it here at Lake Washington Technical College, but 
you know, some schools, universities, I mean, it's a conscious choice. We can't teach you everything. Some courses have a separate course on app apps. You could have a semester-long study of nothing but op amps at a university level. I mean, op amps are a study unto themselves. For all of you, I want you to understand it's just another type of amplifier that's out there. And then two configurations that we could typically use, closed loop, our inverting configuration, um, and non-inverting configuration. Any questions on anything that we covered? All right, let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll kick things off at about 10 minutes after 6. Chapter 30, oscillators. I always kind of get a kick out of this chapter, because um, we've learned already how we get AC, and we rectify AC and convert it into DC. What we're going to do now is take DC and convert it back into AC with an oscillator circuit. So it's kind of funny. Um, if people on the outside ever really realized what we do for a living, converting AC to DC, DC back to AC, changing the face of it. I mean, that's all we really do as electronics technicians to support equipment that reshapes electrical energy. So the oscillator is the circuit that takes DC and could produce AC for us. After completing this chapter, a student is going to be able to describe an oscillator and its purpose, identify the main requirements of an oscillator, explain how a tank circuit operates and its relationship to an oscillator, draw a block diagram of an oscillator, identify LC, crystal, RC sinusoidal oscillator circuits, and identify non-sinusoidal relaxation oscillator circuits, as well as draw examples of sinusoidal and non-sinusoidal oscillators. First of all, oscillators are circuits that generate a repetitive AC signal. A tank circuit are used to excite the oscillator. A tank circuit is a circuit that contains a capacitor and an inductor in parallel with each other. We use positive feedback to help sustain the oscillation. An example of what a mechanical oscillation would be is like a doctor's tuning fork. When you strike the tuning fork, it oscillates mechanically, right? This is basically what happens with a tank circuit. When we hit a tank circuit with a voltage, what's going to happen? The capacitor is going to try to charge up to that value. What's the inductor going to do? Try to prevent a change in that, um, in, 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 prevent a change in current. What's going to happen when the capacitor discharges? The, the inductor is going to sit there and try to prevent a change in current and build up an electromagnetic ma magnetic, uh, field around it and that it's just going to be a continuous cycle of back and forth, those two components opposing each other, and it's going to oscillate at a unique frequency, just like the doctor's tuning fork oscillates at a unique frequency. An oscillator circuit, the block diagram is going to look like this. We've got the oscillator circuit, the input, feeds the amplifier, and then what we do is we take a little bit of the output here and we send it back and call, call it feedback. And that's the equivalent mechanically of like the doctor ding, ding, restriking the tuning fork to keep it oscillating. Sinusoidal oscillators are oscillators that produce a sine wave output. There's three types. LC oscillator, which is inductive capacitive oscillator. Crystal oscillator, that's where we're going to use a crystal, a physical crystal, a rock inside a little can, typically quartz. When we apply pressure to it, we apply voltage to it, it's going to oscillate at a unique frequency. And an RC oscillator, which is a resistive capacitive oscillator. You're familiar that RC circuits have time constants associated with them. Well, we're going to harness those time constants to create an oscillation. LC uses the tank, as I said. Crystals use a crystal circuit. RCs use a resistive capacitive network. There's three types of LC oscillators. This is inductive capacitive. The Hartley, the Cole Pitts, and the Clap. Again, I don't expect you to memorize all of these now um, verbatim, but I do want you to familiarize yourself 
with the, with the configuration. So all three of these are based on using an inductor and a capacitor and a tank circuit to establish the oscillation. Crystal oscillators are used when stability is a requirement because they're going to be very, very precise and very, very exact. I think I've shared with you in the past this is the problem that uh, the Soviets used to have with their radar systems is they used crystal-controlled radars. Not a good thing because we'd be sniffing around and monitoring their radars and then we could get a fingerprint of their radar. So anytime they turned that radar on, we knew exactly what ship it was on board. So it gave them a real hard time. I mean, it's kind of like if you're running from the police and the police have a signature of your car, that like when you turn your car engine on, your ignition puts out a signal that makes it unique to only your car, how tough would it be to track you if you were the police? It'd be really easy. And it's one of the things that I, I truly believe uh, helped contribute to the fall of the Soviet Union is that when you build all of your electronic systems based on that technology, where do you run? How do you hide? You really can't. As soon as you turn it on, you're giving away your identity. It's a big problem for them, not for us. Four types of crystal oscillators. Crystal shunt said Hartley. The coal pits crystal. Pierce and the Butler Oscillator. And again, these are all named after the individuals that um, discovered them, if you will. Three types of RC oscillators include the phase shift oscillator, Winebridge oscillator, and the IC Winebridge oscillator. A lot of these have all fancy names, and again, it's uh, simply the individuals that came up with them, and they're just a little bit different in their operation but all of them are designed to produce a sine wave. All of them are designed to produce a sine wave with the exception of what are known as non-sinusoidal oscillators. Non-sinusoidal oscillators include oscillators that do not produce a sine wave output. All non-sinusoidal oscillators are considered to be called relaxation oscillators. Relaxation oscillators store energy in one phase of the cycle and then release energy in the other phase of the cycle. That's why we call them relaxation oscillators. They're building up energy in one phase and then releasing it in the next. During the release of the energy, it's considered to be in a relaxation mode. Two types of relaxation oscillators include blocking and also what, a, what is known as a multivibrator. You're going to be hearing a lot about multivibrators um, in the future as we get into digital electronics. A multivibrator functions in either of two temporary stable conditions. And the, the hint of things to come with that is two temporary stable conditions. Are you even familiar with digital technology? And what are they? On and off that computer operates because of on and off conditions, period. It's that simple. Billions upon billions upon billions of them, but it's simply an on and off state. That's the simplest form of binary communication. So a multivibrator is going to be, play a huge part, huge role in the development of digital technology, which we're going to be talking about here. A multivibrator is capable of switching from one temporary state to the other, which is a basic form of binary communication. An A-stable multivibrator is a type of free-running multivibrator. The output of an A-stable multivibrator is going to be rectangular. So instead of a sine wave output, this is going to be a rectangular output. In summary, an oscillator is a non-rotating device for producing an AC current. The output of an oscillator can either be sinusoidal rectangular or sawtooth. The main requirement of an oscillator is that the output be uniform and not vary in frequency or amplitude. A tank circuit is formed when a capacitor is connected in parallel with an inductor. It oscillates when an external voltage source is applied. Oscillators are damped by resistance in the circuit. Remember, what, pro 
What property does everything have? Resistance. So because of the property of resistance, when an oscillator is oscillating, that's what's going to cause the signal to get weaker and weaker and weaker. It requires positive feedback to help maintain the oscillation. An oscillator has three basic parts, frequency determining device, an amplifier, and then the feedback network. Three basic types of sinusoidal oscillators include the LC oscillator, crystal oscillator, and an RC oscillator. Three basic types of LC oscillators include the Hartley, the Colpitt, and the Clap. Crystal oscillators provide more stability than LC oscillators. That's why we use crystal for applications that we need a high level of precision. And RC oscillators use resistive capacitive networks to determine the frequency of the oscillator. Non-sinusoidal oscillators do not produce a sine wave output. That's why they're called non-sinusoidal. Non-sinusoidal oscillator outputs include square waves, sawtooth waves, rectangular waves, triangular waves, or combinations of any other two waveforms. A relaxation oscillator is the basis of all non-sinusoidal oscillators. It stores energy in a reactive component during one part of the oscillation cycles and then gives it up in the next. That's why we call it a relaxation oscillator. Examples would be blocking oscillators and what is known as a multivibrator. Everything you ever wanted to know about oscillators. So all it is is a circuit that takes DC and gives us an AC output. Once we have that AC output, we could amplify it. We could modify that. We could use, use that as the basis of Como's broadcast frequency. There has to be an oscillator there that establishes that frequency. There has to be an oscillator in our last chapter when we were talking about the IF for AM is 455 kilohertz. Got to have an oscillator in there that oscillates at 455 kilohertz. So you'd be surprised. Oscillators are everywhere. There's oscillators in your cell phone. There's oscillators in your computer. We can't do business without oscillators. Any questions on Chapter 30? Okay. Chapter 31, Wave Shaping Circuits. This is the last chapter of the uh, Analog Circuits section. And um, after this, we're going to be getting into digital, and I'll give you an introduction to digital when we, uh, when we get to 32. So this is our last analog circuits chapter. And actually, some of this content is going to be a review, as you've been exposed to some of this material already. Wave shaping circuits. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to identify ways in which waveform shapes can be changed. Explain the frequency domain concept in waveform construction. Define pulse width, duty cycle, rise and fall time, undershoot, overshoot, and ringing as they relate to waveforms. Explain how differentiators and integrators work. Describe clipper and clamper circuits. We will not, however, be discussing the clapper. That's something different. Describe the differences between monostable and bistable multivibrators. And draw schematic diagrams of wave shaping circuits. A non-sinusoidal waveform is a periodic waveform that has the, wa the same waveform for all cycles. So that means it's something that repeats itself, and in repeating itself, it is an exact copy of what was original. So as long as it repeats itself, you could time that and add a cycle 
to it. Now, according to the frequency domain concept, all periodic waveforms are made of sine waves, just different combinations of sine waves added together. Sine waves are the only waveforms that cannot be distorted by RC, RL, or LC circuits. So what that's saying is when we feed it through these circuits, it's not going to distort it. The sine wave that has the same frequency as the periodic waveform is called the fundamental frequency. So that's your original frequency. So if you could go ahead and take a look at a periodic waveform, a sine wave on an oscilloscope, time that waveform, establish the period of that waveform, take the mathematical reciprocal of that, you end up with the frequency. That frequency is the fundamental, what we call the fundamental frequency. Not to be confused with harmonics. We're going to talk about harmonics in a minute. So what we're looking at in this illustration are actually two cycles of the sinusoidal waveform. I'm looking at a total of four alternations, right? Two positive alternations and two negative alternations. A positive alternation and a negative alternation make up one cycle of the sinusoidal waveform. In illustration B, we're looking at a square wave. What makes it a square wave is that half of the time it's on, half of the time it's off. If it's anything other than 50-50, it's not a square wave. If it's less than, if this pulse is less than 50%, we call it a pulse waveform. If this is greater than 50%, we call this a rectangular waveform. But if it exa is exactly 50%, we call it a square wave. Below this is a triangular waveform. Excuse me, this is a sawtooth waveform, not triangular waveform. Triangular waveform would have a rise time and a fall time that are equal. This has a long linear rise time and a short linear fall time. That makes it a sawtooth wave, not a triangular wave. Now harmonics is the fundamental frequency. First harmonic is a harmonic nonetheless. So the fundamental frequency is known as the first harmonic. Harmonics are going to be multiples of the fundamental frequency. They can be combined in an infinite number of ways to produce any periodic waveform. So in this particular example, we see the first harmonic here is 1,000 hertz. So this is like a 1 kilohertz frequency. If the fundamental frequency is at 1K, the second harmonic is going to be 2K. The third harmonic, 3K. Fourth, 4K. Fifth, fifth 5K. See the, the 22nd will be 22K. They're going to be exact multiples. And these harmonics will really go on to infinity. It's like if you're at a lake and you throw a rock in the, in the lake and it sends out a wave and then the rate waves come back. They just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's the same thing with harmonics. Harmonics really go on for infinity, but eventually they get so small that they're not really an issue. What we're looking at here is how a square wave is made up of the fundamental frequency plus an infinite number of odd harmonics. So what we see here is our first waveform. That's our fundamental frequency. That's the hash mark line. Everybody see that? 
So we get that, and then we start picking our odd harmonics. So our fundamental frequency is our first. Our next odd is going to be our third harmonic. If I add my third harmonic, this is what's in blue, the light blue right here. Algebraically, if I add my first harmonic and my third harmonic together, I'm going to get a waveform that looks like this solid black line right here. This kind of looks like some kind of a tooth or something. But that's with my fundamental and my third harmonic added together algebraically. If I get my fifth harmonic and add it, my fifth harmonic now is going to be this blue waveform. If I add that to my first and third harmonic, now I'm going to get this waveform. If I get my seventh, my ninth, what eventually is going to happen is this is going to clean up and this is going to look like a square wave. Yes? Right, and to be honest with you, the quality of a frequency generator is going to be based on how clean of an output you actually get. So when you look like at our function generator, not the oscilloscope will monitor this, but actually what generates this is our function generators in there, the Kenwood models. And what that's going to do is it's going to generate this square wave, and the more expensive the unit, the more it's going to take into consideration and give you a really nice, clean, crisp square wave. But basically every square wave is going to be made up of these harmonics. If you have a cheaper one, it probably is not going to add as many of those harmonics together, together to give you that square wave. Because obviously adding an infinite number, at what point are you throwing money into a black hole? How, how important is it? And actually for some electronic systems, you know, like if an engineer needs a square wave, how much money are they willing to spend on a circuit that's going to give them the perfect square wave? And at what point you reach a point of diminishing returns? You know, like, yeah, I'm throwing all these parts at it to make it so I get a perfect square wave. Well, you really don't need a perfect square wave. You need something that only kind of looks like this, if that's what you need. That's what specifications are all about. Good question. A sawtooth wave. Sawtooth wave is a very popular wave that uh, creates like the raster in a CRT display or on a radar display. It's what actually pulls the electron beam horizontal from left to right. Sweep generator inside an oscilloscope is nothing more than a sawtooth generator. So to make the sawtooth generator consists of the fundamental frequency plus even and odd harmonics crossing the zero reference line 180 degrees out of phase with the fundamental. So here we take those harmonics, invert them 180 degrees, and then add them together. So what we have here is the fundamental frequency when we add the second harmonic. Look at just adding the second harmonic 180 degrees out of phase gives us something that already that looks kind of like a sawtooth wave. When we add the third harmonic, which is in phase with the uh, fundamental frequency, now we end up getting this. The fourth harmonic with the even harmonics 180 degrees out of phase, now we get this resultant waveform. And then finally, as we continue to add an infinite number, we end up with a waveform that looks like a sawtooth waveform. And what may appear to be a sawtooth waveform on your oscilloscope, when you really zoom in on that, you may see that there's little ripples there, and it's actually made up of these different waveforms. One of the ways of looking at this as well is if you look at this on a, on a spectrum analyzer, an oscilloscope looks at time versus amplitude. A spectrum analyzer looks at frequency versus amplitude. So if you get a square wave and feed a square wave in, what you're going to see is that original fundamental frequency, and then you're going to see all of those 
harmonics that make up that square wave. You look at it on an oscilloscope, it looks like a square wave. Look at it in a spectrum analyzer, you're going to see the fundamental frequency and then all those harmonics that make it up. Same with any of these wave patterns. Now, a period of a waveform is measured from any point on one cycle to the same point on the next. Probably the best way of showing you this is on the whiteboard. As nice as they like to draw stuff in the book, this is what you're really going to see out in industry. Actually, it's not even going to be this pretty. One of the hard times that I had was um, in the military, I'd get these beautiful tech manuals that had these artist depiction of what the waveforms are supposed to look like. And then I'm out in the fleet and I'm looking at stuff like this and like, huh, this doesn't look anything like, you know, in the book it looked like this, you know. I mean, is there a resemblance? <laughs> Not really. So I really struggled with this, the world of reality versus the, way, uh, the, uh, the world of an artist's depiction. The nice thing now is actually back in the day, some of the more expensive tech manuals would include a physical photograph of the face of the wave pattern on an oscilloscope. But that costs a little bit more money to have an actual photograph in there. Now the nice thing is digital screen capture, you could export it as a JPEG file and slap it right into a document. For your project reports, you could hand in images of waveforms. And here's an actual waveform from my project, what it looks like. But you've got to be able to interpret this data. Now, they talk about the period of a waveform. So to identify a period of a waveform, you have to establish it could be any point to any other point any other point. So I'm just going to assume right here, I'm going to pick this point. Right when I start to rise here, I'm going to say that this is the start of a cycle. Okay? Tell me where the ending of that cycle is going to be. Let me know when I reach the end of that cycle. Exactly. Very good. Okay? So all we have to do here is measure the amount of time that it takes to go from here to here and that's going to give me my period. It's going to give me my period. The other thing that this time could be called, it could be called a pulse repetition time, PRT, or it could be called a pulse repetition interval. And the interval in electronics that we use as time measurement is the second. So it could be called PRT or PRI. And it represents time from the start of the waveform to the end of the waveform. From that, we could calculate out what's known as a PRF, pulse repetition frequency. And it's really easy to do. It is simply the reciprocal of PRI or PRT. Just like time to frequency, 1 over time is equal to frequency, 1 over frequency is equal to time. Same thing holds true here. So if any of you ever go to work on radar, commercial radar, one of the big things, one of the, one of the uh, parameters that you're going to have to perform measurements on is going to be the pulse repetition frequency or the pulse repetition interval. Okay, it's something you're regularly going to have to do. 
This is a chapter that I'm actually passionate about because this is exactly what I used to do a lot of my time in the Navy. I used to analyze this. Not our radar, but other people's radar. And if I could look at that, I'd call this up on my equipment, and I'd look at it, and I'd figure out what the PRT is. Once I figured out what the PRT is, I actually had a calculator. It was my, in my operator position. I had a computer uh, keyboard in front of me, a screen here, a screen here. There were a couple of oscilloscopes here, spectrum analyzers. But over here on Velcro, we had a calculator. And what the calculator was, the only reason we had the calculator was I'd plug, the, I'd plug in the pulse repetition interval and then go the reciprocal of, and that would give me the PRF. And the reason that I was using a calculator, I had on a computer screen what the computer thought the PRF was. But I didn't trust the computer. If you trusted the computer, you might kill a friendly. And I, w I didn't want to trust it. I wanted to look at it, because if I'm looking at this, there's no way of faking it. If I perform that pulse repetition interval measurement and calculate that the PRF, then I could check my computer and make sure my computer's not bumped open me. Because the military, it's like life or death, so you can't make mistakes with that. And actually, how would the computer make a mistake? How do you think the computer would make a mistake? Anybody want to take a guess at this? It's something we've talked about already today. Elaborate more. It's actually an easier answer. It's a one word answer. Harmonics. If you're sitting so close to an emission, that computer would pick up a harmonic and think the harmonic was the fundamental frequency, and it's not. The computer didn't know. The computer's only as good as it was programmed. So again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to trust that. There's some stuff you trust, and if it's a quick scan, okay, yep, things look good out there. There's no real threats out there, but here's a target of interest. Let's really analyze this. Nah, I don't think that this is, you know, this is what the computer says it is. So that's a pulse repetition frequency, pulse repetition interval. The pulse width is the length of the pulse. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this pulse width measurement, we're going to establish where zero percentile is. Okay, so this is my, my zero percentile. That's actually kind of low, but that's the artist. It's not the wave. Okay, so this is zero percent. Okay, and we're going to establish 100% right up here. So halfway between 0 and 100 is going to be 50%. So at 50%, right at this point here, 50%, I'm going to take this measurement here, and I'm going to take this measurement here. And what this is going to be equal to, this amount of time is going to be my pulse width. My pulse width measurement. So we're always going to take that at the 50% point. Now there's another number that's important for us to analyze when we're analyzing waveforms and it's called duty cycle. Duty cycle is really easy. It's going to be the pulse width over the pulse repetition interval. the pulse width over the pulse repetition interval. And what that duty cycle is, is physically how long is this transmitting out? How long is that pulse actually doing something? As compared to how much time is the rest of the circuit at rest? So just by taking a look at this, Let's kind of eyeball this. Again, this is an artist, a crude artist depiction. But let's just say, for example, here that, okay, that's about uh, 19 inches, 20 inches. And then let's compare that now 
to the amount of pulse repetition interval. It is one, two, let's roughly call it three. No, three times 20, so 60, 20 divided by 60. I was using that just as a reference. So basically, this, what would the duty cycle of this be approximately? If it's on for 20 inches and the total cycle is 60 inches, one third, very good. So this would have a duty cycle of approximately 33%, 33 and a third percent. For some circuits like radar, it's critical. It's critical because what the radar system is doing is here, well, there's, two, there's, a, there's a bunch of things happening with the radar signal. Number one, here you're listening for that return, okay, because you're actually spitting out a pulse, and then you're listening for the return, how long it takes to get back. So actually, this, would, this is not a very good, well-designed radar. Okay, the signal's not going to get very far before you're expecting it to get back. But the other thing is, this is when it's building up that pulse, and then here it's spitting the pulse out. So you could tell so much about a radar, which again is exactly what I used to do in the Navy. By me looking at this, I could tell you what the radar would be used for. So we'd go places that we weren't supposed to be to basically look at what the Russians were doing. And then we'd pick something like this up, and then I'd have to analyze this and say, you know, this is a short-range radar. This is a short-range radar. And there was some other math I'm not going to bore you with, but we could actually execute. It was one of the fun, I actually taught this for the Navy. It was called an operations employment course. And basically what it was is when World War III starts, it's going to totally change the game plan. And if you encounter something that hasn't been created yet or that we didn't know about, how can you analyze it and make sense from an intelligence standpoint of what this is? So if this was a real radar, this would be a very short-range short range radar. It'd be a very powerful short-range radar. This might be for something like navigating in a river or tight in area. But this doesn't give enough time for you to spit the pulse out and then listen to the return. Because it's, you know, it's got to travel at the speed of light to the target and then all the way back. So this wouldn't be a radar that's designed to, to look at something 400 miles away. This would not be a radar that's going to detect a missile launch or something like that. This is something close in, navigation radar. So by looking at this stuff, you could tell what it's kind of used for. Make sense? And I'm not just talking about military radar here, so don't think, well, yeah, I'm not going to go into the military, I'm not going to use it. It's the same thing, whether it's sonar, whether it's a fish, fish finder, whether it's a depth sounder underneath a, 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 a ship, whether you go to work for the Federal Aviation Administration, and this is a radar system used for tracking aircraft landing at Seattle. The fundamentals of the electronic waveforms all remain the same, and that's what we're here to study. So that's our duty cycle. Pulse width, duty cycle, pulse repetition interval, pulse repetition frequency. The rise time is the next thing we're going to take a look at. The rise time is something that we determine from the 10% point to the 90% point. Basically what we do is we discount the first 10% of rise and we discount the last 10% of rise. So we're only paying attention to basically 10% to 90%. And what we'll do is we'll take a look at that reference in time, that reference in time, and I'm going to call this my RT or rise time. And that's going to be in fractions of a second, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, whatever. Fall time, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take a look at the 10% point. Remember, this was 0. This is 10. This is 100. This here is going to be 90. And this here is 10. So I'm going to take a look at this. Take a look at this. This distance between here, the fall, 90%, to 10% is going to be my FT or fall time. Now just taking a look at this, that's my fall time, that's my rise time. We see that my rise time is significantly shorter than my fall time. 
And I drew it like that intentionally. I don't know why, but I drew it like that intentionally because I did the same thing. I tried to mimic that over here. Actually, this is a little bit steeper. But, eh, yeah, this would be a little bit. But I was trying to accentuate that because sometimes there's idiosyncrasies in the circuits that call to cause this from happening. Sometimes your rise time as you're building up the pulse may take longer. Then the pulse gets spit out and then it drops faster. I mean, it's idiosyncrasy of the circuits. The bottom line, the reason we're sharing this with you today is that you've got to be able to articulate that. You've got to be able to measure that on your equipment. You have to know what it looks like beforehand and then you have to be able to, when you're troubleshooting the equipment, is this a problem or not? You know what this also could look like? This could look like a pulse width of a, of a waveform being sent to a fuel injector to squirt gasoline into a cylinder. It could be the exact same thing. It's all done with pulses. It's actually, that would look pretty good for an automotive application going to a fuel injector. By playing with that pulse width, that's how much gas you're squirting in to your intake. Rise time, fall time. Some of the other stuff we're looking at here, overshoot occurs when the leading edge of a waveform exceeds its normal maximum value. So you see how this is like my zero reference line right here? This right here is going to be overshoot. It should have just gone right up. I mean, ideally, we wanted this waveform to look like I'm sure that's what the engineer wanted this to look like, but how much money are they going to throw at the problem? So instead they came up with this. Well, you know, some overshoot here. Is it worth cleaning up? How much money do you want to spend on the circuitry to get rid of this overshoot? What quality components do you want to buy to get rid of this overshoot? Undershoot occurs for the same reason. This is, would be the undershoot right down here. The target was 0%. We want that to come right down and then, boom, crisply, crisply stay off. Instead, we overshot that. Went a little bit negative. Both undershoot and overshoot conditions are followed by damped oscillations known as ringing. This is the ringing. Overshoot overshoot and it dampens out. Basically those are caused by imperfections and components in the circuit design. The bottom line, how much money do you want to spend getting rid of this stuff? Engineers have to look at that. Anybody in here want to be an engineer? There's nothing wrong with it. You got to know what you're getting yourself into though. Because engineers are given a budget. And they say, you've got to make this circuit, and it can only cost this much. It can only be this big, and it can only cost this much. It's not, we want you to go out and design the best possible circuit to do this. It's like, you've got to develop a circuit that could do this, but it can only cost this much money. So engineers have to constantly compromise. Constantly. And because they compromise, this is what we're left with. Circuits that have outputs that look like this stuff. You've got to be able to recognize it. So all of this can be analyzed on the oscilloscope. Wave shaping circuits also include uh, an RC network. could change the shape of a complex waveform. A differentiator. Differen differentiator is used to produce a PIP or peaked waveform from square or rectangular waveforms. Okay, let me show you an easy way of remembering these. Everybody got this on the board? thing to remember about my lectures is this, this is what I lecture on is not nice to know information. 
What I lecture on is need to know information. This is the kind of stuff that you're going to get on a job interview. They're going to sit you down and they're going to show you a waveform like I just showed you and they're going to say, what's the rise time? What's the fall time? What's the pulse width? I mean, these are like no-brainer questions that if you can't answer, you're going to hire somebody that can't answer those questions. Okay? The same thing goes with differentiator and integrator. If I had a quarter for every time I was asked about an integrator and a differentiator on a professional exam, um, I'd have enough for one of those gourmet cheeseburgers probably and a gallon of gasoline in today's economy. Okay? But I've been asked that a lot of times. The thing to remember about an integrator and a differentiator, real simple. Both are made out of an RC, a series RC circuit. Okay? Here's my RC circuit, right? Okay. Now, I have two different combinations that I could take outputs. I could take an output, actually three. I could take an output across both of these. I could take an output across my resistor, or I could take an output across my capacitor, right? So here, terminal A, terminal B, terminal C. If I monitor take an output across A and B, I'm taking the output across the parallel resistor. If I take an output across B and C, I'm taking the output across the parallel, the voltage across the parallel capacitor. Make sense? Okay. Now, let's take a closer look at what we're putting into the circuit. We're putting a square wave into the circuit. Let me draw a larger version of the square wave. Does everybody agree that that's square wave? A good likeness of a square wave? How do I know it's a square wave? 50% on, 50% off. I hired Peter Welty. I actually asked him that in a job interview. I had a little circuit spitting out a square wave. I knew it was a square wave. So I gave him a scope meter, a fluke scope meter, and I said, what's coming out of test point 22? He set it all up, performed it, untangled the cords. I tangle them all up in the interviews when people get flustered, have to untangle it all. Fires the thing up, he gets a test probe. It's a square wave. And I asked him, what's the duty cycle of that square wave? And he kind of looks up like, duh, 50%. And I knew I had found my man. <laughs> Okay, because I had PhDs in here that were like, you know, what's a square wave? You know, and they're just in their classes. Well, I got to calculate it out. If it's a square wave, it's 50%. If it's less than 50%, it's a pulse wave. If it's greater than 50%, it's a rectangular wave. Make sense? So, we're applying a square wave to this circuit. What am I going to get across the capacitor? What's the output across the capacitor going to look like? One of the reasons I drew it on the whiteboard is so we could take a look at that, right? When the square wave, I go from zero to 100% instantaneously, do I not? What's the capacitor going to do when I go from zero to 100 instantly? going to slow it down. But what's it, well, what's the capacitor going to do in this amount of time right here? Charge. 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 So if I took an output across the capacitor between time 0 and time 1, what would it look like? It would look like a capacitive time constant, would it not? So it would look like that. Do you agree? If the voltage across the capacitor looks like this, what's the voltage across the resistor going to look like? Well, first of all, what kind of a circuit is this? The first thing you should always say is identify the type of circuit. Is this a series circuit or parallel? It's a series circuit. It's a series RC circuit. So if the voltage across the capacitor, and also I'll give you a hint here, a series circuit is also known as a voltage divider. So if the voltage is going from 0 to 100 over time, what's the voltage across the capacitor going to be doing? 
This is not a trick question, folks. It's going to be going from zero to 100%, and then it's going to be going down like this. Because as the capacitor is charging to 100%, the voltage across the resistor was going from 100%, now it's going to 0%. Because remember, if I have 100% here, I've got 0% here. If I've got 0% here, I have 100% here. If I've got 50% of the voltage here, I got 50% of the voltage here, which would be like right about here or here. Does that make sense? Shouldn't be any mystery with this. This is the same stuff we've been talking about. So, from one to point number two, what happens at my square wave? It goes from 100% to zero. And then it holds, what, what condition is this? Basically off between two, time two and time three. So what's the capacitor going to do? It's going to discharge, and it's going to look like a capacitive discharge. When it discharges, where is it going to discharge into? It's going to discharge through the resistor, the only other component in the circuit. So it's going to create pow, a negative voltage, opposite of the force that originally created it, and then that voltage is basically going to go to zero. Make sense? The next square wave pulse comes in, pow, voltage shoots up, a little bit high, a little bit excited there, right? And it's going to come down. The capacitor is going to charge. Square wave is going to shut off. The capacitor is going to discharge. When it discharges, it's going to discharge in the opposite direction and eventually go to zero. And that process is just going to continue to repeat itself. When we take the output across our resistor, across our parallel resistor, it's a series circuit, but I'm, I'm taking the output in parallel. I'm attaching my load in parallel with that resistor so that I could get the benefits of being connected in parallel. The same voltage that's developed across this resistor I will feel in parallel with it. Make sense? Be careful with that wording. Am I overemphasizing it? Yes. Why? Because people miss this on a freaking quiz. They miss it on the exam. They miss it in the lab. They miss it when they go out into industry. It's a series circuit, but you're connecting the output in parallel with that resistor. So you get the same voltage across it. When we do that, this is called a differentiator. And I always remember differentiator like in cursive D, I, F. F, see the FF, those sharp points? That kind of looks like FF, the top of my FF. It works for me. If a differentiator has the sharp pointed outputs or the PIP outputs, as it says in the book, the integrator will be connected to the parallel capacitor. And these look more like I don't know, waves in the ocean? I guess if it's a tsunami coming at you or something. But these look more like ocean waves. These are sharp, sharp points. So to get an output across your integrator, we connect across our parallel capacitor. An integrator is uh, used in wave shaping of radio, television, radar and computers. Basically what we're doing is using the integrator and differentiator to change the makeup, change the pulses, change the output to something that we want. Wave shaping circuits. Does that make sense? If you get screwed up on your quiz, and you will, if you get screwed up on your exam, and you will, if you get screwed up on a job interview, draw this down on scratch paper. It's a series RC circuit. How is it going to behave? When I slam this with a square wave that basically is DC voltage off, 100%, hold on, off, how's it going to work? 
it's going to charge a capacitor up, but it's going to take time to charge a capacitor up. As the capacitor is charging, the voltage across the resistor is decreasing. Pretty basic, I think, but I've been doing this a while. But don't let me twist you up. Be able to answer these questions. A clipping or limiter circuit can be used to square off the peaks of, of an applied signal. They can obtain a rectangular waveform from a sine wave signal. So basically, if you've got a sine wave and you just clip the top of that off, you're basically, boom, like slicing the top of it off. It's kind of going to look like a square wave. Also can eliminate positive or negative portions of a waveform. A limiter circuit can also keep an input amplitude at a constant level. This is very important in broadcasting. Very important in broadcasting. Um, AM radio, AM stands for amplitude modulation. So basically, if you start increasing the amplitude beyond the specifications, you're going to transmit out more power. So back in the day, Dave Niehaus, who's uh, you know passed away, of course, this past year, when he was calling a Mariners game, you know, somebody knocks it out of the park and get out the right bread and salami and he's yelling into the microphone. If they didn't have a limiter circuit, that transmitter, Cairo or Como or whoever was broadcasting the game, would physically transmit out more power than they were licensed by the FCC. So radio stations have these limiter circuits to keep that amplitude constant so they don't broadcast out more power. In FM radio is frequency modulation. If you go over that modulation limit, you're going to alter that frequency beyond the specifications of what the FCC limits you. So these limiter circuits are very, very critical to get the right output levels so that the transmitter transmits the right amount of energy. And it's not just in commercial broadcasting. For a radar system, the same thing. A sonar system, the same thing. A police radar gun, the same thing. It's going to have to have some limiter circuits in there to prevent too much energy from coming out so that it knows how much to expect to come back. You just can't transmit out. Your cell phone has limiter circuits associated with it. Actually, in your cell phone, the circuits are pretty much dynamic. It's listening to the tower. It knows how far you are. If any of you have ever gone out in the woods or anything you know, away from uh, urban areas, sometimes your cell phone will do everything it can to stay connected to the cellular network. And if you're on the fringes, it's going to work harder and drain your battery faster. But it's going to stay connected. If you're parked right next to a cell tower, it's going to broadcast only the amount of power that it needs to stay connected. No more. So your batteries will last longer. Cell phones do it a little bit different, but you understand the concept of limiting. Clamping circuit can be used to clamp the top or bottom of a waveform to a given DC voltage. It's commonly used in radar, television, telecommunications, computers. As you know from our studies, we use DC to bias solid state components. That means the voltage that establishes an operating point to turn a semiconductor device on, right? But the signal, which represents the intelligence, the audio, the video, the whatever, we need to put that on the DC level. So what we're going to do is clamp that to AC signal to a DC level. That's what clamping means. Special purpose circuits include a monostable multivibrator has only one stable state. That's why it's called a monostable. Mono meaning one, stable state. It produces one output pulse for each input pulse. A bistable multivibrator has two stable states, and they're called flip-flops. And we're going to talk more about these bistable multivibrators in the future because they are the fundamental building block of digital circuits. Because in digital, as you'll soon find out in our next lecture, we deal with two stable states, on and off. 
All the Magic in Digital is brought to you by two stable states. In summary, waveforms can be changed from one shape to another using various electronic circuits. The frequency domain concept holds that all periodic waveforms are made of sine waves. Periodic waveforms have the same wave shape in all cycles. Sine waves are the only waveform that cannot be distorted by RC, RL, or LC circuits. According to the frequency domain concept, waveforms consist of the fundamental frequency plus combinations of even or odd harmonics or both. A square wave consists of the fundamental plus an infinite number of odd harmonics. Sawtooth waveform consists of the fundamental frequency plus even and odd harmonics crossing the zero reference line 180 degrees out of phase of the fundamental. Periodic waveforms are measured from any point of the cycle to the same point on the next cycle. Pulse width is the length of the pulse measured at the 50% point. Duty cycle is the ratio of pulse width to period. Rise time of a pulse is the time it takes to rise from 10% to 90% of its maximum amplitude. Fall time is between 90% and 10%. Overshoot, undershoot, and ringing are undesirable in a circuit and exist because of imperfect circuits. An RC circuit can be used to change the shape of a complex waveform. If the output is taken across the resistor in an RC circuit, the circuit's called a differentiator. If the output's taken across the capacitor, it's called an integrator. Clipping circuits are used to square off the peaks of an applied signal or to keep an amplitude constant. Clamping circuits are used to clamp the top or bottom of a waveform to a DC voltage. In a monostable multivibrator, one shot produces one output pulse for each input pulse. Bistable multivibrators have two stable states. And we also have what's known as a Schmidt trigger. It's a special purpose bistable multivibrator that's used for cleaning up wave patterns. It's one of the things, too, on, on clipping and limiting. Do you ever notice when you listen to an AM radio station, specifically AM radio stations, doesn't everybody like on Cairo kind of sound the same? Doesn't everybody on KVI kind of sound the same? Como, don't they all kind of sound the same? That's really a function of the electronics that they're using. It's a function of the microphones that they use, the studios that they use, the clipping circuits that they use, the limiting circuits that they use. Some, some radio stations um, in the past have even used a little bit of reverb that they feed everything through and then they transmit that so that all kind of has a unique sound to it. I don't know if you know this about me, but before one of my first jobs, I worked in radio. I worked in AM radio in a, at a radio station in Connecticut. And actually, I found some old air checks of myself, recordings. You'd never know it was me. I mean, I sounded good. I sounded really good because you're, you're speaking into a high compression microphone and you're getting run through that electronics. And it used to be fun. You put the headset on, and next thing you know, you've got the magic voice. You know, and it was no magic voice, it was just the electronics that your voice was being run through. Same thing actually happens in the recording industry. Different studios have different idiosyncrasies because of the electronics. Some of the purists out there, the audiophiles that go out there, you know, if you, you're a big, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin fan and, and, you know, there's a specific album that really rocks your world. You know, some of the purists go out there and they know what studio this was mixed at. And they know what monitors were used in the studios in the mixing process. So if you ever want to listen to that music as it was originally intended, you need to be listening out of the same electronics and the same speakers that it was originally mixed down at. If you're listening to it on a headset, it's not going to be the same experience. If you're listening on a set of Radio Shack speakers, it's not going to be the same experience. So the same thing is, uh, like I say, with radio. Everything, every station is going to end up with its unique idiosyncrasies. And quite frankly, back in the day, radio has really changed. Now, you know, it's 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 a whole different ball of, ball of wax than it used to be. Um, it used to be highly competitive. A lot of these radio stations used to go after a unique sound, unique sound, so that people would you know get used to that and tune into that. And now everybody's like, what is it? 
what's the online? You listen on your on your smartphone. Yeah, Pandora. Yeah, your Pandora. You know, people people aren't even subscribing to satellite or any to satellite radio anymore. They're doing Pandora on their phone and plugging that into their audio system. Me, I'm a satellite guy. Any questions on anything we covered in wave shaping? Okay, let's go ahead and take about a 12-minute uh, break at 25 after 5. We're going to start up with d d d d digital. Yep, Section 5, Digital Electronic Circuits. Chapter 32, Binary Number System. After completing this chapter, you, the student, are going to be able to describe the binary number system, identify the place value for each bit in a binary number, convert binary numbers to decimal numbers, convert decimal numbers to binary numbers, convert decimal numbers to 8421 BCD code, and convert 8421 BCD code numbers to decimal numbers. First things first, Why binary? In an attempt to use circuits to solve complex problems, what they wanted to do is simplify the circuitry. And in simplifying the circuitry, they wanted to basically break everything down into two different conditions or two different states. And that's a state of either being on or a state of being off. A state of either being a one or a state of being a zero. And the early advancement of digital technology was to perform repetitive functions accurately over and over and over again. And this is really how digital was developed, and this is why the binary number system was initially used. And the binary number system, binary communication, really still is a strong form of communication outside of digital electronics. I mean, if you are going down a hill, down the bottom of the hill here, and you see a red light that is flashing on and off, on and off, on and off, what does that tell you? you all have your driver's licenses? If you have a red light that's pulsating on and off, what does that tell you? Stop. If it's a yellow light and it's pulsating on and off, what does it tell you? If it's a constant yellow light, what does that tell you? The caution. Proceed, proceed with caution. So, you know, a construction zone, you know, to grab your attention. So we use binary form of communication. What is it, the midnight Paul, right of Paul Revere there? Remember, one if, if by land, two if by sea? So the form of binary communication. You know, so binary, in binary you can communicate some very simple things. If you use a lot of binary, a lot of ones and zeros, you can transmit some really complex things. And that's exactly how the computer that I'm using tonight to put on this presentation works. You've got trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of ones and zeros that just make up the ability to put on this PowerPoint presentation. But the one thing you have to understand is that all digital electronics boil back down to binary. So that's where we're starting tonight. You have to understand binary before you can understand the more complex digital systems. Binary numbers, a binary system is a base two system. So it's got two different states, either on or off. It contains two digits, and those two digits are either a zero or a one. The position of the zero or the one in the number indicates its value within the number. The place value of the digits in a binary number increase by powers of two. So you've got ones, twos, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. Does that make sense? All based on powers of two. Our existing numbering system, base 10, is increases by powers of 10. Your ones column, tens, 
hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands. Does that make sense? The table here shows us the binary number system. Of course, the number decimal number zero equals zero, 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 zero. Let's focus our attention here to our least significant digit. Our least significant digit. The number of combinations that that least significant digit could possibly be are two different conditions. It could either be a zero or it could be a one. This is a zero, which signifies the number is zero. This signifies the number is one, which correlates to the decimal number one. When I move, when I increment my value here to one zero, this was one in the twos column, zero in the ones column. Two plus zero is equal to the number two. One in the twos column and one in the ones column is two plus one is equal to three. Let's go down here to a number that's a little bit more complex. One zero zero one one. I have one in the sixteens column. Sixteen plus one in the twos column. Sixteen plus two is eighteen. Plus one in the ones column makes the number nineteen. One zero zero one one is equal to the number nineteen decimal. Does that make sense to you? And, this, and then this number just keeps going and going. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Me rattling off those numbers, do any of those numbers sound kind of familiar to any of you? Where have you heard those numbers before? Yeah. Absolutely. Anything to do with memory, anything to do with computers, anything to do with computer digital configurations, they're all based on that because computers are all binary. And it's exactly how the progression developed. I remember the original Sound Blaster board back in the early 1990s was an 8-bit board. And then they went to a 16-bit board. You went from 8 to 16, from 16 to 34, to 62. 64. I say 62, 64. 128. These were all standard binary progressions. That's because that's how the machines, that's the what drives the architecture of the machines. Make sense? Any questions on this? One of the big codes, there's a number of different codes that you're going to learn about later on when you get to Peter's class, and Peter's going to really hit you a lot more with digital. This, again, is designed to be an introductory class. One of the very, very important codes that we use is called the BCD code. BCD. BCD stands for Binary Coded Decimal. Binary Coded Decimal. This is taking a decimal number and coding it with a binary number. Binary coded decimal. What is the highest number that you could count to in decimal with one's place? Nine. Very good. So the highest number that DCD will go to is the number nine. So you will not have 10, you will not have 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 22, 48, 73. The highest number you will ever have in BCD is the number 9, because that's the highest tens place number that we count to. Once we get to 9, what happens? And when we're counting up, we go to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then what do we do? The number 10 is actually us incrementing 1 to the 10th place and 0 in the 1's place. What's the number 11? 1 in the 10th place, 1 in the 1's place. 10 plus 1 is equal to 11. Does that make sense? 
that's how we count. You probably have never really thought about it before if you haven't studied digital, but that's how we count. Okay? So the VCD code is also known as 8421 code. It's a binary coded decimal, BCD, and it consists of four binary digits. Those four binary digits are the 8th place, the 4th place, the 2th place, and the 1th place. So the 8421 designation refers to the binary rate of weight, weight of the four bits. 8421. If I actually used, and I put a 1 here, a 1 here, a 1 here, and a 1 here, so if I gave you the binary value of 1111, what would that number equal in decimal? 15. Will you ever see BCD code that represents the number 15? What about the number 14? What about 13? 12? 11? What about 10? BCD code 10? What about BCD code 9? Yeah. So let me actually go back a couple slides here, okay? This here could either be considered, what we're looking at here in this entire table is what we call straight binary. This is straight binary. It's just a binary progression. We can keep counting here by just keep adding places. Are you with me? But these numbers here, all the way through this number here, 1001 is the highest value BCD code that you will ever see. Because as soon as we go from 1001 and we increment that one more, it's now the number 10. And the 10 is actually 0 in the 1's place, 1 in the 10's place. It's not, it's not pure BCD. So in actuality, if I wanted to represent the number 10 in BCD, does anybody have any ideas how I might do that? How many bits would it actually take for me to represent the number 10 in BCD? It would take eight binary numbers for me to give the number 10. And what would those numbers be? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. What would they be? 0, 0, 0, 1. So BCD, this here, is equal to, in decimal, zero. This number here, in decimal, is equal to one. So it would actually take us eight bits. two groups of BCDs to get to the number 10. Is everybody with me with that? Make sense? Okay. In summary, the binary number system is the simplest number system. It contains two digits, 0 and 1, used to represent data for digital and computer systems. Binary data, represented by binary digits called bits, a bit is derived from the term binary digit, bit, B-I-T, binary digit. The place value of each higher digit position in the binary number system is increased by powers of 2. The largest number that can be represented by a given number of places is base 2, 2 to the nth power minus 1, where n represents the number of bits. The value of a binary digit can be determined by adding the product of each digit and its place value. Fractional numbers are represented by negative powers of 2. To convert from a decimal number to a binary number, we divide the decimal number by 2. Writing down the remainder after each division, the remainder is taken in reverse order form the binary number. So this is how we're going to add in binary. Okay, your book is loaded with examples. 
8421 code is a binary coded decimal code used to represent the digits 0 through 9. The advantage of the BCD code is ease of converting between decimal and binary forms of a number. Why are we so hung up on BCD code? And what kind of number system do we rely on? Decimal. Everything we do, this, this is the amazing thing about it. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go off on a tangent here or anything, but, you know, I, I do a lot of travel. I've been to a lot of different countries. They speak a lot of different languages. They have a lot of different customs. But you know what? Wherever I've gone in the world, guess what? They use base 10. Maybe it has something to do with us having 10 toes and fingers. I suspect that that's probably the origin of it, you know, counting on your fingers and counting on your toes. But we all use universally a base 10 numbering system, even though our languages are so different. So the computer interface, interfacing man with the machine, we've got to use this BCD code. Even your digital alarm clock, when you set your alarm clock, it gets, gets you up to 7.30 in the morning, right? That's 0730. It's a decimal number that you're programming your clock to go at, off at. But it's really ones and zeros that are doing the work inside the clock. Does that make sense? Okay. One of the things that I want to show you now, let me get out of this PowerPoint presentation. By the way, all of your tests, all of your quizzes and your final exam, are going to, we're going to allow you to use the computer for all of these 120 quizzes and exams that you have left, with the exception of one. And I'll show, share that one with you in a minute. All the rest are open computer. When I say open computer, that doesn't mean research your answers on Google. Okay, it does mean that you could use the computer as a tool. Peter and I both want you to use the computer as a tool to solve these problems. I want you to do your homework longhand so you understand the process, but I want you to double check it with the computer so you see the capabilities of the computer. One of the things that's part of Windows, actually a lot of you may have this feature built into your scientific calculator, but even if you have it built into your scientific calculator, it's not as powerful as the tool that is built into Windows. Go to Start, Programs, Accessories, and go to the standard calculator that's available to you. Okay? If you open the calculator up and it looks like this, you've got to go to View and change it to Scientific. Okay? And this here is an incredible calculator for doing your digital homework on because let me show you something real quick. I could go into the decimal mode, which is what you normally want to do for addition and subtraction and balancing your checkbook. We could also put it in the binary mode. As soon as I went to the binary mode, look at my only keys that are active now are the one and the zero. All the other numbers are gone because they don't even have significance anymore. They don't even exist in the calculator. But one of, one of the things that I want to show you here is the number of places that we could put into this calculator. Okay? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go, this is the number zero. Do you all agree that this is the number zero and the decimal equivalent is the number zero? Okay? This is the number one. If I add another digit, what number am I looking at in binary right here? Three, very good. Two in the twos column, one in the ones column. Two plus one is three. How many of you say the answer is three? But let me go right over here to decimal. I'll, con I'll convert it into decimal. One, one in binary is equal to the number three in decimal. Okay? I can actually work this backwards, too. If I want to know what is the number 57 equal to in binary, I plug in the decimal number and I go to binary. 111001 is the binary equivalent of the number 57. You with me? Mm -hmm. It's not going to, you're going to have to convert those manually. That is the one thing that this won't do. But you know what? You're, you're, you're not going to see that a whole lot in the real world. So. Just do it manually for your homework purposes. I'm not even going to go out of my way to ask you to do that on a quiz. 
I mean, I might give you one question or something like that, but I'm not going to go out of my way to ask you on a quiz or the final how to, how to do that manually. This is the big thing I want you to all be able to do is convert a decimal number into a binary number back and forth. But let me show you what's so cool about this calculator as opposed to your own scientific calculator, right? Let me clear this all out, and let me start showing you the number of digits that we could plug in here, okay? One, two, three, four. This is a four-bit system. Five, six, seven, eight. This is an eight-bit system. Do you all remember the old 8-bit sound blaster board from the early 1990s, right, your 486 computer? The decimal equivalent of that was 255 plus 1, because 0 is another condition, isn't it? We don't use 0. I mean, you and I, when we count, we don't say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's not how we count, but that is how machines count. So 255 plus 1 gives us 256. That 8-bit sound blaster board was capable of rendering 256 different tones. And that's what made it possible for speech patterns, recognizing speech patterns, playing music, MIDI, 256 is it's pretty stout. That's a lot of different combinations. Okay? Let me convert that back to binary. So this is 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64. 64. This is 64-bit processing here. This is pretty substantial. You know how many decimal combinations there are of 64-bit? It's a big number. That's a big number. John, I know you play around with the video and the kind of stuff and the PowerPoint and the uh, the, the, the paint, uh, what do you call it there? Uh, the, 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 what, what typical is, is, how many bits are there in a, in a high-resolution digital photograph? Let's go with 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 4,095, 4,095 different combinations, okay? I know for, like, digital photography, still photography, 24-bit is, is capable. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. You got a high-end digital SLR. This is what it's capable of: 24-bit color processing. That's how many different colors you could get. I thought I had, like, you know, with the Crayola crayons, uh, how many were in that big, the big freaking box? I thought that was a lot of colors. But no, this is how many colors are capable. Differences in each pixel. It's pretty substantial. One of the other things that I want to show you, although it's not part of this chapter per se, I do feel compelled that you need to understand this, is how many bits are there, how many bits capable are, we, are there with BCD? How many, how many binary bits do we use for BCD? It's not a trick question. Four. Okay? One, two, three, four. How many combinations do we have possible to us using four bits? Fifteen plus the one is sixteen different combinations. You with me? Okay? So, if we're using the four bits of BCD to communicate to us the decimal equivalent, how many places are we wasting? How many places are we not using? 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Basically seven combinations that we're not even using, but we're capable of. That's an incredible waste of computing horsepower, an incredible waste of digital horsepower. So, what the engineers came up with is a different numbering system that allows us to use four bits to rep rep represent the 16 different combinations. Does anybody know what that form of code is called? Hexadecimal. Very good. Okay. Check this out. This is wild. Let's go back to binary here. Okay. One. Actually, I'll, I'll go to hex. I'll go to hex. And we'll start counting. One plus one equals two. Plus one equals I'm counting up in hexadecimal. What comes after the number two? Three. Plus one equals four. Plus one equals, what did I do? I did something wrong. Plus one, three, oops, I know what I did. Plus one, two, plus one, four, plus one, four, plus one, five, plus one, six, Plus one, seven, plus one, eight, plus one, nine. What number comes after the number nine in decimal? Ten. We can't do ten because that ten is one in the tenth place and a zero in the ones place. Anybody have any idea what the next digit, the value is going to come after the number nine? Has nothing to do with numbers. Has everything to do with the alphabet. <laughs> exactly. So after the number nine comes the number A. <laughs> plus one equals A. Plus one equals B. Plus one equals C. Plus one equals D. Plus one equals E. Plus one equals F. And F right now, hexadecimal, is equal to the binary value. One, 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 one. This is the maximum value that you could count to in hexadecimal before you increment to the next place. So hexadecimal has 16 different possible combinations. BCD only had 10 different combinations, 0 through 9. Hexadecimal, 16. Does that make sense? Let me go back to hex. There's F. Now, when I add 1 to F, what's going to happen in hexadecimal? What value is going to come after F? And don't say G. That's not the answer. If I have the, the, the value F, what's going to come after F if I increment my count here by 1? If I add 1 to F, what number comes next in hexadecimal? 1, would be 1 to 8? Close. Kind of. Not even close. You're so far off. I like the one part. The use use car dealership, A1 Autos. Think about it. When you get to the number nine and then you count to the number ten, what happens? Zero through nine, the ones goes back to zero, and you do what? You increment your count. So if I'm at the maximum value that I could count to here in my first column, what's my next value going to be? Zero. And then what's going to happen in my one zero? Very good. Plus one equals one zero. Now at the number ten, and this is where you've got to be careful, and this is where Peter and I are going to bust you guys. What's the number? Ten. What's the number? No, it's not ten. This is one zero in hex. One zero in hex is different than the number 10. You say the number's 10, I assume you're talking a decimal value. If you actually saw this number, one zero, I could even think what? I could think that this is a binary value. 
I could think this is the binary number two. I could think that this is the decimal number ten, or I could think that this is the hexadecimal value one zero. That's what I want you to get out of this chapter. You can't take anything for granted anymore. You've got to look at it and be able to quantify what the value is and the significance in the machine. Make sense? Every digital system, every digital system uses hex for programming, for packets of information. Uh, if you're familiar with direct TV, satellite TV, you know what they're doing? They are beaming down from their satellite packets of data, of digital data for every channel that they offer. Continuously. If you have a direct TV receiver and you've got your satellite dish pointed towards their satellite 33,000 miles out in space, you're listening to a stream of digital data, of packets of digital data that contain every channel they broadcast. And it's all getting into your box. What limits you from being able to watch all of those stations, and this includes pay-per-view, HBO East, HBO West, Showtime North, South, East, West, whatever, the Playboy Channel, and other channels we won't mention, right? All of those channels are coming into that dish in packets of data, and it's all in hexadecimal code. The only thing that precludes you from watching those channels is your receiver is not allowing you to tune to channel whatever that covers HBO. But the information is all inside your box. So all that you have to do, if you wanted to do this, and I don't encourage you to do this, it's not a good thing is if you could tell your receiver to decrypt those packets of information, basically you could watch and have access to every channel that's broadcast simultaneously. And this was one of the things that was going on a few years ago with, uh, if any of you heard, there was a, a lot of problems with access cards. There were a number of people that cracked the codes for unlocking the box. And once you unlock the box, all the channels are there. It's not like you go and got to go out of your way to scramble Showtime, and then you got to go out of your way to scramble HBO, and you got to go. All of that information is already in your box. You're just telling your box turn all the channels on. And and they had a lot of problems. This is actually one of the things that OJ was accused of doing. OJ got busted. He did. He got busted for it. Someday I'll tell you the story about someone else that got accused of harnessing this technology. It was not a pleasant experience getting served with papers. The United States of America versus Joseph Gregg. Uh, fortunately, I was able to get a good attorney and um, it all worked out okay. And I was not doing this illegally. I've been a paid subscriber from, for Direct TV consistently for the past, but I know how it's done. You know how I know it's done? I teach freaking electronics for a living. You know? And uh, <laughs> what are they going to beam from the satellite? Packets of information. What's the typical protocol? Hexadecimal. I mean, it's not like they're doing anything crazy. Digital systems are all built on this progression. That's the power of this lecture. It's the power of this lecture. If you understand what we're talking about here, this is the language machines communicate in. We're not going to pull any surprises on you. One last thing that I want to point out, again, it's not in your book, 
You see, we got binary, decimal, hexadecimal. There's another one in here called octal. Octal used to be my friend. Um, the first computer, I get emotional. <laughs> my very first computer. Okay, this next chapter here, chapter 34, Simplifying Logic Circuits. Again, this is going to be a chapter that I do not utilize the slides. Um, and I am going to show you a technique on simplifying logic circuits. I should have been recording that. So, where's the red button now? Control, toggle, record, pause with Alt P. Alt P. Uh, there you go. Okay. One of the things that I want to show you is um, Chapter 34, Simplifying Logic Circuits. Uh, I am not going to use these slides for this chapter, although I am going to show you how to simplify logic circuits and show you an approved method um, that I want you to utilize. In following the text, the text is going to show you Carnot mapping and Veach diagrams. And again, as an exercise at home for homework, I would like to see you try to simplify a logic circuit by utilizing that technique just so you're aware of it, again, for the job interview, when you go out and they say, can you, do you know what a Veach diagram is? Yes. 
Do you know what carnal, you know, do you have carnal knowledge? Yes, I do. Um, you know, this, this would all be a good thing. Um, but what I do want to show you is what I would expect one to use in industry, and that is a, uh, a simplification program. What I'm going to introduce to you is multi-sim. Um, on all of our computers here, we have a site license for multi-sim 9. That's like what's on my machine right here. So go ahead and launch that from the computer. How many of you in here are familiar with multi-sim, have done some playing around with multi-sim? Okay. Um, if not, you're going to have to spend some quality time with multi-sim. It's a very powerful program. Um, this is a very, very good program because you could si um, simulate the operation of basically analog or digital or hybrid circuits, combination of analog and, and digital circuits together. But the main thing that I want to show you here today are the different logic circuits that are available and how we could simplify those circuits. Now, up here in the upper left hand corner, you see we have place TTL and we have place CMOS. TTL stands for transistor transistor logic. A lot of these logic gates in the past were made out of nothing more than old school transistors shrunk into a package that's called integrating, integrated circuits, remember that chapter? And then we create logic gates. We also have CMOS. Do you remember what CMOS stands for? Very good, MOS, metal oxide semiconductor. It's CMOS is complementary metal oxide semiconductors. So basically everything that were the metal oxide semiconductors, these are the chips that you could fry through electrostatic discharge. TTL, we're not very prone to electrostatic discharge. CMOS is much higher efficiency, so TTL has all but been replaced in industry right now. As a matter of fact, for like our parts kits, we're having a hard time even sourcing parts in TTL because they're becoming quite rare. But anyway, we have the, the choice of, of both uh, right in here. So let me just select your TTL. And then we've got a variety of different families of TTL that are available. We've got the 74 STD, 74 S, 74 LS, 74 F, 74 ALS, 74 AS. Let's just go here with the 74 LS. And then look at all of the components that are available. Let me start on this here. Let me start up at the top. Can you all recognize that symbol, what that symbol is? It's a NAND gate. Very good. NAND gate. That's a NAND gate. What's that? NOR gate. NAND gate. Inverter. It's a NAND gate. It's a variety of flip-flops in here and, and other components that you could take Schmidt trigger. That's an exclusive OR gate. So it's got all these components. And you know what? It's, this is cheaper than going to the parts store because they're all available right here. Okay. So if I want to place this in my uh, circuit now, I just select this component and then I go OK. I'll select A there and then I'll place the component. And there's my component on my workspace. Now, the big device that I want to show you, what this is all about, is located over here on the right. Is this logic converter. So I select it, and then I drag it over here, and I place it. When I double click on it, left double click, it opens up the logic converter and I can actually see my inputs. I've got inputs A through H and then I have an output. So the way that this device is going to work is I could go ahead and connect my A input to my 
A input, my B input to my B input, and then my output into my logic converter output. Then all I have to do is select this top tab on my logic converter, which goes gate to truth table. Why doesn't it, this is not giving me the right answer. Why does it do that? Why does it do that? isn't it connecting? Sometimes the thing has a mind of its own. Oops. Maybe if I move it, it'll help. <laughs> it helped. <laughs> it helped. There it is. So you see how it gave me the correct answer? A zero and a zero gives me a zero. A, one, a zero and a one gives me a zero. Zero, a one and a zero give me a zero. And only a one and a one gives me a one. So it just gave me that equivalent. Now the nice thing is, once I have it in here, I could go truth table to Boolean expression by clicking this tab. So I'll click, I'll click on this tab and look at what it gives me down below in this queue. I know it's really small on the screen, but you see the A and B? I could also go truth table to simplified Boolean expression. Or I could go Boolean expression to truth table. I'll show you how to do that in a second. Or Boolean expression to logic gates. This is actually if I wanted to build something from a Boolean expression. And I could go Boolean expression to something made out of nothing more than NAND gates. So let me show you the real magic of this. Has anybody tried dabbling in this chapter yet? Homework? Be honest with me. No? You haven't gotten this far yet? Good. Good. This is the perfect time. This is the only time that I like to lecture before you try to do the homework. Okay? So I'm going to do here is I'm going to clear this out. Okay, Elena, in your text... In your text, let's look at one of these, uh, these difficult problems here. Let's look at page 333, and let's look at, um, let's go with C, at 34.1, questions 34.1, C. Okay, now I'm going to have you read that to me, and I'm going to enter that in the logic converter. But in order for us to get it right, you got to say it right. Because if you don't say it right, I ain't going to do it right. And then we're going to end up with goofy results. So let me clear this out of here. Okay. So I've, I've put my cursor now in that Boolean queue in the logic converter. Now I'm ready to go. Okay. So the way we would say that A and B not. So the B has a not after it. Okay, so the A and the B are not knotted together. It's the A and B not. Not A and B not. Okay, so I'll watch how I enter this. A and B, and then I use a hyphen here. That's the not symbol. Or hyphen, apostrophe. That's an apostrophe. Not a hyphen. It's an apostrophe. Apostrophe, excuse me. I don't even know my keys here. Apostrophe. Okay. Or, or A not. A apostrophe. And B and D. And B and D. So I've got let's let's just review this. A and B not or A not and B and D. Okay. Or, or
B naught and C naught and D. Or, or B naught and C naught. Or B naught and C naught. I'm sorry. Okay, so let's read through this again just to make sure this is, again, what is this, 34, 34, one C. 34, one C, okay. Let's, let's go with a read back here. A and B not, or A not and B and D, or B not and C not and D, or B not and C not, or A not B C and C and D. Do you concur? Okay, now comes the fun part. Once we have it in Boolean, like what I'm going to give you on the quiz, like your homework problem, now I could go Boolean expression to truth table. So first of all, before I click this, because I always want you to anticipate your results, I don't expect you to anticipate the answer, but I expect you to anticipate the results. How many inputs are we dealing with here? Four. So how many different combinations am I going to end up with? Sixteen. Okay, so it's going to be zero through fifteen. Does that make sense? So when I click that, I should see this whole queue here get lined up at least all the way through zero, one, five, all the way up to fifteen, because I'm dealing with a four input problem, Boolean problem. Make sense? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click that button and watch what happens. Pow, there's my truth table. It just built it for me. Once I have the truth table, I could go from the truth table now to the simplified Boolean expression. This is really what you're doing in carnal mapping, right? You're trying to go from a complex Boolean expression and simplify it to a simplified Boolean expression. Once I have that truth table, now I can click on this tab and it's going to simplify the Boolean expression for me. Okay, you ready? Three, two, one, click. There's the simplified Boolean expression. A naught and B and D or B and C naught or A and B naught. That's your answer. But for those of you at home, guess what? It gets even better. It gets even better. If you physically, ultimately, why you would do this is to build this circuit, to give you this logic condition. So if you wanted to build this circuit now, all that you would do is go from Boolean expression, simplified Boolean expression here, so it has the fewest number of parts, to logic gate. So when I click that tab, Failed to find a component in database. Uh-oh. That's not good. I don't know why it's coming up with that, or, um, with that uh, good grief. Something might be wrong with this database, might be corrupted, because there shouldn't be any, anything wacky out of this. Let me, just for giggles, let me close this all. Save this file? No. Okay. So let me try to reinitialize multi-sim. Are you ready to read that to me again? We'll do it real quick this time. Okay, we'll go to um, max time reached. Okay. Click done. Firefox No problem. Meanwhile, back at the farm. <laughs> yes. So, do you mind 
Do mind if we wait for this to finish exporting and then do a second part? Okay. Cool. So. It's not like I quit now, but they'd never see it work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I'm full of it. You could uh, give it a dry run while this is exporting. The multi sim. Knew that. See if it's going to work. Yeah. Logic converter, place, pow pow, Boolean expression. I'm sorry, A and B not. Okay, so I'll go Boolean to truth, truth to simplified, simplified to crap. How could this be, man? How can this be? Hmm. Let's try, okay, well, no, I don't want to try that. Um, what's corrupted in here? What is corrupt? So you're doing the... Uh, What's corrupt? Simplify to the thing. Try doing the uh, A, B thing straight. There's the... See? When you enter it in. Made it out of NAND gates. Try entering what? Try clearing clearing that out. Your uh, truth table's up there. And try doing the A, B to gates directly from when you input it. Yeah, uh, we could try that, but... Well, let's see. So I got to go... I'll just have to re-enter the whole thing. Caitlin's getting good at this. <laughs> I'm going to have it memorized. I'm going to have nightmares of this. A and B not. A and B not. Or. Or. Hold on. You have A. Oh! Ha-ha! <laughs> you caught me, B not. <laughs> or. Okay, let's try to go directly to this. No. Test point one failed to find a component in database. Good grief. Keep going and smiling, huh? You know, it's probably these cats downloaded some nonsense to this. I think you've created over here so it looks like your computer. Really? Oh yeah. But all of these, this is server based, so. Yeah, because this should be just. Uh, as you saw, I restarted this here. And it created yours a OK. Really, give me another one, Kaylin. Maybe something's goofy with that. Give me the one before it, the more complex one. I could do that. A and B and C and D. <laughs> Hold A and B not and C not. D. Or A not and B and C and D not. Or A not and B not and C not and D. Or A and B not and C not and D not. Or A not and B not and C and D. Or Are you making us up? <laughs> <laughs> A and B and C not and D not. Okay. Which 
Don't know. You got it to work on yours, so this must be a fault with something running on this computer. We could set up the same thing on this computer, the screen recorder thing, and still do the audio. Working could do that. that. Want to do it? Yeah, let's do it. Do you mind? Huh. <clears throat> okay, tonight our last three chapters on digital and our last three chapters in ELEC 120. So uh, tonight we're going to get her done as, uh, who is that dude? Uh, Larry, the cable guy. Larry the Cable Guy. Mildly entertaining until he ended up with his own show. And I'm like, unbelievable. The blind leading the blind. <laughs> I'd like to watch a show hosted by an astronaut, highly educated, the optimum peak physical mental performance. Instead, it's Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> Today, we're going to go out and get us some vittles. <laughs> Anyway, chapter 35, the continuation of digital. Tonight we're going to talk about sequential logic circuits. We talked about binary. We talked about digital. What is digital? One of two different states, stable states. We talked about the logic gates. Um, we talked about simplifying logic gates because um, what ultimately we're going to use logic gates for is solving repetitive problems solving repetitive problems and um, uh, evaluating those with a digital circuit. So these digital circuits were, were the first way of doing this with 100% performance on a, on a regular basis. So in simplifying the logic diagrams and using Boolean algebra, we're able to break down a complex scenario into a simple Boolean expression and find the s smallest number of components that'll do that job for us. And these are off-the-shelf digital items, digital logic circuits. Tonight, a little bit different, chapter 35 is going to be sequential logic circuits. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to describe the function of a flip-flop, identify the basic types of flip-flops, draw the symbols used to represent flip-flops, describe how flip-flops are used in digital circuits. I could do that right now. They're used quite well in digital circuits. You're going to be able to describe how a counter and a shift register operate. Identify the different types of counters and shift registers. Draw the symbols used to represent counters and shift registers and identify applications of counters and shift registers. Flip-flop. Sounds kind of goofy. Sounds kind of odd. Um, but a flip-flop is really a fundamental building block of a lot of complex digital architecture. It's a bistable multivibrator whose output is either a high or a low. That's, of course, going to equate to either a 1, which is a logic high, or a 0, which is a logic low. The RS flip-flop is the basic flip-flop. It has two outputs and two controlling inputs. The outputs are always opposite or complementary. This here is an example of a set reset flip-flop on the top that's made out of NOR gates. Remember the NOR gates? Okay. So the way that this works, I don't want you to necessarily, I mean, in your free time, feel free to sequence through ones and zeros. But I want you to more understand from a functional block what this thing is used for. It's real simple. We're either going to set this device or we're going to reset this device. That's why it's called a set reset flip-flop. So we're either going to hold a 1 right here or we're going to reset it back to a 0. So that's what this whole component is about. Holding either a, a, a state on or a state low. The way we're going to do it is if we want to set the flip-flop, we put in a 1 here, a 0 here. The 1 here is going to make this Q go high. The output here, Q0, is the complement of Q. So whatever this is, this is going to be the opposite. That's just how this thing's wired together. So if you want to set the flip-flop, you put a 1 in here. You get a 1 out here. If this is a 1, this is a 0. 
If you're setting the flip-flop, this reset better be zero. Because if you put a one into set and a one into reset, that's really a prohibitive state. Okay? You, you just wouldn't want to do that. And there's no way of predicting exactly what it's going to give you as an output because it's a prohibited state. It's a set, reset, flip-flop. That's like the key on your car. You know? I mean, you either want to start the car or shut the car off. You know, if you turn half the key one way and the other half, the, you're going to break the key. I mean, you're just being stupid. It's just, it's, what are you trying to do? He's trying to start the car or shut the car off. What are you trying to do? And it's really the same thing here. I'm trying to be a little bit silly about it, but it's just that reset flip-flop. You're either trying to set it or you're trying to reset it. So if you're both putting in two highs, with that being a prohibited state, it sounds like a programming error. Something is wrong with the circuitry because you'd never want to be setting it and resetting it simultaneously. Make sense? Now this down here is a set knot, reset knot flip-flop. And the way that this works is it does the exact same thing, but if you want to set it, you need to put in a logic low. By putting in a logic a low here, that's going to give you a Q out that's high and a Q not that's low. If you want to reset it, you've got to basically put in a logic low into the reset. So the only reason we have this negative level logic is for exactly that, negative level logic. Sometimes in a circuit the active signal is that transition from high to low. Here we would use that as a, as a set knot for a set knot flip-flop. So chances of you seeing a set knot, reset knot, or set reset flip-flop made out of NOR gates or NAND gates probably pretty remote unless you're working on some old legacy equipment. Um, I actually I know I'm dating myself but I saw this when they did this with transistors. You'd put a bunch of transistors together in a circuit simply to hold a high state or a low state. Last time I actually saw it with this with with gates was uh, probably 18 years ago. Students in here we had them working on a commercial fishing radar and um, w some of the circuitry was a set reset um, flip-flop and it was made out of simple um, uh, nor, uh, nor gates just like this and I don't think they ever got it working which is fine by me because I really didn't I wasn't comfortable with students working on our radar in the lab you know what's that smell what's for lunch it smells pretty good it's my arm <laughs> you know it's got to be careful when you work on microwaves this is more likely what you're going to see um, and this is a, a specific component that's designed to be the set, reset, flip-flop. This is going to come in a dual inline package like a logic gate. In multi-sim you could call these same devices up on, um, uh, for the components. And uh, this is the schematic diagram for a set, reset, flip-flop. And again, the way that it works, you put a high into set, you get Q out, that's a high. Q naught is the complement of Q. And you either want to set the flip-flop or reset the flip-flop. If you put both in as high, it's a prohibitive state. Down below is the next variation of the set-reset flip-flop. And it has the inclusion of this clock input, this fifth input, clock. And um, whenever I saw a clock, I think of a clock as like having hands on it, and it's like on a, on a wall clock what they're talking about here is actually like a rhythm. This is almost more like a drummer, percussionist than a band that sets the pace of the music, the beat of the music. This is basically setting the beat at how often it's going to be looking at the set and reset inputs to see what condition it wants to be in. So the clock flip-flop, the third input is, I love this word, required required. If you don't connect that clocked input, flip-flop is not going to do anything for you. It's not even going to be a flip-flop. It's just going to sit there like, uh, right? You've got to give it that clocked input in order to enable the chip to allow it to be a set, reset, flip-flop. The third input is also called the clock or the trigger. And basically there's a variety in digital of different ways that they'll clock that input. One is active high, which, let me go back a slide. Okay, this here is active high. So when I put in a high voltage, five volts into this, excuse me, when I put in a high voltage here, 
this is going to be enabled. So if the set goes high, it's going to set the flip-flop. If the reset goes high, it's going to reset the flip-flop. Make sense? If I put an inversion bubble on this input right here, it's going to be an active low clocked input. So whenever the pulse goes low, like if I'm putting a square wave into it, whenever the square wave is low, this chip will be enabled to be a set reset flip-flop. And there's also what's called positive edge triggering and negative edge triggering, which are probably the, mo the two most popular methods of triggering in digital. What that's going to do is the transition of the waveform of the square wave that you're feeding in as a clock signal, when it transitions from low to high, that's when it's going to pow, enable the chip just at that moment in time. So it's almost like taking a snapshot. Go ahead and what's the condition right now? Not what's on right now, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, off. That's what an active high enable would be. Or if it was an active low, what's enabled right now, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, off, pow, and it goes high. With, act, with positive edge triggering, it's that transition. What's, what's going on right now? So in today's complex digital circuitry, where there's all kinds of numbers and stuff sequencing, they like that transition because it allows them to kind of set the pace and be right on, right on score with the timing, if you will, to sequence the logic conditions through the chips. So by far those are the most popular. Now a D-type flip-flop is useful when only one data bit is to be stored. It's also referred to as a delay flip-flop. A lot of people argue whether the D is for data or the D is for delay. Don't lose sleep over it. The most popular JK flip-flop is the JK flip-flop. The most popular flip-flop is the JK flip-flop. Why? Because it's the most popular. It's the most popular because it has all the features of the other flip-flops. So what other all the other flip-flops could do? The JK could do them all. So it's really like a universal flip-flop. So these are going to be the most popular. So if you're an engineer or you're going to get stuck on Survivor Island and you can only bring one flip-flop with you, the choice would be the JK flip-flop because it could do everything all the other flip-flops can do. And its schematic symbol looks like this, the J and a K. Don't ask me what the J and K stand for. I don't have a clue. Survived my entire career not knowing that bit of information, and I like it like that. All I know is the answer on the test, the most, it's the universal could do everything all the other ones could do. Now, really the fundamental building block of a lot of these arithmetic logic units are counters. Counters. And basically all these digital counters do is count a sequence of numbers or states when activated by a clock input. Now, the reason you pay college tuition is to learn these big words. The big word tonight is modulus. It's kind of a cool word. The modulus of the counter is the number of counts through which it progresses before returning to its original state. So you understand like a counter that could count up to a um, hundred different sequences basically counts as high as 99, right? And on the, after 99 it basically resets itself to zero, zero, which is an active condition. So it's a hundred different conditions that it could count. The highest number that it could count to is 99. You understand that difference? We don't think like that because we count 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now flip-flops can act as simple counters, believe it or not. There's really two different ways that we could wire these things up. It could either be synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous or synchronous. Asynchronous counters are referred to as ripple counters. So whenever the count increments, it basically ripples to the next stage. Synchronous counters are synchronized. That's why they're called synchronous counters. Each stage is clocked at the same time. That means we've got a clock pulse, or that per percussionist I was talking about, that's setting the pace of the data being sequenced through. So synchronous counters are timed counters. Asynchronous counters are considered to be ripple counters. 
A shift register is a sequential logic circuit widely used to store data temporarily. They're constructed of two flip-flops wired together. They can move data to the right or to the left a number of bit positions. The most common application for a shift register is serial to parallel or parallel to serial data conversion. And this is something that's happening on a regular basis inside computers. If you use a mouse, if you use a keyboard, if you use the internet, if you use an air card, if you do anything of that nature, what you're using is a form of serial communication. Your computer operates in parallel sequencing of data. Parallel sequencing is like watching the Kentucky Derby. And they're off. The gates open and all the horses come running out. Ones and zeros. Okay? So in a typical computer now, you could have up to 64 doors that open simultaneously and load in one sequence uh, 64 ones and zeros instantly into that processor. But yeah, we communicate with our mouse and the keyboard through serial communication. Your internet connection at home probably is done through a modem, and that's serial communication. So a shift register is going to get the serial, basically it's going to be like a traffic cop, waving it all in and then loading it all in one fell swoop. Then you load the next sequence and then you shift it. That's serial to parallel shift register. Make sense? If you communicate to your printer, you're probably connected at home to a USB printer. USB stands for Universal Serial Bus. Serial. Serial is a sequence of numbers. The computer's processing in parallel. So what it's got to do is take that parallel load, load it, and then sequence it out in serial communication. So fundamental building block of a shift register is a flip-flop. And that's exactly what we do. And it performs just so many operations per second, it boggles the mind of these ones and zeros being shifted in simultaneously and you're clicking your mouse. It's really amazing. I, I know how computers work and it amazes me that they work as well as they work because there's so much going on so quickly. Shift registers are also used for temporary storage, basically memory. Temporary storage. Memory serves to store digital data on a temporary or permanent basis. Many different types have, ev have evolved, each for a particular application. Memory is built from storage registers, and storage registers are built from flip-flops, and flip-flops are built from logic gates, and logic gates are built from transistors. So ultimately, all of these are made up of nothing more than transistors put together in complex configurations. The two types of memory devices are random access memory, RAM, and ROM, which is read-only memory. RAM is used for temporary storage of programs, data, control information, etc. Provides random access to the stored data. Has the capability to both read and write data. Stored data is considered to be volatile. That means if you drop it, it will explode. It's not what volatile means. Volatile means that when you uh, turn the power off, you lose the data. Volatile memory, you lose the data. And out of those types of RAM, there's really two types that are available. One is static and one is dynamic. That needs to be refreshed periodically. Each has its pros and cons. We're not going to get into it at this level of class. ROM allows data to be permanently stored. Permanently. Allows data to be read from memory at any time and it's considered non-volatile. So when you shut the power off, 
this program still remains behind, it can't be altered. Basically, there's a number of products that have ROM now. Your DVD player has ROM. They'll talk about updating it actually in a, in a bit, but your, your CD player, your DVD player, I had a problem with mine, I looked it up, and there was a fix. There's an image file, you burn it to a disk, you, you put that disk in your machine, you hold a certain sequence of buttons, and it boots up off the disk that you just loaded, and it rewrites its ROM to solve this problem that customers have encountered. Who would have thunk? Your camera, your digital camera, your car, basically everything that's built now that has a, is computer controlled has ROM. And the nice thing about it is once they release a product and they find bugs in it, they could fix those bugs and then you could reflash your ROM and sometimes restore a device, make it you know operational where before it wasn't. This is a really great tree that shows the different breakdowns of ROM. There's two primary families. One is TTL, which stands for transistor, transistor logic. The other is MOS, metal oxide semiconductor. You all know what a metal oxide semiconductor is. This is the stuff that basically is static sensitive, right? Bipolar, TTL, it's older technology, it's still used, but it's not as prevalent. We have two different types. One is called a mask ROM, mask ROM, and the other is called PROM. Mask ROM uses a mask, and what they do is when they manufacture the chip, they basically make that chip hold certain firmware and it's etched onto the chip. So every time you turn that chip on, it is what it is. So this would be really good if you're mass producing something low tech, drive the cost down, like, I don't know, maybe one of those tickle me almos or something, you're gonna produce millions of them, you want it to be cheap, but yet you're using some technology in it, and you never want it to be modified or anything beyond what it is, where, you know, it is what it is, it's a tickle me almo put fresh batteries in it and it does what it's whatever that thing does does this technology using TTL costs a little bit more money it's called prom prom programmable read-only memory so these chips could be bought blank and then they could be programmed to write your particular unique application to it for something like Tico Miomo, it wouldn't make sense, not cost effective, because you're mass producing so many of them. You're not going to buy these blanks. They cost considerably more. So engineers have to determine, is it worth us doing mass ROM and mass producing? And then the other thing, too, is if you don't validate that software and you make a mistake and then you do the mask technique, and then now you've got like 47 million chips that all have the error in it, it's how you lose your job. Okay, that's how companies go under. So you got to be real careful on what you what you do. That's why a lot of prototypes will use PROMs, and then they'll make sure the bugs are worked out, and then they'll get that sacred software. Ooh, and then they'll do a mask ROM with it. Now all the new technologies over here on the right, MOS, metal oxide semiconductor. Metal oxide semiconductor has the mask ROM, works the same way as the TTL version does also has the PROM, Programmable Read-Only Memory. But what they did with metal oxide semiconductors is they were able to add a new technology called EEPROM. EEPROM stands for Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. And the way that these chips worked is they had a little window on the top of them, glass window. And what would happen is if you put the chip under the influence of ultraviolet light, you could reset it back to its original state. So that would allow a company to write a program to it. Write a, and does anybody know what it's called when you write a program to one of these chips and how the program's contained on a chip? Does anybody know what we call that? It's got a unique word. Um, could be referred to as flash. 
But do we call it software? Do we call it hardware? Firmware, very good. When we write a program to the chip, it now becomes firmware. So with the little EEPROM, typically they'd write it to the chip and then they'd have a little sticker that they'd put over to show what version of firmware. It does two things, keeps light out of, off the chip so you don't reset it. Because if you did that, if you had these chips and you just got them and you left them outside for a day under UV light, it would erase them. The contents would be gone. So it's a good thing that the inside of your computer is not out in the sun. Actually, they don't use EEPROM anymore, but they used to. And it's still as prevalent in a lot of legacy equipment that's out there. The new memory, the new kid on the block, if you will, that is the way that it is, is this EEPROM. Electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. If you've got a newer car, your car computer probably has an EEPROM in it. If you've got a digital camera, your digital camera probably has an EEPROM in it. Your DVD player. I mean, you name it, it's probably got an EE prime on it. The way the EE prime works is by putting together a certain set of conditions, certain voltages on certain pins, the chip could actually be reprogrammed. And it's really as easy as just plugging it in and going to town. Reprogramming that chip and now will contain the new contents of memory. So, a couple of years ago I bought a new digital camera brand new. I, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of guy that keeps up with the Joneses with electronics. You know, I'm happy with like, let somebody else work the bugs out and then I'll get it like two years from now when it's really cheap. Um, I don't need to have the latest technology. But um, Olympus came out with this great camera. It was gyro stabilized and I remember, oh, got to order this thing. So I pre-ordered it. So I mean it came in. It just, it was pre-ordered. It just came out. It, uh, I bought it from Dick's Camera down in Burien. They gave me a call and they said, hey, you know, Mr. Grenick, your camera's in. I went and picked it up. I brought it home. I read the manual. And the very first thing I want you to do to register is plug it in the USB port, plug it in your computer, and then your computer phone's home with the serial number and everything else. So I'm doing this, and then it comes up, warning, there's a new version of firmware to be installed in your camera. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. I just got this camera. It's brand spanking new. It was manufactured, like, last Tuesday. I can't believe that. So there must have been some glitch in that first version that came out, and right away they had a fix out there. And, you know, I always kind of get nervous I, when you reflash the memory like that. It's a pretty safe process. But if something happens in the middle, like if your battery dies or something happens, um, it could end up screwing it up permanently, and you won't you won't be able to to revive it. So um, anyway, I reflashed it. It's been fine ever since. But this is really one of the reasons that I'm emphasizing this EE prom for all of you as electronic technicians and technical folks. I want you to look at this in the future when something is wrong with a device that you're working on. It needs to be troubleshot. One of the very first things you got to do is rule out the version of firmware that is installed. Look up and see if there's a new version. And if there is, you have to reflash that EE prom. Then see if the symptoms are still present. It's the first thing that even your car, your car is under warranty, you bring it into the dealership. First thing the dealership's going to look is there a new version of firmware that's out there. So, fortunately, my, my Taurus. Uh, my Taurus, 97 Taurus, uses this technology. It was really one of the first years, second year of OBD2. And um, I had some warranty work done on it. And that was the first thing they did as they looked. And guess what? Voila, there was a new version of firmware up there. So they had to get a, a special Ford sticker that they put under the hood and this, what the version of firmware is that's written on the chip. And uh, they reflashed it. And I think that was the last version that they updated. You know, I've looked online, and uh, that's the version I have is the last one. Because basically, companies don't support it. After, after you generate a car and you're not getting customer complaints or whatever, if it's all good, let's not monkey with it. If people keep calling and saying, um, actually, I had a student that did this. He had a GPS unit. And um, it was interesting because me, there were two, two students that had the same similar GPS model. I would bring it, mine in my airplane. 
One of the guys used it for marine applications, and the other guy used it for off-road on his motorcycle. And what kept happening was, is he'd be out driving in the boonies, and then his GPS would basically reboot itself. And he thought it was something like with the power cord coming loose or something like that or whatever. What ended up happening was, because it was the handlebar mount and there was so much motion, basically the, the, the GPS computer, there was so rapid change that it was sensing, it just didn't make sense of it. And eventually it would clog the whole computer up on board, computer, and then it would just reboot itself. So ironically, the fix to that was a firmware fix. He reflashed it with the latest firmware, put it on, took it for a drive, and he was insistent that it was like a problem with a loose cable and it was just the battery was getting disconnected internally or whatever. It was a firmware problem. And Garmin realized what the problem was, reflashed it, no more problem. He was like, wow. Never had such an easy fix. So keep that in mind if you have any device that has an EEPROM on it, um, which is really most devices now. I mean, it really is. Constantly firmware upgrades available. So, and there's a reason they're upgrading it. Something was wrong with the version that you have, so you gotta fix it. In summary, a flip flop is a bi stable multi vibrator whose output is either high or low. Types of flip-flops include RS, which is set reset, clocked RS, D, JK. Flip-flops are used in digital circuits such as counters. A latch is a temporary buffer memory. A counter is a logic circuit that can count a sequence of numbers of states. A single flip-flop produces a count sequence of either zero or one. The maximum number of binary states a counter can have depends on the number of flip-flops contained in the counter. Because obviously one flip-flop will be your ones column, your next will be your twos column, your next will be your fours column, eights, sixteens, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight, two fifty-six. You get the sequence? Straight binary. Counters can either be asynchronous or synchronous. Asynchronous counters are called ripple counters. Synchronous counters clock each stage at the same time. That's why they're called synchronous. They're synchronized. Shift registers are used to store data temporarily. They're constructed of flip-flops wired together. They can move data either to the left or to the right. Used for serial to parallel, parallel to serial data conversion. Also can perform multiplication and division. Any questions on chapter 35? All right, let's go ahead and take a 10-12 uh, minute break. When we come back, chapter 36, combinational logic circuits. Home stretch. Chapter 36, Combinational Logic Circuits. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to describe the functions of encoders, decoders, multiplexers, adders, subtractors, comparators, secret decoder rings. I added that one. We're not going to talk about secret decoder rings. Okay. Should. Identify the schematic symbols for encoders, decoders, multiplexers, adders, subtractors, comparators, secret decoder rings. <laughs> Just kidding, we're not really going to do that. Identify applications for combina combinational logic circuits, and then finally develop truth tables for different combinational logic circuits. First type of circuit we're going to talk about is what's called an encoder. An encoder is a combinational logic circuit that accepts one or more inputs and generate a multi-bit binary output. A decimal to binary encoder takes a single digit as input and produces a four-bit output. A decimal to binary priority encoder accepts the same higher order key when two are pressed at the same time. An example of this is a keypad on a security alarm, right, or any time you got a keypad. Basically when you depress a number, you depress the number five, 
it's going to produce a 101 output. It's going to take that one button that you're hitting as a human interface and then it's going to convert that immediately and encode that into really a machine language, the machine's language, the language of ones and zeros that it understands. Make sense? Keyboard is the same thing. When you hit a key on the keyboard, it typically is going to encode it into an ASCII format that really takes up seven bits. We use eight bits um, because there's actually a, 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 a parity check, if you will, and then that feeds it into the computer. So by you hitting any key on the keyboard, it's a certain combination using a minimum of seven bits that gets communicated into the computer. You're encoding. Sounds really complex. It's really not. It's really fundamental. You hit a button on a keypad, it gets converted into a binary number. You're encoding. Obviously, if you encode something, you also have to be able to decode it. One of the most frequently used combinational logic circuits is the decoder. The pro uh, basically, a process a complex binary code into a recognizable digit or character. If any of you, have any of you ever like stared at a digital clock? suffered from insomnia and like stared at that digital clock and see the number increment. Um, basically what's driving that digit, what's making that number, those segments on a digital clock light up is a decoder and a driver. You're feeding that specific digit a binary code, it's converting it into a character that we recognize as a base 10 number. I actually see in these science catalogs, they have these binary clocks that you could order, binary digital clocks. You can ma actually make one. We had students made one here as a project, summer project, a couple of years back. It was a digital clock. That the readout was in binary. So if you suffer from insomnia, you're not going to be staring at that clock for long. <laughs> what time is it? Let's see. It's 3.42 a.m. So that's what a decoder does, takes a binary digit and then converts it back into another form that's useful for us. Multiplexers have been around for a while, and these are pretty cool circuits. They're circuits that are used to select and route any one of several input signals to a single output. An example would be a multi-position switch. Um, let's say, for example, that Daniel in the back of the room, he's got, I've got, a, I've got one of them, their multiplexers, and he's got one of them, their demultiplexers on the other end. But let's keep a simple, let's say that we only can afford enough wire for me to go to Daniel, one piece of wire. But I've got five different pieces of data that I want to ship to him. So Daniel, can you put your switch in my switch's position? Okay. Everybody see, look, walk, look back at Daniel, okay? Now watch, now I'm gonna go here. We could be shipping five different pieces of data over one piece of wire as long as I put the switch to position A, he puts it to position A. I move it to B, he moves it to position B. So obviously, with digital multiplexing, there's a way of doing that like really, really rapidly. So you're using only a couple pieces of copper wire and you're communicating tons of data. And you really minimize the complexity of the interconnections between different pieces of equipment. Um, a lot of my equipment in the military used multiplexing and demultiplexing. So it just really cut down the amount of wire between connecting two boxes together, if you will. So does that make sense to you? So it could be digital or analog data, it really doesn't matter. Let's talk about arithmetic circuits. The first arithmetic circuit we're going to talk about is the adder. The adder. It's the primary computation unit in a digital computer. As a matter of fact, most complex problems solved by computers is nothing more than repetitive addition. It's designed to work in either serial or parallel circuits. The half adder circuits do not take into account any carries. You know what I mean by a carry? When you're adding two numbers, right? If I add the number 9 plus 9, what's 9 plus 9? 9 plus 9 is actually 8, carry the 1 which gives us the answer of, you were correct in the back, 18. 
but it's really 9 plus 9 is 8, carry the 1. Make sense? So a half adder doesn't take into account the carry. So basically, if it's your most significant digit, where would you carry the number 2? Or where would you, I'm sorry, the least significant digit, I said that wrong. If you're the least significant digit, what would you be carrying from? Where would you get that carry from? 9 plus 9 is 18. There's nothing smaller than units, unless there were tenths of units. If there were tenths of units, then that, the even whatever the minimum number is, you're not going to be carrying from some someplace. There's no place to carry from. You're the least significant digit. So that's what a half adder is. Let's take a look. The full adder takes the carry into account. It's going to have three inputs and generates a sum and a carry output. The three inputs are going to be the number you want to add to the number you want to add and that carry from the preceding digit. And it's going to generate the carry out. Half subtractors do not have a borrow input. Again, where can you be borrowing from if you're the most significant digit in a number? It's going to have two inputs and generate a borrow output. You're always going to generate that borrow. Full subtractors have three inputs and generate a difference and a borrow output. The difference is going to be what the, two, the difference of the two numbers is and a borrow if you've got to do that borrow. Simple subtraction. Comparators are cool circuits. Comparators are used to compare the magnitudes of two binary numbers can indicate whether one binary number is larger than the other. But the big thing that comparators are used for is the magnitudes. If you've set your digital alarm clock, you're basically setting a comparator circuit. When this value equals this value, set this bit, and that's going to turn on your clock radio or start playing your CD or do whatever it is that your alarm clock does. A comparator is basically the circuit that you see in Hollywood with the countdown of the bomb going off. The only difference is if you've got somebody that's sophisticated enough of making a timing device, why would they put like a digital readout on it and make like the people you're trying to blow up know when the bomb is going to go off? <laughs> Probably the best example. Do you ever notice that? I mean, why would you do that? I wouldn't do it. I'd like build a digital display and then I'd do it like modular, I'd like set it and then I'd unplug it and then I'd keep the display with me and <laughs> my pop's going to go off. I don't want it to take my freaking beautiful LED display with it. <laughs> Probably the best show that I saw that was pretty accurate, I thought, kind of in an odd way. Um, any of you, did you ever watch 24 when it was on TV? Jack Bauer protecting, uh, protecting humanity from bad guys, bad guys. One of the uh, episodes, I think it was season two or something, there was a nuclear bomb in Los Angeles. A lot of bad stuff happened in Los Angeles. I don't know why the, the film uh, office of Southern California would approve them doing shows like that. I mean, how could it help tourism? Nuclear bombs on the, you know, missing. It's like Hawaii Five-0. Any of you watch the new Hawaii Five-0? Great scenery, but it's kind of like, man, there's bad stuff happening in Hawaii. I don't know if I want to go there. <laughs> but anyway... They basically had a nuclear bomb that was set to go off, and it didn't have a digital readout on it. So basically what the technician had to do is get in there and look at the value that was set in the register and then compare that and say, we've got 43 minutes before this thing goes off. But it wasn't the countdown, the four, three, two, one. So basically they had to get in and look at what the bits were set, and that was pretty accurate because... Well, it was accurate for that type of a device. It wasn't accurate for a nuclear weapon. That's for another, another classified lecture that we won't be conducting here. <laughs> so most of the triggering devices on nuclear weapons are more mechanical than they are electronic. And they cannot be defeated. Electronics, 
it's always work around mechanical everything has to be just so if it's not it ain't gonna work now PLDs programmable logic devices there's four three forms of PLDs there's a programmable read-only memory called the prom how many of you here went to the prom went to the prom was it good was it it's a female perspective <laughs> I never thought it was uh, financially prudent for me to go to the prom. It was like a tremendous amount of money and a certain amount of uncertainty with the whole event. So, um, yeah, I was never a big prom guy. I mean, find it hard to believe, but it's the truth be told. I figured I'd take her out for one of those uh, cheeseburgers and see how things were looking and kind of take the situation from there. <laughs> never went to the prom. Anyway, that's not the kind of prom we're talking about. The kind of prom we're talking about is the programmable read-only memory, the first of three different PLDs. The second type is called a programmable array logic, PAL. And then we've got a programmable logic array, PLA. Now, these PROMs are used primarily as storage devices, and what they store is firmware. Firmware. The program that tells a device you are a digital camera. Here's your input output devices. Here's your basic settings. Your camera. Tells a computer you are a computer. You need to go and boot up. You've got floppy drives. You've got hard drives. You've got the ability to communicate. You've got a real time clock. You've got all these things. You are a computer. That's typically the program that a, a prom will carry. Now, PALs can be programmed to solve a variety of complex logic equations. Remember what we did last week in the Boolean expression, and the simplified Boolean expression? If you have that simplified Boolean expression, you could program a PAL to give you the certain outputs that you want when certain conditions are met. When the Boolean criteria is met, you'll get those outputs. So for an engineer trying to you know, design something like on an airplane, you know, if the airspeed is over this, if the flaps are up, then you enable this, that allows them to increase the throttle setting or do whatever. You know, it's a specific set of logic criteria that needs to be met for something to happen. And then the PLA is similar to the PALs, but they're more flexible due to the additional level of logic gates. So PALs have, um, there's more you could do with them. And the way that these things actually work, these gates are all integrated into the array. And when you write the program, if you will, the Boolean expression to this, and it's actually called burning. And literally what you're doing is burning these little fusible links that are inside the arrays. And if once you burn that, then you no longer can communicate on that line. And then you get a specific logical outcome. That's why uh, even burning proms. I mean, it's very common for a technician. What'd you do this afternoon? Oh, I was burning proms. And that's physically what you're you're doing is is you're you're burning these fusible links and you're writing a program permanently to that prom. Make sense? In summary, an encoder accepts one or more inputs and generates a multi-bit binary output. A decimal to binary encoder takes a single digit, 0 through 9, and produces a 4-bit output code that represents the digit. A priority encoder accepts the higher order key when two keys are pressed simultaneously. A decimal to binary encoder is for, useful for keyboard encoding. So when you hit a key on a keyboard, automatically you hold that button down, pow, it's sending that digital, the binary coding into the computer. A decoder processes a complex binary code into a digit or character that is easy to recognize. A BCD to seven segment decoder is a special purpose decoder to drive seven segment displays. And that's what I was talking about with the digital clock. You give it that binary input, automatically knows exactly what segments to light up and encode it to so that when you, know, you put in the number one, you get the number one. You put in the number seven, you get the number seven. You put in the number eight, all your segments light up, you get the number eight. 
Multiplexes allow digital data from several sources to be routed through a common line for transmission to a common destination. Can handle both analog and digital data. Can be hooked up, both parallel and serial. The truth table for adding rules of binary numbers is equivalent to the truth table of an AND gate and an exclusive OR gate. This is clearly illustrated in your text. It's the same circuit, basic adder. Half adder takes the carry into account. No, that's not right. Half adder does not take the carry into account. It's a typo. To add two four-bit numbers requires three full adders and one half adder. Half adder because, again, you don't have anything to, to carry to. The truth table for subtracting rules of the binary numbers is equivalent to the truth table for an AND gate and an inverter on one of the inputs and an exclusive OR gate. A half subtractor does not have a borrow input. A full subtractor has a borrow input. A comparator is used to compare the magnitudes of two binary numbers and it could be used as a triggering device on an explosive. Generates an output only when the two bits being compared are the same. So it's really great to be able to program it as a countdown so when these numbers are equal, count down or count up, when they're equal, it'll go off. can also determine whether one number is larger or smaller than the other. Use it as a comparator. Any questions on anything that we covered in Chapter 36? Do it again. All right, we're ready to go here, Chapter 37. The final chapter of ELEC 120. The final chapter of the book. The final chapter. Actually, let me give you the historic perspective on this because this is actually kind of cool. I think it's cool, or I won't be talking about it. <laughs> I only talk about stuff that's cool. In the beginning, we understood in the LEC 110, we talked about matter, fundamental building block of nature. We talked about applying energy to matter, knocking an electron loose, then being able to harness that electron. We talked about the fundamental properties of materials um, and their electrical properties um, as they relate to the, the physics of electronics. We talked about current, we talked about voltage, we talked about resistance, we talked about power, we talked about series circuits, parallel circuits, complex circuits. We talked about capacitors, we talked about inductors, those reactive components. We talked about AC power. We talked about AC signals. We talked about reactive components and how they react to AC. We talked about transformers. Then we talked about this whole group of components called semiconductors and how semiconductors could be used to amplify voltage, amplify current, amplify power, control voltage, control current. We talked about the newer generation of transistors, if you will, FETs, field effect transistors. We talked about thyristors. Some of you that were here, we talked about thymaster. Um, Suzanne Summers, the spokesperson for Thymaster, and Joe Grenick, the spokesperson for the Thyristor, those high power devices that are used, um, solid state devices. We talked about integrated circuits where we get those small transistors and we integrate those onto a circuit and we cram hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, billions. Intel now is cramming billions of transistors on something the size of a postage stamp. It's crazy. We talked about digital. We gave you an introduction to digital. And digital is everything breaks down into ones and zeros. And then we could have these circuits that are made up of logic gates. Those logic gates are made up of transistors. And those logic gates give us logical, predictable outcomes of the circuits 100% of the times. And that's kind of how digital went. And digital, back in the day, it was good. You know, the digital watch, the, the, a digital clock, digital circuitry, it was good. But then what they said is there's, there's got to be a way that it would be nice if we could have a digital circuit that does this, A, B, C at this moment in time, and then at the next moment in time it does X, Y, Z. 
and then at the next moment in time it does ABC again, and maybe ABC again, and then it does XYZ. So one digital device that could do a variety of different things but have it be one, one platform. That was really the birth of the microcomputer. So the microcomputer is really the culmination of everything that we've talked about in the past, all, all coming to a, to a certain point in history where they're able to make a digital device that is programmable and adaptable to run your specific type of application. And it truly is an amazing device. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it in this, uh, in this chapter where all we've gone. Um, with microcomputers and uh, like I said, everything has got a computer on board now. So this is really the, the culmination of years of advancements in digital technology. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to identify the basic blocks of a digital computer, explain the function of each block of a digital computer, describe what a program is and its relationship to both digital computers and microprocessors. Identify the basic registers in a microprocessor, explain how a microprocessor operates, and identify the instruction groups associated with microprocessors. First of all, all digital computers, and if I had a nickel or a dime for every time I was asked this question in a professional interview, I'd be a very uh, wealthy individual. No, I'd actually have enough to probably go buy a gallon of gasoline, which would be cool. Hey, gas prices came down today, right? Digital computers consist of five basic blocks. Control, ALU, or arithmetic logic unit. Memory, input, and output. Sometimes input, out, output is identified as a single block because, uh, quite frankly, you need both of them. I mean, if a computer didn't have the ability to output, um, I mean, that'd be a cool business plan, put something together. I, the, the ultimate computer, data goes in, nothing comes out. It really wouldn't work too well. This is the functional block diagram. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm not going to necessarily quiz you on this per se. I'm not going to give you a blank sheet of paper. But my challenge to you is you should be able to, to draw this on a piece of scratch paper and explain it to somebody. I mean, that's what this class is all about. This is about literacy, technical literacy. Uh, the heart of the microcomputer is the ALU um, input feeds input into the ALU, and the ALU feeds the output as well. Memory has to be integrated with input, ALU, and output, and then also you have to have a control mechanism that controls and sequences the input, the processing of the data through the ALU and the output. So, a real simple functional block diagram. The control unit specifically decodes each instruction that enters the computer. Computers are not really smart. Computers are just predictable. And they're predicting, th what they do is they process what's known as an instruction. And that instruction is, is basically coded in memory. So what an instruction is, I don't want to get into the specifics about programming, because quite frankly, I hate programming. I was never a programming kind of guy. Programming and Spanish were, were the two things that I really struggle with in life. Uh, no, let's open that up to all foreign languages um, and programming. Any foreign language. Basically, English is how I roll, period. So if it's programming a computer or, you know, habla espanol, um, I crash and burn. Basically, what a computer is, is, is has the ability to process an instruction. And uh, being a parent, it, it was kind of interesting watching my kids mature and grow up. You know, when they were really, really small, getting ready for bed was like this whole huge complex scenario. You know, you need to wash up. You need to brush your teeth. Oh, I forgot, you don't know how to brush your teeth. Well, you get the toothbrush, you hold it in your hand like this, you apply this amount. This is the motion, don't forget the back teeth. You know, you should be timing yourself. You need to shut the water off while you're brushing the teeth. Now you need to rinse. How many steps are there in brushing your teeth? It's a pretty complex set of instructions when you come right down to it. So gradually, as your kids 
Keep your fingers crossed for this one. Gradually as they get older, the, the instructions you give them is a lot less complex. I specifically remember my kids getting up and getting ready for school. You know, you need to set, up, set the alarm clock, you need to get up, you need to shower, you need to get dressed, you need to get breakfast, you need to brush your teeth, you need to comb your hair, you need to, all of these things. And at first you need to give them at each every instruction, but then by the time as they get more mature, and then finally with my, my oldest, uh, or excuse me, my youngest son, he got it at a very early age. He'd set his own alarm clock, I wouldn't even hear him leave. And he'd get up and he'd do all that stuff, and maybe the worst thing he would do is leave behind a little mess in the kitchen from him, himself fixing a little bit of breakfast or whatever. But at least I knew he had breakfast before he left, and he took the time to do that. So eventually it went from every one of those steps to, Make sure you leave for school on time. Yeah, I'll do that. And then all of those other instructions got done. So basically, as we mature, we could handle more complex instructions. It's the same thing um, as uh, the education process, right? The more of an education you have, um, you know, you go back to work for Nintendo and I say, hey, Lena, um, we want you to run these tests on these machines. And because you're educated now, you'll know exactly what that means as opposed to, okay, you need to get this wire and insert it in here. You need to get this piece of test equipment and turn, this is how you turn it on. And you understand? So the computer is really the same way. So this instruction set is very critical on what, it, what ultimately the capabilities of it are. Control unit also generates the necessary pulses to carry out the functions specified. What is it that you're trying to do with it? Consists of an address register, an instruction register, an instruction decoder, a program counter, a clock, and circuitry for generating the control pulses. The heart of the computer is the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. This is what performs math. And quite frankly, all of the magic that's done inside a computer is done simply by processing math. It's all pure math. No guesswork. It also performs logic and all of the decision making operations. Memory is the area where programs are stored. Input output units allow the computer to receive and transmit information from and to the world outside the computer. Now the input output unit is controlled by the central processing unit, CPU. This here is just to kind of show you some memory cells. Sit down for this one, all right? This is kind of crazy. Remember earlier I was telling you about that ASCII and when I hit a key on a computer it generates a really a seven bit code, ASCII code is seven bits and then there's a parity check so you're really using a total of eight bits. So for example, to store my full name, Joseph Grenick, the letter J would be stored in here in an ASCII code. J-O-S-E-P-H space, which means nothing, G-R-Y-N-I. There's not even enough memory here to store my freaking first and last name. And look at how complex this, this, by the way, is a simplified drawing of memory, okay? Simplified drawing of memory. To get the data to these memory cells, we have what's called a data input bus. And what this data input bus is, this is the simplified drawing. Here we show it as a big, thick, light blue line. In actuality, it is eight lines that are interconnected with each of these cell locations. So if we really wanted to draw this accurately, instead of drawing this big thick line, we'd have eight lines in parallel. It'd get very, very busy very, very quickly. That's the input data bus. The output data bus would have the same thing. There'd be eight lines coming out of every one of these cell locations. Then we'd also have this memory cell selection line which selects which, which cell are you reading to or writing from. So this would be very, very complex. So you got to think about right now with memory, I was just looking at a Fry's ad in a paper this morning and I don't know, like six gig. This is one, two, three, four, five, six times two. This is 12 bytes. 12 bytes. 
You could go out now and buy six gigabytes worth of memory for, I don't know, 49 bucks or something ridiculous. It's mind boggling. So that's not giga, it's not million. Because million would be mega, billion. Billion bytes for 49 bucks. And then obviously if you've stored documents or anything, I mean it amazes me on how much we could store now. Even like on a, you know, you get a, a thumb drive, 4, 8, 16 gig, 32 gig thumb drive, and how much you could store on it. Here we can't even store what you're looking at, my first and last name. So these circuits really, really get complex. Very, very complex. So this is what memory cells would look like. The microprocessor is the heart of a microcomputer. The microprocessor contains four basic parts. Registers, arithmetic logic unit, ALU, timing and control circuitry, and decoding circuitry. They're designed so that an instruction can be fetched from memory, placed in the instruction register, and then decoded. The microprocessor contains registers, accumulator, condition code, program counter, stack pointer, instruction decoder, arithmetic logic unit, timing and control. These are all the functional parts. Microprocessor instructions fall into nine different categories. This is why I had a hard time in programming. Because I, I just, it's why I had a high, hard time in Spanish. I think my understanding of English grammar was somewhat limited. So if I can't do proper English, how the heck am I going to do Spanish? If I don't understand English, how the heck, if I don't do math, how am I going to understand? Am I trying to move the data? Am I trying to perform an arithmetic function, logic, compare and test, shift and rotate, program control? Stack, is it input output or is it miscellaneous? I'm not saying this to spook any of you because again programming has come a long way but I remember when I was in a, uh, in a Navy school, it was my first computer, I had to write a program that added the number like two to the number two and I was supposed to get four. So it was like, and I had to do it in octal. So what was involved is like first in octal loading the number two and then storing it in memory and then loading another number in two in memory and then saying I want you to go out to this memory location, get these contents and add it, add it to the number in this contents and then get the results and store it here. Anyway, by the time I was done it was like six pages of code to add two plus two. And this is in machine language. It's a nightmare. I thought it was the end for me. I thought if this is what the next nuclear warrior has to be, they got the wrong guy. I'll go paint aircraft carriers. Yep. So a lot of programming has become somewhat simplified. They were trying to look at our ability just to process this whole thing and so anyway, I really struggled with this because I think the better math student you are, the better off you, you do with the stuff. Microcontrollers. This is the big thing now. This is the small devices used to control objects, processes, or events. Used to monitor and control automobile engines, consumer appliances, high-tech toys, music, and greeting cards. I mean, when you get one of those goofy songs on a freaking greeting card, it's a microcontroller in there. It's got to be able to get that contents of memory, process it, play it, and provide an output. And make it sound like the song. It's basically a, a single chip computer. The faucets in here with the infrared detector, there's a microcontroller controlling those. The toilets that flush themselves are microcontroller controlled. I mean, you got computers sh flushing our toilets now. Fortunately, they're not networked. 
You know, I don't know what the benefit of that would be, but they are small computers that are able to process and they could change the setting in there that once you detect that, what threshold needs to be overcome before it flushes. How many flushes could there be in a certain period of time? All of that's programmed in. Microcontroller. In summary, digital computers consist of a control section, an arithmetic logic unit, memory, input-output section. The control section decodes the instructions, generates pulses to operate the computer. The arithmetic logic unit performs math, logic, decision-making operations. Memory is an area where programs and data are stored while waiting for execution. And the I.O. units allow data to be transmitted into and out of the computer. Control section and ALU may be included in a single package called a microprocessor. A program is a set of instructions arranged in a sequential pattern to solve a particular problem. Microprocessor contains registers, ALU, timing control circuitry, decoding circuitry, and instructions for microprocessor fall into nine categories, data movement, arithmetic, logic, compare and test, rotate and shift, program control, stack, I.O., and miscellaneous. Computers don't only amaze me, Windows really amazes me. When you think about you could have a desktop open and all of these applications running seamlessly. I really honestly never thought I'd see the day in my lifetime where, where we'd have this technology available to us right now. I mean, it really is mind-boggling. Having been there in the early development of a lot of our digital systems, it just truly was exponential growth. I know a lot of you hear that in textbooks and understand that, but you know. And then now when I see things like, um, you know, what, what Apple's doing with the eye touch and some of the human interfaces, they're trying to get us away from, because I mean, this is freaking crude, man. A keyboard, a mouse, it's pretty crude. Operating a computer, it's very, very crude. So it's going to be interesting, the next advancement of computers to be able to, I mean, because it's amazing what we can do right now with them. And with microcontrollers, fortunately, we have a microcontroller class here. Typically, Peter teaches it. And um, we study a specific microcontroller. And, you know, when you buy them in bulk, you're buying a computer for like a dollar and 75 cents. And you could stick that computer wherever you want to stick it. And it's going to sit there and it's going to process data for you. Students a couple years ago, I think you've probably heard the story of uh, making the beacon light at my house, my flagpole light. It's a microcomputer. Whenever the power goes off, the thing shuts down. When the power comes back on, it reboots and just starts, picks up where it left off. It's a small computer in there for $1.75 that's controlling that light in a very specific way, not just flashing it. The timing is exact. The code is specific. It's crazy. Any questions on anything that we covered? So this is the end of digital. This is the end of ELEC 120 lectures. Um, basically, Kalina, you could coordinate now how you want to take the quizzes now that the lectures are all done. Just let me know what you electronic test instruments. Number one, introduction to multimeters. Multimeters are used to measure current, voltage, and resistance. 
This program provides detailed instruction in the setup and operation of multimeters. There are two types of multimeters. Analog, shown on the left, and digital, on the right. They both have the same basic features and controls. Both display the reading on a meter face. Analog and digital meters also contain control switches for the selection of the measurement scale and range. Multimeters also provide recessed jacks for test leads, which connect the meter to the circuit. Access to the batteries is provided on the back of the meter. The digital meter uses battery power for all scales, while the analog only uses batteries for resistance measurements. Meters are used to test and troubleshoot electronic circuits. Here a technician is using the digital meter to determine if the power supply is providing the correct voltage. Checking for correct voltage levels, broken connections, or the existence of current flow are just a few of the ways a technician uses a meter. The first step in setting up an analog meter is to turn it on using the function switch. For example, set the function switch to positive DC to do resistance measurements. Next, turn the range switch to the resistance scales and select the one which is closest to the value of the part being measured. Analog meters also have a control named zero ohms. It's used to zero the ohm scale to allow for fluctuations in the battery power level. To align the needle with the zero at the right end of the top scale, turn the control in the direction you need to move the needle. Digital meters have controls similar to those on the analog meter. This digital meter uses symbols, called icons, to represent the various functions. These icons are a combination of letters and symbols. Each icon is easy to understand once you learn the system. The capital letters represent the unit of measure. For example, V stands for voltage and A for ampere. The wavy line represents a sine wave indicating alternating current or voltage. The pair of horizontal lines represents a steady level indicating direct current. Ohm's scales are represented by the Greek letter omega and the continuity test is identified by a diode with curved lines representing the audio tone the meter produces. This digital meter has a button for selecting the range. The button controls the location of the decimal point on the display. Each time you press the range button it moves the decimal point one place to the right. The circle with a square in its middle indicates that you have selected a specific range. Holding the range button down for one second turns off the range selection as indicated by the absence of the circle with the square. In this mode, the meter automatically selects the best range for the measurement value. Most digital meters do not have zero ohms control. This function is performed automatically by the meter. The range selection button is also used to activate the touch hold feature of the digital meter. To activate touch hold, turn the function switch to off. Then, while holding the range button down, rotate the function switch to the desired scale using your thumb. When touch hold is activated, the meter captures the reading on the display when the test leads make contact with the circuit. This allows you to lift the test leads away from the circuit before reading the display. The value display does not change until a new input is constant for at least one half second. The value must also be different from the previous reading by at least one segment on the analog scale located at the bottom of the display. To read values less than one segment, press the range button. Turning the function switch back to off deactivates touch hold. Let's take a moment to describe other differences between the two types of meters. 
The analog meter conveys a sense of magnitude when displaying a reading. At all times, you can see where the needle is in relation to the two ends of the scale. The separate analog display along the bottom of the meter face simulates the magnitude of the input compared to the full scale value. Another difference is that analog meters fluctuate less when displaying a value. This is because they have a slower response time to varying signals. There is also more margin for error when reading the value. An error can be made by using the wrong scale or by looking at the needle from an angle. In addition, the meter movement is very sensitive to vibration and is affected by the angle at which the meter is held. For best results, place the meter on a firm, flat surface and do not move it while taking a reading. The digital meter is not affected by vibration or the angle at which it is held while taking the reading. Therefore, the digital meter would be used for field service while the analog meter would be used on a workbench. Another difference is that the digital meter sounds a tone. When doing continuity checks indicating a common connection. This allows the technician to work faster because there is no need to look at the meter. Each meter has its advantages and disadvantages. In general, digital meters are more expensive than analog meters. Digital meters also discharge their batteries faster because they use the battery for all measurement scales. Test leads are used to connect the meter to the circuit. The red lead is used for positive and the black one for negative. Each lead is composed of a probe connecting wire and an elbow prod. The new style leads on the left are constructed of insulating material completely covering the metal that makes contact with the meter. This reduces the possibility of receiving a shock when the leads are disconnected from the meter but still connected to the circuit. The old style, on the right, has the metal exposed. Also available are various attachments which can be placed on the end of the probe. For example, spring-loaded hook tips, spades, or alligator clips. In addition, you can use special probes such as this AC amp clamp for measuring high current. Also available are probes for measuring high voltage, decibels, temperature, and frequency. Protective cases are also available for most meters. This one incorporates a belt hook, tilt stand, and lead storage in one case. When using any test instrument, you should adhere to the following safety rules. First, Inspect the test leads. If the insulation is damaged, replace or repair the lead. When measuring voltages in excess of 60 volts DC or 25 volts AC, use caution. Such voltages represent a shock hazard. To minimize the hazard, avoid touching metal surfaces. For example, always hold the test leads by the plastic insulators keeping your fingers behind the guard. Whenever possible, use the hook tips or alligator clips, especially when working with small parts. In addition to the shock hazard, having your fingers in contact with the circuit can change the values measured. You should also be careful that you do not damage the circuit you are testing or the meter. Touching more than one contact at a time will often short the circuit, damaging its components. Protect the meter by setting the range for a value higher than that being measured. If you don't know the approximate voltage or current in the circuit, start at the highest range and work down. The most accurate readings are those whose values are near the middle of the range selected. When you are taking readings from live or powered circuits, you should avoid touching the circuit with both hands. The worst shock you can receive is when the electricity flows through both hands across your chest. Multimeters require little maintenance. Your main concern should be to keep them dry and avoid sudden impacts. Never work with drinks on your bench. Occasionally, you will need to change the battery or fuse. Both are located behind this cover on the back of the analog meter. 
After loosening the locking screw, slide the cover off. Then gently lift the battery out of its holder and replace it with a new battery. The fuses are held in place by a metal cover. A spare fuse is stored under the upper left corner of the cover. Rotate the cover 90 degrees to change the two fuses. Make sure that you replace the fuse with one of the exact same value. When finished, replace the cover and tighten the locking screw. Don't over tighten the screw or you will strip the threads. Occasionally, you will need to adjust the analog meter so that it reads zero when off. Do this by gently turning the screw at the base of the needle until it is aligned with the zero. Some meters, like this digital meter, do not have a battery compartment. In this instance, you will have to remove the four screws at the back of the case. Then gently lift off the front cover. This exposes the battery and fuses. When removing the fuse, lift the end as shown. Do not pull it straight out. Also be careful that you do not touch the rotary switch or circuit board. When you are finished, place the cover back on the meter and replace the four screws. When cleaning the meter, use a damp cloth with mild soap. Be careful that liquids do not enter the meter case. Each time you turn on the digital meter, it automatically checks all features of the display. If any one of them fails to light, you should take the meter to an authorized service center for repair. The rectangle in the upper left corner of the meter face is a low battery indicator. When it lights, you need to replace the battery. This completes the introduction to analog and digital multimeters. In program number two, you will learn how to measure resistance and check continuity. Basic Electronic Test Instruments Number 2 Resistance and Continuity Measurements In program number 1 you learned about the various controls and features of analog and digital multimeters. In this program, you will learn how to use these meters to test for continuity and measure resistance. Continuity means that a complete current path of low resistance exists between two points, as illustrated by this diagram. Some of the ways the continuity tests can be used are to check components for broken or burned out connections, locate shorts, or test for common connections. Digital meters have a special scale for continuity. It is represented by the symbol of a diode. If you only have an analog meter, use the resistance scale. The first step in using any scale on the meter is to connect the test leads. For most scales, use the two recessed jacks located on the lower right corner of the digital meter. Connect the red tag with the symbols for volts, ohms, and continuity. This is the positive test lead. Then plug the black test lead in the jack marked COM, which stands for common. For most tests, this is the ground or negative connection. Next, turn on the meter and select the continuity scale. The meter then displays OL which stands for overload. When the test leads are not connected to one another, there is infinite resistance. Therefore, the OL indicates no continuity. 
when you touch the two leads together, the meter displays the voltage drop of the circuit. If the circuit resistance is less than 150 ohms, the meter also sounds a tone indicating continuity. In this circuit, composed of only the two test leads, the voltage consumed is less than one thousandth of a volt. The polarity of the test leads is not important, except when testing semiconductors. Let's use the continuity scale to check this fuse. Note, never test components for continuity with the circuit power turned on. Also, at least one end of the component should be disconnected from the circuit to eliminate the possibility of alternate current paths. If the fuse is good, then the tone sounds. And the meter displays a low value. If the fuse is burnt out, then OL remains on the display. The same test can be used to determine if wires are damaged or for locating both ends of a conductor in a multiple conductor cable. Notice that the wire being tested is not connected to a circuit. Resistors in the circuit being tested will often give misleading results. For example, resistors of low value will indicate continuity right through the component. Resistors of moderate value produce a reading on the scale but the tone does not sound. High value resistors, such as this one mega ohm resistor, indicate no continuity. Therefore, when you are checking a circuit which contains resistors, be careful that you do not get a false reading due to a low value resistor. Another component which may be tested is a transformer. You can check the primary and secondary windings for shorts or burnt out windings. First, Test the primary winding for continuity. Second, test the secondary winding for continuity. Third, check that there is continuity between the center tap and both ends of the secondary winding. These three tests check for broken or burned out wires in the transformer. You should also check for shorts between the primary and secondary windings. Do this by connecting one test lead to one end of the primary and the second test lead to one end of the secondary. If the transformer is not damaged, the meter should indicate no continuity. The continuity test can also be used to determine the bias of diodes. Forward bias is the direction in which the diode allows current to flow. The meter indicates forward bias by sounding the tone and displaying the voltage drop of the diode. Note that the negative test lead is connected next to the silver band on the diode. Reverse bias is indicated by no continuity. Here, the polarity of the test leads is reversed. You cannot test capacitors for continuity. This is true for any device which provides or stores energy. This is because the output of the device interferes with the output voltage of the meter. Also, components which are connected to complex circuits, such as this PC board, cannot be tested without being removed from the board. In addition to checking for continuity, the digital meter can be used to measure resistance. Ohms indicated by the Greek letter omega, is the unit of measure for resistance. Start by turning the function switch to the resistance scale. You may also select a specific range by pressing the button in the center of the function switch, sequencing through three resistance ranges, ohms, kiloohms, and megohms. Note, the Greek letter omega should appear in the lower right corner of the display. Next, connect the test leads. If they were already connected, check that they are fully seated. To measure the value of this resistor, connect the leads as shown. 
As with continuity, the polarity of the test leads does not affect the reading. The color code of this resistor is brown, black, green. Therefore, the value of the resistor should be 1 million ohms, abbreviated 1 megohms. The meter displays a value of 1.067, followed by an M, indicating meg. Therefore, the value of the resistor measures 1.067 megohms. The analog meter is also capable of measuring resistance. Connect its test leads to the two jacks in the lower left corner of the meter. Then, turn the function switch to positive DC and set the range switch to the maximum resistance range. Basic electronic test instruments. Number three, voltage and current measurements. In programs one and two, you learned how to set up and use analog and digital multimeters. However, none of the measurements involved live circuits. In this program, you will learn how to measure voltage and current. The safety procedures and methods demonstrated apply to all measurement levels, not just low voltage and current. You will also learn how to wire a circuit by reading a schematic drawing. This schematic represents a circuit composed of a battery and a resistor. Components, such as the resistor, are represented by symbols. The wires which connect the components are represented by straight lines. These are the components needed to construct the first circuit. Notice how each component has been manufactured with a way to connect it to the circuit. The resistor has wires built into it, and the battery has clip-on connectors. Breadboards, such as this one, are used to build temporary circuits. The breadboard acts as a base, holding and connecting the components. Each vertical column of holes is one electrical connection. These connections are accomplished by thin metal bands beneath the holes on the back of the breadboard. The breadboard can be used a number of ways. For example, you can wire circuits horizontally. Notice how the end of one resistor is in the same column as the next resistor. Therefore, they are connected together. Another way you can use the breadboard is to build circuits using IC chips. These circuits are wired vertically on the board. The slot in the middle of the breadboard is designed to match the size of the chip. The holes above the slot are not connected to those below the slot. Let's use the breadboard in these parts to build the circuit in this schematic. Note, the ground symbols on the ends of the schematic indicate that those points should be wired together. After bending the leads on the resistor to a 90 degree angle, insert the resistor leads into the holes in the breadboard. The next step is to connect the battery. The longer line at the end of the battery symbol represents the positive end of the battery. Connect the wire from the left end of the resistor to the positive pole of the battery. Notice how the end of each wire is in the same column as the lead from the resistor. This completes the wiring of the circuit. Whenever you're not using the circuit, you should turn it off. Do this by removing one of the clips from the battery. The next step is to set up the meter. Let's use the analog meter first. Connect the test leads to the two jacks labeled common and positive. Whenever possible, 
use hook tips or alligator clips with the test leads. This is a safer operation because your hands are kept away from the circuit. Also, this will produce a more accurate reading because of the constant pressure against the wire provided by the alligator clip. Then, turn the meter on by setting the selector switch to positive DC. Also, set the range switch to 50 volts. This range is well above the output of the battery. Whenever you measure the voltage in a circuit, the meter should be connected in parallel with the component. In this case, the test leads of the meter should be connected to the two ends of the resistor. Next, connect the meter to the circuit. Be sure to place the red test lead on the left or positive end of the resistor. Since the resistor is the only component in the circuit which provides significant resistance, the meter will read both the voltage drop across the resistor and the total voltage. The DC voltage scale is the second line down on the meter face. Each row of numbers represents a different range. Since you selected the 50 volt range, use the second row which ends with 50. Note, all voltage scales read left to right. After connecting the battery, the meter reads less than 10 volts. Since the meter has a 10 volt scale, you can switch to it to achieve a more accurate reading. Turn the circuit off and change the range switch to 10 volts. Using the 10 volt scale, the meter now reads partway between the 6 and the 8. The large black line halfway between the 6 and the 8 represents 7. Each of the four smaller lines represents 0.2. Since the needle is two small lines to the right of the large black line, the value is 7.4 volts. Let's construct the second circuit, which is composed of two resistors wired in series. This means that the components are wired so that there is one path for current flow through the circuit. Add the second resistor and connect the battery wires as shown. After connecting the meter to the ends of the circuit and turning the power on, the meter reads 7.4 volts. This is the same as when you had one resistor in the circuit. You are still reading the total voltage, which has not changed because you're using the same battery. However, the voltage drop across R1 has changed. It now reads 6.3 volts. When you connect the meter to read the voltage drop of R2, it reads 1.1 volts. The voltage drop across R1, represented by the letter E, plus the voltage drop across R2, equals the total voltage. In other words, E of R1 plus E of R2 equals E total. Therefore, in series circuits, the sum of the voltage drops of the individual components equals the source voltage. This is the schematic for a parallel circuit. Notice how the ends of the two resistors are connected together. Move R2 so that it is parallel to R1 matching the schematic drawing. Whenever you change the circuit, make sure that the power is off. Next, connect the meter across R2. This is the same connection for reading the voltage drop across R1. This is confirmed by the meter which reads 7.4 volts. Therefore, in a parallel circuit, the voltage drop across each parallel branch is the same, even if the resistance in the branches is different. The value that changes in a parallel circuit is the current. Let's start by measuring the total current in the circuit. To do this, you need to connect the meter in series with the battery. After disconnecting the alligator clip from the battery, remove the wire at the right end of the circuit and connect it to the black test lead. Next, connect the red test lead where the wire was connected to the resistor. To set up the meter, turn the range switch to 500 milliamps, abbreviated MA. After turning the circuit on, select the range which gives the largest deflection of the meter without exceeding the scale. 
In this case, the range is 10 milliamps, and the meter reads 8.2 milliamps, using the same scale as for DC voltage. To measure the current flow in the top branch, remove the meter from the circuit and replace the battery wire. Then lift out the right lead of R1 and connect it to the red test lead. The black test lead should be connected to R2 and the battery wire. After turning the power on, the meter reads approximately 7 milliamps. This is the current flowing through the upper branch of the circuit. Next, connect the meter in the same way to R2 to measure the current flow in the lower branch. After turning the power on, the meter reads 1.2 milliamps. As with voltage in a series circuit, the sum of the current flowing through each branch in a parallel circuit equals the total current flow. In other words, I of R1 plus I of R2 equals I total. Therefore, parallel circuits divide the current while series circuits divide the voltage. The next schematic is a parallel series circuit. Add the third resistor as shown. Let's use the digital meter to measure the voltage drops in this circuit. Set it to volts DC, represented by a capital V and two parallel lines. First, measure the total voltage by connecting the meter to both ends of the circuit. The meter indicates that the total voltage is 7.64 volts DC. Second, measure the voltage drop in the parallel branch. Be sure to connect the meter polarity correctly. The voltage drop in the two branches measures 2.145 volts DC. Then measure the voltage drop in R3 by connecting the test leads as shown. The meter indicates that the third resistor has a voltage drop of 5.5 volts DC. You can calculate the total voltage drops in a series parallel circuit in the same way as in a series circuit. Just consider both parallel branches as having one voltage drop. Therefore, E of R1 plus E of R3 equals E total. The current can be examined in the same way as in a parallel circuit. The only portion of this circuit in which the current flow is not equal to the total current flow is in the two halves of the parallel branch. To measure current using the digital meter, set the selector switch to amps DC, indicated by the capital letter A, followed by two parallel lines. Then connect the meter as shown and turn on the circuit power. The meter indicates that the current in the top branch is 0.41 amps. The current flowing through the bottom branch measures 2.15 amps. R3 and the wires connected to the battery are in series. Therefore, the total current, 2.53 amps, flow through each of them. Troubleshooting a circuit is a combination of measuring the voltage and current levels then comparing the readings with your knowledge of what the value should be. You can also use the meter to measure AC voltage and current. Since both are fluctuating between zero and a peak value 60 times a second, the meter displays an average value. Turn the function switch to V sine wave to measure AC volts. After connecting the meter in the same way as for DC voltage measurements, the reading is displayed. Notice that the letters VAC appear in the right-hand corner. To set the meter up to measure AC current, select the switch position identified with a capital A followed by a sine wave. You can measure values up to 10 amps by connecting the red test lead to the jack marked 10A. Rather than breaking the circuit and inserting the test leads to measure the current, you can use an AC current probe. The probe is also capable of measuring current values up to 500 amps. This is because it uses resistors in parallel with the meter to reduce the current flow through the meter. 
Therefore, the meter should be set to the AC voltage range and the range selector switch on the probe used as a multiplier. An extension cord is used with the probe. It has been split into two conductors without exposing the wires. One conductor is then placed inside the jaws of the probe. After connecting the device being tested to the extension cord, the circuit power is turned on and the reading, 4.65 amps, is displayed on the meter. This is a much safer way to measure high current values. This concludes the program on test instruments. To give you more experience in the use of multimeters, refer to the additional experiments in the study guide.